All right, Mayor, we are live on YouTube. We're getting the TV going and uh, ready to go when you are. Ready to go. Thank you. It's 5.03 p.m. on October the 27th. It's a regular meeting of the governing body. Uh, and we'll begin uh, with a Pledge of Allegiance led by Councillor Garcia. Salute to the New Mexico flag led by Councillor Rivera and an invocation from Councillor Cassett, followed by remembrances from anyone who wishes to uh, raise their hand. So please rise for the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I salute the flag of the state of New Mexico, the Zia symbol of perfect friendship amongst united cultures. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanted to read an excerpt from the poem that Amanda Gorman read at the inauguration, um, as this is the last governing body before our elections. And um, I thought that it does such a beautiful job of capturing the hope of democracy and, and how important it is to be part of this system and to continue to work towards the system. And I will not be able to perform it as beautifully as she did. So everybody should go watch the YouTube video if you really want to be inspired. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze, not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Mr. Mayor, I'll pass it over to you for remembrances. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, show of hands of anyone who wishes to offer a remembrance at this time. I see Councilwoman Villarreal's hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to recognize the life of John Ledoux, who was an amazing Spanish teacher at the community college and just overall wonderful um, guy, very generous, very nice. Um, he, he struggled the last six years fighting ALS and um, passed away last week. And I just wanted to recognize how much John did for our, our community and um, the students he had in his Spanish classes at the, com at the community college and just how he approached life in general, so positive. And I just wanted to send love to his family and friends. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just raise a hand. Uh, I would like just to mention that this week we passed a sad milestone of 5,000 of our fellow New Mexicans who were taken from us by COVID. And uh, we think of them and their families. We think of the lives they led and the pandemic that took them from us and we don't want that to go by without mention and we don't want to uh, let it go without saying we will do everything we can to keep people safe in our community and in our state and to come together uh, to heal. Let's take a minute and uh, bow our heads and then come back. Thank you, everybody.
So with that, Madam Clerk, can you please uh, call the roll? Yes, Mayor Weber. Present. Councillor Beta. Here. Councillor Cassett. Here. Councillor Garcia. Present. Councillor Lindell. Here. Councillor Rivera. Here. Councillor Merrill Ward. Here. Councillor B. Hill Coppler. Here. Councilwoman Virayal. Present. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve. Second. I heard a motion to approve from, I believe, Councillor Cassett and a second from Councillor Lindell. Uh, if there's no discussion, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes. Councillor Abetha? Yes. Councillor Cassett? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Rivera? Yes. Councillor Romero Ward? Yes. Councillor B. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. Are there items that um, wish to be taken off of the consent calendar? I see Councillor Rivera's hand first. Councillor? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, item A. Okay. Are there others to be taken from consent? If not, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar as amended? So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded uh, to approve the consent calendar as amended. Uh, if there's no discussion, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Councilor Rivera? Yes. Councilor Romero Ward? Yes. Councilor B. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Abetha? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the approval of minutes from the regular governing body meeting of October 13, 2021. Are there changes to those minutes or a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. There's a motion to approve the minutes and a second. Uh, there's no discussion. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll on that motion? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Rivera? Yes. Councillor Romero? Yes. Councillor V. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councillor Abetha? Yes. Councillor Cassett? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Very good. Thank you. Uh, at this point, Madam Clerk, I'm going to turn the uh, calendar, the agenda over to you. We have two presentations. You might want to introduce them. Uh, yes. Mayor, uh, the first presentation is a municipal court update by Judge uh, Virginia V. Hill. I do want to note, though, that I am not seeing Judge B. Hill um, on our meeting. Okay, I wonder if you want to, we can go to the next presentation. You might reach out to her and, let, and see if she had noted it on her calendar. Uh, yes, I, I sent her a reminder. So let's uh, move on to a presentation. Uh, 9B, and I'll continue to get in contact with Judge V. Hill. So item 9B is the City of Santa Fe monthly water supply and demand update given by Jesse Roach, our water division director. And Mr. Roach, you are here. You uh, want the screen to give us a presentation? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the governing body. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen and show that 
What I'm going to share with you all tonight is available on our website um, at city of Santa Fe, I'm sorry, santafenm.gov slash water. Um, and under the supply and demand updates, if you click on September 2021, you'll see exactly what I'm going to show. Um, and that is here. And so I'm going to step through this presentation and I'm happy to be interrupted or, um, or to stand for questions at the end. Um, the, the, <clears throat> the presentation consists of several figures and then bullets explaining those figures. So I'm going to scroll to the first figure and then go through the text describing it. Um, in September of 2021, we produced 306 million gallons of potable water. 83% of that production came from surface water sources or our rivers. Um, and then 94% of that production was sold to customers through meters. Um, and so the chart that I'm showing here is the total production by day from the lowest blue color is the Santa Fe River. The darker blue color is San Juan Chama water um, taken uh, at the Buckman Direct Diversion. The yellow color is our city well field, so um, well water taken from the ground in, within city limits. And the orange color is Buckman well field water. The gray color is water sold through meters on each day. And so the reason that they're not the same is because we have storage tanks which allow us to produce more than we sell in a given day. Um, so the difference between those would be the change in storage in those tanks. Um, the second uh, figure shows a cumulative production. And now this is for 2021. Um, and it shows river water, combined river water in blue here, and the percentage of the total that has come from river water so far. So through September 2021, um, the Cumulative from both sources was almost 7,000 acre feet, so 6,940 acre feet produced, of which 74% came from river water and 26% from wells. Total production is still a little bit below what we saw in 2020, so the dotted gray line is, is 2020 total production. Um, we estimate, the City of Santa Fe Water estimates that our renewable groundwater availability is on the order of 5,000 acre feet per year. Um, and at this point through October, we have slowed down on, on well production. So we're gonna end up producing much less than what we consider a, a renewable rate from the groundwater. Um, and I think that that is, is, a, is an adequate summary of that figure. The next figure is looking at reservoir storage um, the left graph shows reservoir storage along the Santa Fe River combined for both of our reservoirs, um, showing in blue the 2021, so this year's storage, which was at 1,223 acre feet at the end of September, compared to the storage that we saw in those reservoirs in 2019 in yellow and 2020 in orange. We can see that although we didn't have much inflow to the reservoirs. Um, at this point in the year, we're fairly close to, to where we had been in the, in the past couple of years. On the right side, we see total storage that we have of San Juan Chama water um, on the Chama system in the Chama reservoirs. And again, we see in blue the, the, the storage through the end of September of this year at about 13,000, uh, a little more than 13,000 acre feet and compared to the storage in those reservoirs in the past two years. Just for context, we our total demand in a year is less than 9,000 acre feet. So we can see that between these two sources, we, we currently, or as, as of the end of September, had over 14,000 acre feet of water and storage, which is, is more than a year's worth of total demand. Um, and then finally, on the last, um, sort of section of this report, I wanted to address um, some question, a question that was raised last time, which in, in my own words is uh, the concern that are we putting all of our eggs into one basket, and that basket being the return flow basket? And the short answer is no. Um, we have and we will continue to consider and assess a wide range of adaptation strategies to assure a resilient water future. Of these, the return flow project is the most resource effective new adaptation strategy available. And so it's the focus of, 
of a lot of our current attention. Um, but existing adaptation strategies, which include conservation and water rights acquisition, remain part of our day-to-day -day efforts. Um, I'm using this jargon, existing adaptation strategies. I'll explain what that means in the next couple of slides. Um, and adaptation strategies based on aquifer storage and recovery are, are under active consideration. Um, so I, that's kind of the short answer. And then I'm gonna dive into sort of some of the details here. So <clears throat> the threats to a resilient water future from our perspective are a combination of climate change, which has the potential uh, to reduce our supply um, in, in combined with an uncertainty of demand, uh, how much water will we need to provide to the community in the next 40 to 80 years? And when we put those two things together, if we did nothing, and that's the big caveat here is if we did nothing, we see the potential for shortages um, as early as the 2030s, but certainly um, by the 2050s under most scenarios. Um, zooming in just slightly to each of those, um, the, uh, let's see, the Bureau of Reclamation in 2013 projected that up to one third of our average annual supply could be reduced by 2100 compared to uh, the 1900s. There's an update to these numbers in the works, but this remains sort of the best available estimate of what climate change might do to our water resources. So we're looking at, at being able to be ready for 25, 30, you know, a third of uh, a reduction of our supply by a third by, you know, in, in by the end of the century. When we combine that with not really knowing what the demand of our community is going to be in the future, uh, and this graph sort of just shows we typically look at population projections. And so for our planning efforts, these population projections that we are looking at, we're showing that the city customers um, served by the utility we were estimating would be somewhere in between 90,000 and 150,000 users in the city by 2070. Um, and at the same time, somewhere between 50,000 and 80,000 users of this county utility by 2070. We don't know what will happen. And so we, we utilize a range of forecasts to try and be ready for, essentially be ready for anything. When we put those two things together, we have this uh, supply, potential impact to supply and, and um, potential growth to demand leading to potential supply shortages. Um, and this graph shows what those shortages might look like if we did nothing. And now the red dotted line is kind of the, the for the middle of the climate change scenarios, but the high growth scenario that I showed you on that on the previous um, graph. And the dotted blue line is kind of the middle of the climate change scenarios, but for a low growth scenario. And so sort of the the, the space between those two lines represents how much we don't understand about how much demand we are gonna to need to be serving out into the future. Um, and then on the other hand, the, the red shading represents the, the range of different projections associated with supply that we get from the global climate models. Uh, and so that's where we say, if the global climate models that are showing things worse than any of the others are combined with the high growth scenario and we don't do anything, we could potentially start to see shortages by the 2030s. That's the upper end of this envelope. Um, on the other hand, if we are on a lower growth scenario and the climate change models are sort of, we look at one of the traces that where things are not changing as quickly, then we might not see shortages until out much further. Um, so that's wh where we start with if we do nothing. And then, the next step is once you've identified the potential for shortages, the question is, well, what do we do about those shortages? And so that is this word that I've been throwing out. The adaptation strategies are our attempt to uh, alleviate, to minimize or hopefully um, alleviate any, any potential future shortage. So I wanted to go through the adaptation strategies, um, the sort of sectors of strategy or, or the, 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 the types of strategies that were considered in the 2015 Santa Fe Basin Study, which is the first planning study 
that we took on, and I think that was taken on in the state where we did try to directly incorporate climate change information. Those, um, and then in red, I have what we've done since we developed that report and those adaptation strategies. Um, so the first, the first set is water conservation, and this is part of our basic ethic at the, at the water division is conservation will always be part of what we're doing. We spend on the order of $1.6 million a year directly in support of conservation. Um, the second sort of top type of adaptation strategies evaluated was direct or indirect reclaimed water use. And that's exact, and that's where the San Juan Chama return flow project came from. And we are moving towards that. The third set of topics is related to aquifer storage and recovery. And internally at a staff level, we are evaluating concepts for aquifer storage and recovery along the Santa Fe River, either in the channel or near the river channel and also potential ideas for aquifer storage and recovery, infiltration of either effluent or raw river water for recovery with um, some of our Buckman Wellfield wells. And then the final adaptation strategy is continued um, acquisition of surface water rights, which allows us to, to fully utilize um, our permit in the Buckman Wellfield. And we do continue to purchase those and require large developments to, to do the same on our behalf. Um, so in summary, um, we, we have and we will continue to evaluate all reasonable options to maintain a resilient water future within a wide range of potential future scenarios. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing and stand for questions. Thank you, uh, Jesse. I, I have one question. Uh, question. I don't know if you have the statistics at your fingertips, but I remember you made a presentation in the past that said uh, on an annualized basis, we were producing about 13,000 acre feet per year and using about 9,000 acre feet per year over the last five years. And I was wondering how we are tracking this year to those past five years. Are we uh, producing less, using more, producing more, using less, or about the same as the, or some other variant of the of the of that five year uh, operational numbers of production and utilization. So, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the governing body, um, I I believe because of the numbers you're throwing out, you may be um, thinking about production in 1995 compared to production in about the last five years. Um, and so I would say as a reminder to the governing body, in 1995, we as a community peaked in our potable production at over 13,000 acre feet. And in the last five years, each year, the city has been under 9,000. Uh, and so that's where we get the, um, you know, the, the, 33% demand, 33% decrease in total water use over that 25 years. And at the same time, we've added about 25% to our, our, our customer user base. So that's a, a big statistic that we use in terms of conservation. In terms of how much we produce and how much we actually use, um, that's a number that we call, the difference between those is something we call unaccounted water. And we typically are in the, in the, five to 8% range on that, which is, 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 is very good for a utility. Um, and, and so I hope I answered your question, but please um, uh, let me know if I didn't. Thank you. Other questions for Jesse, just raise a hand. I don't see other hands going up. So thank you, Jesse. That's all posted yeah. on the city web. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Rivera, is that you? Yeah, sorry, I had a question. Okay. Um, Jesse, is, is we do a better job of conserving water, um, it equates to less water going to the wastewater treatment plant, which means less effluent. So how does that factor into the slides you're showing and, and how we're anticipating things beyond 2030? Councilor Rivera, Mayor Weber, members of the governing body, I, I think that's a very astute question. Um, it does depend, um, our, it depends on where the conservation happens. So if you conserve water indoors and reduce your indoor use, then you would see a reduction in 
flows to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, if you reduce um, your outdoor demand, uh, then you would be reducing water that you're using outside but not returning to the system anyways. And so in that case, um, you wouldn't necessarily see a change to inflows to the, the water treatment plant. And it's very interesting in the last five years, the inflows to the water treatment plant are very close to the same throughout the year. And so that really supports the idea that this is um, indoor water use and the, and the increase in, in water use we see seasonally is a result of outdoor water use. So I think getting back to the root of your question, especially as we start to find ways to utilize our effluent uh, more efficiently, that the focus of our conservation efforts um, may shift towards really looking closely at the outdoor uh, conservation. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Roach? And Jesse, I was about to say, this is on, as you pointed out, it's on the website, people can access it. Why don't you say again how to find it? You betcha, thank you. It's santafenm.gov slash water. And on that landing page, which you can also find by going to Google and doing a Google search on City of Santa Fe Water, um, you will see a link for September 2021 supply and demand. There's also one for August of last year, um, and it's available there. I mean, yeah, August of this year, excuse me. Right. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate the briefing. Uh, Madam Clerk, have we found uh, the judge? Uh, Mayor, we have not. I sent reminder emails and also tried calling to leave a voice message. So um, I've not been able to get in contact. No, well, maybe something, something came up with her. I, I did, before going any further, I wanted to uh, make sure people who are watching and listening uh, and are uh, waiting for the opportunity to talk about the use of our federal ARPA funds, that will take place uh, in the seven o'clock session in uh, when we listen to folks uh, from uh, the community speak up, uh, if you want to speak to that particular opportunity uh, for those funds, uh, that won't be in the five o'clock. That'll be in the later session uh, this evening. Um, Madam Clerk, what's next? Moving on, we would go to item 10A, uh, consideration of a resolution establishing City of Santa Fe legislative priorities for consideration by the New Mexico State Legislature during the 55th Legislature State of New Mexico second session of 2022. I believe uh, Regina Wheeler, our public works director is available for this item as well as Mark Duran. Great. And we have, I, I know a number of uh, amendments proposed and discussion that we wanna take up. I think for purposes of uh, running the uh, conversation, um, maybe we could get a motion uh, on the floor to adopt and then we will uh, discuss amendments. So if I could get a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, there's a motion to adopt this uh, and a second. We're not voting, we are discussing and we have a number of amendments that need uh, action as well as discussion on priorities. So, um, I think perhaps uh, Councilman Virel, you have some amendments that you wanted to propose. I had one that uh, I think are rel I hope are relatively uncontroversial. Maybe we could take those up, and then there are uh, there's a Rivera amendment and a proposal for a Garcia amendment that may be a little more uh, needing of a deep dive discussion. So, Councilman Virel, why don't we give you the floor to start with? Mayor, uh, point of order. Yes, sir. Uh, I think I requested this. Oh, to come. you're right, Councillor. I apologize. My my bad. You were the one who pulled it. That's bad behavior on my part. You have the floor. Thanks. No worries. Um, so between uh, Public Works and the Finance Committee, uh, we came up with a list of five, and they were in order. Airport, <clears throat> Midtown. Let me get to that. Airport, uh, Midtown Improvements. Um, the third one was, I'm sorry, I'm out of order. Um, 
The second one was Swan Park. The third one was Midtown. Uh, number four was Median Beautification. And then number five um, was Fire Station number two uh, instead of a library. So that became the top five. And I think that was agreed to by both Public Works and uh, Finance Committee. So with that, um, I did want to ask Mark Duran, our lobbyist, um, to try to get a feel if he knew what the legislature was going to be looking at. Um, what he typically does is an idea of, of what funding sources are out there. And um, if I can uh, ask Mark to comment on that, that would be great. I see that Mr. Duran is with us and uh, maybe he could speak to the shape of the session and uh, Councilor Rivera's question about how the legislature is looking at funding things. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, counselors, nice to be with you. Um, as you may know, we have uh, uh, upcoming a 30-day legislative session. It'll begin as it always does uh, on the third uh, Tuesday of January. Um, I expect that legislative session to have a fair amount of calls uh, from the governor, messages from the governor. Uh, of course, in a 30-day session, you uh, can only introduce budget-related bills unless there is a message uh, from the governor. Preceding the legislative session, there's going to be a special legislative session in early December on redistricting. Um, back to the... Uh, uh, 30 day legislative session, I think we can expect, uh, by the way, I am anticipating that that is going to be an in-person legislative session, uh, have my fingers crossed. Uh, it has not been announced or decided uh, yet. Uh, legislative council service and legislative leadership will be making that decision, I bet, soon after the special legislative session on redistricting. Um, either way, it is going to be a robust, let's just say, legislative session. Uh, last legislative session of the governor's first term. Uh, still some uh, agenda items of hers that uh, she wants to complete work on. Uh, there's discussion of the uh, state's use of ARPA funds, just as you are doing in your meeting uh, later on today, potential use of infrastructure uh, monies if that congressional legislation were to pass. Um, one thing is for sure is that the state is in an excellent economic uh, position with the state's oil and gas revenues being where they are, particularly uh, 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 taxes up almost across the board, uh, the, the state is coming into this legislative session with uh, a lot of what we call one-time money, uh, money that can be used for capital outlay and one-time other source funding. Now, I think that uh, you know, as I assess, you know, the situation and the available uh, amount of funding, uh, I, I think no matter what, there's going to be a lot of funding. Traditionally, one-time funding uh, is used for capital outlay funding. One condition that exists now uh, is the fact that there was a lot of one-time money last legislative session. And when you take account all that money that was given to various entities and the amount of ARPA funds, leftover CARE Act monies, there's just a lot of money, if you will, pressuring those entities that normally receive capital outlay funding, their ability to process out that funding. And so there has been lots of discussion about um, uh, thoughts around utilizing monies for funds, uh, potentially a housing fund, putting money into what has turned out to be a really good experiment. 
And, and that was the child welfare fund, the idea where money was set aside for a child welfare fund, uh, interest earned on the corpus, uh, uh, early childhood, able to use that money and use that fund. That has worked very well with the performance of the stock market. That fund has done really well. I think we're going to do see lot, a lot more of that type of funding. There'll still be one-time capital outlay funding. Of course, there's the traditional source of capital outlay funding that will be available. That's severance tax, tax bond funding. Um, so overall, uh, uh, there will be money. Um, I think that uh, you all have done a good job putting together a, a priority list. Um, and of course, as, as we've always been, um, uh, we'll be aggressive uh, pursuing those monies and uh, I'm sure uh, be successful. With that, Mayor, I have now forgotten uh, Councillor Rivera's uh, original question. <laughs> I think that was really it, Mark, just an overview of what the legislature was doing, uh, monies that might be available. Um, if, if items are on our top five list, those items will be the focus of the city, right? So if sometimes in your negotiations or in your, not negotiations, but in your meetings uh, at the legislature, sometimes uh, item four may rise to the top of the list and, and gain a lot of traction. Is that correct? But it should be on the top five. Uh, Mayor, Councillor, uh, that is correct. Uh, uh, what you provide me with is, is uh, uh, top five set of projects and the, uh, I think the flexibility, I don't do this without uh, uh, consultation for sure, uh, uh, especially with the mayor is as we go into the legislative session, we have a pretty good idea of what is already being discussed and what already be, might be prioritized. But until we have actual legislative discussions, uh, by the way, we will um, now move into a legislative breakfast. If you pass this resolution tonight, uh, then that gives us the green light to have a legislative breakfast with our uh, local delegation as we have traditionally uh, had. Uh, uh, that's going to allow us to have a conversation with our legislators and, and they openly tell us uh, what their priorities are and what they think of our priorities. But there's nothing like them getting into a legislative session when their actual money allocation occurs and we then really see what they're interested in and what, they're, uh, uh, what they like in terms of our list. And that's where having that flexibility on the list is really important. I think that uh, uh, we're giving them a great set of uh, projects to choose from uh, and, and how can uh, not number one on that list, you know, I, I think you're making a good decision there, be the airport because uh, since it's been our top priority for so many years, it becomes almost the platform by which we have to have a capital LA discussion to begin with and, and to decide if either funding is going to go there or it's going to be prioritized to other projects on the list. All right. And then with regards to uh, individual uh, council district priorities, um, I think every district is asking for a lot more than we had in the past, but um, I'm not sure it'll all get funded, but if uh, a particular legislator were interested in, in funding something, they could fund uh, a portion of what we asked for. I, it, we're not asking one legislator to give the entire amount. Is that, does my question make sense? And is that fair? Uh. Uh, Mayor, Councillor, your question does make sense. I think it is fair. Um, I think uh, what Regina Wheeler and that team has done really well in, in offering you suggestions of, of what to prioritize in terms of district funding uh, uh, always has included in it flexibility. Um, 
because it's sort of the end of the process and it's the end of the money that the individual legislators will be providing. Many times it, it may not completely cover uh, the projects. And so we have to be nimble and make sure that we can utilize any portion of the money going towards that project. Uh, I think uh, Regina does a good job uh, uh, estimating or evaluating those projects uh, before you, you accept them as priorities uh, to kind of meet those conditions, if you will. Um, that being said, we, we, it used to be that we didn't get any district priorities funded, but we would get our one or two top priorities funded. Uh, with there being more and more money, we've gone deeper and deeper into getting greater funding for our district priorities. Um, I think we'll have a really good shot again at that this year. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gregorian. I uh, appreciate that. Um, that's the end of my questions, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, you were initially going to move yeah, I, towards those amendments, I think that weren't really, that were would probably go through pretty easily. And then we can talk about Councilor Garcia's and, and mine, or we can do that right away. I think, Councilor, you have the floor and you pulled the item. I give you the the uh, op the opportunity to move your amendment. All right, so my amendment replaces uh, the fire station with libraries and uh, Councillor Garcia's amendment, I believe replaces uh, the fire station with medians. So um, just to kind of clarify that, I know they look pretty similar on paper, but that's what they do. So uh, with that, I will, as agreed to by finance and public works, move my amendment to uh, replace uh, the fire station um, in place of the library put fire station number two. Okay, there's a motion to substitute the fire station rather than the library on our priority list. May, that motion comes from Councilor Rivera. Is there a second? Second. There's a second from Councilor Cassett. That, that amendment is now open for discussion. I see Councilwoman Villarreal's hand and also see Director Wheeler's hand, but I think I'm going to have to recognize Councilwoman Villarreal first. She was first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick um, addition. So Council Rivera said that Public Works and Finance passed this priority list, um, and so did Quality of Life. From my recollection, we had airport first, uh, Swan Park, Midtown Campus, um, Fire Station 2, and Median Beautification. And we did have um, a long conversation about various sources that could be covered um, in, different, in different ways. Um, for, for one, the library, that's why we put it down to six. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And then just ask a question of Director Wheeler. Um, last year, we requested funding for beautification. I thought that was for parks and medians, or was that just parks? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilor Villarreal, it was just parks. Okay. So have we ever asked for funding for medians? Uh, Mayor, Councilor Villarreal, we have actually. The median project has been on our ICIP list for a couple of years. Um, it was an $8 million project, and it was further down on the list. Um, and now we've sort of tuned it up and give it some focus. And um, yeah, so it has been there, but not a priority. Okay. And just wanted to um, thank Mr. Duran for being with us. And just a question for you based on your knowledge of the legislative session and how funding gets dispersed. What is the likelihood medians would be funded? Um, through the legislative session, through legislative appropriations? Um, Just curious. Uh, Councilor, uh, uh, Mayor, and, and you're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Uh, do I think that the legislature would consider it if we talked about it being a top, top priority? Um, um, I hearken back to last year when uh, we had a strategy of asking the legislature to fund the infrastructure, right? Uh, uh, 
not normally the best of, of, of marketing that you can do with infrastructure, but we did it. And I think we did it because we said it's a top, top priority. And so if we were to describe it as such, uh, then I think we could get some attention paid to it. Do I think that there would uh, be more attention paid to uh, Swan Park, Midtown and Fire Station over medians? I do, uh, uh, unless I was told to then emphasize medians. Thank you for that information. And I guess I was thinking more about median beautification and that our budget will need to increase because we're, um, we're taking on roads that we never had before that were primarily or were previously run by the state. Um, so I keep thinking about that need and that worries me. So I see the need of the budget increase. I guess I would just have to say that I'm not in favor of having um, medians with full on um, irrigation systems that require fun, um, continual maintenance. I'm all about xeriscaping, making it simple for us, getting other people involved um, in the community. I know that we haven't had great success with the adopt a median. So I just, I think that there's a way to think about that in the future. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to put out median as, as one of our top priorities, especially because library, as, as much as I'm in favor of the um, focus in getting funding, I think there's another, there's other sources that make, may make more sense. So I just wanted to, to voice that again. Um, we had a lot of this discussion in, in our committee. So just wanted to share that, my thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll come back around for your uh, amendments that's still on the list by sure for all, by all, you know, for sure. Uh, Director Wheeler, did you want to respond? We also have hands from Councillor Merriworth and Councillor Cassett. I think you're muted, Director. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, pardon me. Um, I just wanted to share, and I think um, the Councillor Villarreal sort of pointed toward it and, and other councillors may say it, but um, at the quality of life, we did have a valuable discussion to realize that the library project is probably a great candidate for our potential geo bond next year. And so that we thought that the GRT bond would be a great, a better place to fund the design, the preliminary design work so that we could have the design, preliminary design work done in time for the geo bond. So it's not that the library isn't super important to us. In fact, it kind of moves it up in our priority list because we want to fund it sooner. And I know Councilor Villarreal was pointing towards that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, it is very, um, it seems logical that uh, we would put xeriscape plants and not need irrigation in the medians, but actually the success of a median design is xeriscape plants with irrigation. It's the only way that you can successfully support the preferred species in that median and prevent the undesirable species. I mean, they have to be very aggressive. They have to be very healthy. They have to stay really well established to prevent the elms um, and the salt bush and that kind of thing. So it actually is a big infrastructure project as you could see on that additional sheet that I sent last week with more information about the medians. It's, you gotta bite the bullet, get the whole infrastructure in there, but then it really is much more sustainable, lower maintenance, better aesthetics. Um, and so I just wanted to add that it does seem like you would put some drought tolerant plants and you wouldn't need irrigation, but it's a really important piece of the, of the whole puzzle. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Romero Worth. You have the floor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Director Wheeler, for uh, starting to get into the library conversation that we had at Quality of Life. Um, I think it would be useful, mostly for um, the public who, who probably doesn't watch the Quality of Life Committee. I, I do want, as you point out, and as Councilwoman Villarreal has pointed out, it's not that we don't think the library is an important project and, and that and that there's work to be done. If you could talk just a little bit about the timing of when we would get these funds and why the legislative money in terms of getting design money um, is not the best source and why the other one is. So maybe get, get into a little bit more detail about why, what we uh, talked about at Quality of Life around uh, the funding source for library for the library not coming from the legislature this for the design piece this time around. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor, Councilor Romero Worth. Um, yes, we, the legislative appropriations on a very typical year, we um, know about our appropriations and then they're um, signed by the governor by the end of the session, say March on a long session. Um, and then we usually get the agreements for the funding in September, and then we have to go through the governing body to get them approved and entered. And so work can usually begin in January of the following year after the appropriation. Um, and that's a pretty typical, this year it's a much slower process, but um, everybody understands why that is. So our GRT bond is a whole lot more under our own control. Uh, a gross receipts tax bond does not go to the voters. Um, there is bonding capacity. Um, all the department directors will work together with finance and the elected officials to um, put together a package of what needs to be funded, largely deferred maintenance issues, but also high priority new projects like this. And that could provide funding as soon as June of next year or possibly even sooner. Um, and so that does give us a little bit more time. And then a GO bond, a general obligation bond would go to the voters, has to go to the voters. So it would go next November. We'd need to put together that package. And so we'd like to fund the preliminary design of the library as soon as possible so that we can start getting cost estimates, programmatic design. Um, and so that's why uh, it seems suddenly that the GRT bond is actually a better place to fund the library design than a legislative appropriation. So not only could it be part of the GO bond, the design, um, but it could also be part of a legislative act, uh, ask uh, next year at this time. Um, it, whereas if we ask for the design money, we won't even have the money from the legislature next year at this time. So I, I think it's just really important that the public understands we're, we're not not supporting libraries. In fact, we are uh, picking a path that will, uh, as I think you said, move up the library uh, in its positioning to actually uh, start to get, get to work on it. So I, I, I just think library is a very important piece. Love them, uh, the community does too. And um, I, I just want us to be clear about that. Um, since uh, Councilwoman Villarreal brought up the medians um, and we've been having this conversation, uh, the, the medians were, are, I think the idea is that this money that we're asking the legislature for will fund a couple of different designs for medians to serve different purposes is my understanding and particularly to focus on the gateway or the entryways into the city um, and, and the medians that are needed there. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, Mayor Councilor Romero Worth, it'll actually fund quite a not lot more than a, than a few designs. It'll probably be more like 10. Okay. Um, because in some places on a small median and it, with some particular configurations, maybe stamped concrete is the right answer for certain medians, or maybe all rock and a sculpture might be the right design. Um, but in others, you want a much better installation like some of our uh, adopt a median um, landscaping companies and, and fine art companies have done. Um, and we did speak to the um, city of Albuquerque um, and to gather other uh, information that was provided in that um, in that additional document. And um, they have and they highly recommend that once you do land on some good designs, that's your those templates are codified and anybody that's creating medians will start to use those sustainable designs. So it's actually quite a bit of infrastructure also from a sort of a policy and design perspective that we're establishing with this project. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, so so we will have templates that can be used wherever they're appropriate throughout the city, and there is some focus on the entryways to the city. Absolutely. Okay, and you know it's 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 interesting because the other thing the Quality of Life Committee has been talking about um, is is the issue of speeding and uh, how we address uh, that problem, and you know. It, I believe, and I don't know whether these medians will help us, but you know, th there is a concept I, when I was on the MPO about having road diets and how we um, build the roads uh, helps uh, attain the goal of getting the, sp the speeding level that you want, right? What's, how, how fast or slow do you want the traffic to move? And some of that is around median construction and how we 
and, and and I think also you know other pedestrian and 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 bicycle infrastructure that we might add um, will help in this other problem. So this could be a good thing to solve not just the weed problem, um, but you know the the speeding and and uh, and and safety of bicyclists and um, uh, uh, who are the other guys? Pedestrians. That's them. Uh, it, I mean, is that? Will we touch on on any of that as we as we look at this, or is that a stretch? Thank you, Mayor Council Romero Worth. We actually had included in the scope changing the configuration of medians, but it's a great point that you bring up. We should absolutely make sure that any median that we're going to do a new installation and rehabilitation on isn't slated for future changes. Um, and, and that that might do that. And, and just to, since you brought the topic up, uh, just to let you know, as part of our uh, pavement rehabilitation projects, we are looking at where we can stripe roads to have narrower lanes and wider bike lanes. And so we just did it on Camino O'Leary actually, we're reducing the lane width to 10 feet with the support of our traffic engineer so that it does do that. You know, you're in a little tighter space, you go a little slower and it gives the bicycles and the peds more uh, safety and buffer. So um, that's a great point to bring up. We'll definitely take a look at the medians for which ones might be reconfigured to help us with our speeding problem. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you very much. And Councillor Cassett followed by Councillor Garcia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and thank you, Councilwoman Villarreal and Councilwoman Romero Worth. You pretty much covered my, uh, my points. Um, again, just really wanna make sure that everybody understands the library component and, and how we are looking at um, timing and stacking of funding to, to prioritize these things, because I do think that that is really crucial. Um, and then the other part with meetings that I brought up numerous times um, throughout the committee discussions was, and Councilwoman Villarreal um, also alluded to this, you know, we're bringing on some more streets that we have maintenance of, but we also had a hard time this year, um, you know, we staying up to date and I'm not sure everybody uh, fully comprehends the size of the staff and the um, the workload that that staff has for maintaining weed. So, so Regina, Dr. Wheeler, can you please talk about what that team actually is working on throughout the city? Um, thank you, Mayor and um, Councillor Cassett. We have over 500 medians in the city. Um, we have, we only have a limited number of parks crews that take care of all of our parks and all of our medians. And so there is one crew uh, dedicated to the medians. Um, they come in at uh, four o'clock in the morning to work on the medians because they're going to be in high traffic areas and that reduces their risk. It also reduces risk of damage to uh, vehicles passing by where there's use of weed whackers. Um, and this year, in order to try to really even come close to keeping up with the um, weeds on the medians, we hired contractors to supplement uh, the, the work of the staff. And we, as you could see, we didn't stay ahead of it uh, by any means because largely because the city of Santa Fe has decided to be a chemical free uh, herbal, you know, um, vegetative management city. And that leaves for a lot of extra labor. Um, and so um, we have a small crew, they work every single day at four o'clock in the morning, as long as they can. And um, and then we do supplement with contractors or who are also working at four o'clock in the morning to work on the medians. Thank you, Director Wheeler. And, and to, to put the chemical free into layman's terms, we don't use herbicides. So there is no spraying happening. So we can't kill plants uh, with chemicals. We have to um, pull them. And for me, that's been actually a piece of this. I actually think medium beautification is a bit of a misnomer um, because while in the end there will be some beautification of, of the medians and um, helping with, with the appearance and, and what people are seeing as they're driving, there's also the component of um, more efficiency for this team. Um, and so they're not constantly feeling like they're you know, trying to catch up. I know the CRM request, just the work order request, just stack up on them. Um, and it's a lot, but it's also a bit of a safety issue, you know, making sure that weeds aren't obstructing views. Um, and then the Councilor Romero Worth's point about, you know, what else do our medians do for us and how does it work with some of the, the traffic calming and how do we use the built environment? And that's an area that I'm also very interested in exploring. And I know that sometimes median 
design, not even just the shape of the median, but what is in the median, I believe can have a traffic calming uh, effect from what I've been reading. And so that is something that I'd be really interested as we are working with the um, professional landscapers that would be partnered with at the beginning of this to really come up with those designs is looking at, you know, if there might be some, some possibility there. So I, I think that when we say beautification and when we say, you know, this is just money to make our medians look pretty, it's a pretty narrow view of um, what in actuality this, this potentially can do in terms of efficiency for city staff um, and the safety concerns of visibility as well as potential opportunities for traffic calming. Um, it's, it's one of those things that seems really simple, but when you start to dig, there's there's a lot more there. Um, I believe that's it. You know, I, again, I saw this both at Quality of Life and Finance and um, both committees had agreed on that, that same list of five that Council Rivera had listed off. So I will yield the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councilor Garcia. And then Councilor Romero, with your hand is back up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I wasn't going to talk on this point, but since uh, my colleague brought it up in regards to the staffing level of our teams, it hasn't historically been the case. I think we're we've, we've cut that staff dramatically. So I think that's that we, we can't blame that on it. They're overworked. We, we, what we need to do is we need to hire more staff, like uh, in step, bring back the staffing levels that we've had in the past. Um, so, so with that, I think, you know, with the beautification is going to need more staff. It's going to require much more maintenance. Uh, we heard Director Wheeler say earlier, we want to install irrigation. That's going to require maintenance. We want to install, um, um, uh, install some type of plant life. That's going to require maintenance. Uh, so because we beautify doesn't mean it's going to require less maintenance. It's actually going to require much more and you're gonna have much more requests from the community to say, this used to look great, now it's overgrown and such and such. So get back there and trim it trim and make it nice and pretty again. So it's gonna, we, we need to focus on getting more people staffed to support those medians um, because beautification or not, we need more staff and in, in to support that. Um, I, I do have a question in regards to the bond that we were just talking about earlier. And so a geo bond that would have to go to the voters and when would that go? Director Wheeler. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilor Garcia, uh, the best, the most cost effective way to do it is during a, an election that's already happening. Otherwise uh, the city has to, uh, I believe fund a special election. Okay, so given my schedule of timing, the next election besides the one we're in the middle of right now, will not be until next June when we have our primaries. Uh, so I don't understand how we can get the monies next June if the primaries aren't until June. Um, Mayor, Councilor Garcia, we were actually targeting in the November election for the uh, geo bond. As this, you saw the school bonds on the ballot this uh, at this election, ours would look similar. And then in the last election, you saw the county did geo bonds. Right. So, so I guess let me back up then. And how can we get, because some, I think it was you, Ms. Wither, who mentioned we can get monies in June of 2022, but that would have required us what to have a geo bond in this election, right? I'm sorry, um, Councilor Garcia, if I misspoke, um, we were talking about funding the design with a GRT bond that does not go to the voters that would be done first, that okay. would help us prep for the geo. Okay. That, that's where I was missing with that piece. Thank you so much for that. GRT bond, not going to the voters. Um, thank you for that clarification. And then I think one, one piece we wanna, I, I wanna remind folks that, you know, the GEO bond shared with the GRT bond, we can uh, not take it to the people to the, for their vote on the matter. Um, but if we do the GEO bond route, let's just say similar to what's going on in Albuquerque right now for the stadium vote. What if the people didn't want to approve the library monies? What, what kind of predicament does that put us in in that sense? Because we, then we've kind of begun the process, but then we haven't asked the legislature. So we're kind of one step behind in the process, asking them for the resources. 
Um, I, I would think it's better for us to continue to go to the legislature to ask for these monies until we've fully funded the project. Um, given that, you know, we heard from Mr. Duran earlier, projects like the medians aren't necessarily projects they like to fund. And um, I think that's where we all know the goal is for Fogelson to become a world-class library. And I'd like for us to have as many pokers in the fire trying to get accomplish that versus having one plan that might have some, some, some flaws in it should the voters say, well, sorry, we're, we don't want to approve this. So then that would mean we would have to go back to the legislature to try to recoup the money, right? Director Wheeler. Mayor, um, Councilor Garcia, um, I think actually if we fund the design in the GRT bond and that would get funded sometime in the first half of next year, and then the GEO bond doesn't, uh, isn't successful at funding the library, then we could actually go to, the, we, it would be great timing to go to the legislature next year with a request to help with funding for construction of the library. What, what's on the ICIP right now is help for funding of the design, um, but we'd be ready to ask for funding of construction. So I, I think that sequence works pretty well as too. Okay. I just, again, I'd like for us, given we know what the, the, the plentiful amount of resources we have this upcoming session, whereas we don't know if that's gonna be the case in 2023. And I think that's where I'm I, 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 having that trouble in the sense we should go after our bigger projects when there's more money and hope with the hopes that we can begin to accumulate some resources, whether it's a quarter of it now, half of it now, and then half of it next year. I mean, I think this is a, given that this is a, a project that we know we're moving forward with no matter what we just got to figure out how we're going to fund it um i think it's I, I that's why i believe it's in our best interest to still keep this in our top five i i'm in complete agreement with council rivera wanting to move up the fire station um but that's where i i i'd hate to move out a, a, a significant priority like the library uh given we know it's a priority. We, we know that that's a, a project we're moving forward with. Um, with that, no other questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Mayor Worth, you have your hand up, you have the floor. Yeah, sorry, Mayor, I, I just can't resist. So um, back to the medians and um, the fact that we don't use pesticides or herbicides to control weeds in the city. I think that's a really important point that sometimes gets forgotten uh, as we struggle to figure out the best strategy for um, controlling weeds and making them uh, some, uh, and making media in something that we can be proud of that make the city look good. I just also wanna take the opportunity uh, to remind uh, the public that we are also a B city. And in doing that, we uh, want to make sure that we have plants uh, for pollinators and that's part of being a B city. And so some of um, the plants that we have in medians and in other places um, serve that purpose and aren't weeds uh, in that true sense of that word. So, um, just to, it, just to, I guess, broaden our thinking a little bit, I wanted to, to mention that. And of course, you know, if we, no matter whether they're pollinator plants or, or, or not pollinator plants, and if they're obstructing views and creating unsafe uh, driving conditions because you can't see around them, yeah, we need to cut them back. And, you know, I think going forward, if as we look at this new median strategy, we'll be able to, um, uh, put the design, the template in place uh, to make sure that that we're doing right by all these different things, right by bees, right by public safety, right by uh, um, making the the um, 
the weeds or the construction, the way, the median, something that we actually can take care of um, and, and not uh, be just run amok, I guess. Um, I, I also wanna just point out um, legislators are elected officials. Uh, they hear the same sorts of complaints uh, that we hear. Uh, I think, you know, there are in certain parts of town, I think there are probably legislators who uh, drive by these medians and would would like to see um, a different look, a different strategy towards um, making the built environment, as, as Councillor Cassett uh, called it, uh, uh, something that they can be proud of too and that they have a hand in. Um, also want to suggest in my experience with the legislature, um, big ticket items are often phased. You know, rarely do you get all the money you need to do whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a library or an airport or a teen center uh, or whatever it is. Um, often what happens is you get the design money, you get the, you know, construct money, you get the furnish money. And so it, I think the strategy we have here with the library is actually a really sound one um, to get the money that we need for design. Uh, and also uh, years of legislative experience, uh, geo bonds, libraries do very well uh, at, in geo bonds. Um, you'll notice when the legislature does their geo bonds, uh, they actually have one chocked full of library needs across the state. Uh, and that's because voters like libraries. So I think um, the strategy that's been outlined that we discussed in the, at the committee level uh, is a very good one, both in terms of its phasing and uh, in terms of positioning it uh, for a geo bond, um, which does very well with voters historically. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And, and I take a minute just to reiterate what uh, Mark Duran, our very experienced uh, lobbyist representative has said, which is we're really talking about uh, a lot of different ways to fund these priorities. It's We have not just this year, but looking into the future, uh, assuming the federal government continues with the progress they're making, the state uh, continues to have surplus uh, revenues. We're doing very well with our own GRT in recovery. Um, it looks to me as if we're really in a position to have a kind of an all of the above strategy when it comes to our priorities, just different ways of funding them. And so the considerations that Director Wheeler was laying out about the timetable and the phasing of our priorities suggests to me we're, we are really in a very opportune situation to have uh, a lot of the priorities coming forward from different sources and not having to pick or choose uh, in a scarcity environment. And that's a good thing. It gives us a chance to have a strategy, not just for what our priorities are, but for the best way to fund them uh, using our bonding capacity, using the good relations we have with the governor and the legislature, using the the current efforts coming out of Washington to um, build build back better, as the slogan goes, uh, we may very well be uh, looking at money that will build a, a most, if not all, of these in a timely way from different sources. So we're we're really not having to uh, put anything off. We're simply trying to address the top five. Councilor Rivera, your hand is up. You have the floor. Yeah, since we're getting ready for a vote, so I just wanted to take a brief second to apologize to the Quality of Life Committee and uh, Chairwoman Romero Worth, and thank you, Councilwoman Villarreal, for bringing it up. Um, wasn't done intentionally, it just happens when your mind gets old, so uh, my <laughs> sincerest apologies. Thank you, Councilor, and thank you for um, making your, your picture a little brighter. You were, it was all, not always easy to see your hand going up because your screen was a little darker than usual, but coming through loud and clear, Council. Uh, are there any other comments about the motion? We have a, an amendment on the floor proposed from Council Rivera. It's an amendment to the main motion. Any other discussion of the amendment? We're not voting on the main motion, but on the amendment. 
If there's no other discussion, can the clerk call the roll on this amendment, please? I guess one second, sorry. Um, on the amendment, so I have Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor Rivera. Yes. Councillor Romero Ward. Yes. Councillor B. Hill Coppler. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councillor Abeta. Yes. Councillor Cassett. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. The amendment has been approved. So we now have a main motion as amended with the Rivera amendment. We have three more amendments pending, um, including one from Councillor Garcia and one from uh, Councilwoman Villarreal and one that I have that is pending as well, but I think it's the less, mine is the least uh, urgent in some respects because it doesn't directly affect spending. Councillor Garcia, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you pass one moment? I got to oh, take absolutely. Three. I'm sorry. I thought you had your hand up. Uh, let's move Councilwoman VRL to your amendments and take them up at this time then. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these amendments were approved unanimously in the Quality of Life Committee. There was minor tweaking of language that um, was done since then. And so I don't know if it helps to read them into the record. I think you should do it because not everybody may be able to track it on the screen. Sounds good. Okay, and just so you know, a, um, a few of these were actually um, items that I added because I've heard that there's potential that they may be on the call for the governor. Um, it's not certain yet, but I've, I've heard that discussion. So um, on page three, line 24, insert the following new paragraphs, be it further resolved that the city of Santa Fe supports and endorses any legislation that slows down the timeline for eviction and improves opportunities for mediation between renters and landlords. Be it further resolved that the city of Santa Fe supports and endorses any legislation that replenishes and seeks a reoccurring funding source to support MFA's housing trust fund. <laughs> and then on page three, line 24, insert this new paragraph, which actually this is not new. This was on um, our legislative priorities last year and we just modified it a bit. Um, so it's be it further resolved that the governing body supports and endorses the establishment of a regional drug treatment facility that would serve the residents of Santa Fe and Northern New Mexico. And um, the last one on page four, line 13, insert the following new paragraph, be it further resolved that the city of Santa Fe continues to support statewide paid sick leave legislation as reinforced by the city's resolution number 2021-11 unanimously unanimously passed in 2021. So I, I wanted to add that last one um, because there's been discussion with some industry that they want to remove that um, for the state of New Mexico. And I think we need to show our support that that was an important, um, that was an important legislation that passed last year. So Could you, time for questions. Do you care to move that as a, uh, an amendment? Yes, move to approve uh, what I just read as <laughs> the following amendments. Uh, thank you, is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to insert this amendment into the resolution. Is there discussion on this amendment? Councilwoman Veal Coppler, you have the floor. Thank you. I, I just wanna ask Councilor Villarreal on her uh, number one, second paragraph, uh, reoccurring, just, could we just say recurring? I don't think there's a reoccurring <laughs> word. <laughs> that works. Okay, thank you. Just a friendly amendment, thank you. Thank you. Or correction, I should say. Thank you. Okay, so it, it would read recurring funding source, not reoccurring, right? I think that was a typo, but thank you, yes. Okay, we'll take that as a correction in the typing or in the, in the mistake of the typing. Uh, other uh, hands for to address this um, this set of three amendments to fit into the resolution. 
If there's no other discussion, uh, Madam Clerk, could you call the roll on this amendment? Uh, yes, on the amendment uh, by Councilwoman Villarreal. I have uh, Councilor Rivera. Yes. Councilor Romero Ward. Yes. Councilor Vigil Coppler. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councilor Abetha. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Garcia. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion has been approved. Okay, thank you. So that we now have the main amendment or the main motion as amended by both the Rivera amendment and the Villarreal amendment. And now, uh, Councillor Garcia, I'll come back to you uh, if you would like to speak to your proposed amendment or how you would like to potentially adjust it given the Rivera amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I appreciate Councillor Rivera with his amendments and bringing the fire station up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think that's an absolute priority for us. It's been a priority. And as we know, the pandemic kind of shifted that. And I'm glad that it's back in back in our top five. Um, my amendment was the purpose was to bring the fire station into our top five um, and bring out the medians, given that I believe, you know, it, there are other things that are more urgent priorities. And, uh, and, and, you know, coupled with even given what Mr. Duran said earlier, that those aren't tip projects that are typically favorable by the legislature. So with that, I would not like to move forward with my amendment as written, but I would like to move forward with an amendment to remove priority number four and replace it with priority number eight on the list, which is the Southside Library Community Plaza. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the medium beautification project as it stands to me, it, it's, uh, it's not a, an efficient way of taxpayer dollar usage. Um, we, we can develop a plan at a fraction of that cost. And I know we can, if we work with community experts, um, I, I'm not in complete agreement that we need to install irrigation. I, I think uh, you know, as, as I've mentioned in committee meetings, um, even with in, uh, medians that have zero irrigation, they're getting overrun with Siberian elms and other weeds. And so if we add water to that situation, it's just going to turn those, those little Siberian elm weeds into full-blown trees, which are actually happening in some of our medians. They've, they've sprouted from little inch things to our, that are now trees. We are now growing trees that we didn't anticipate. And I can only imagine we see what's going on above ground, what's happening underground and, and how the, the destruction it's causing. Um, I, I think if we work with local experts and the community and we do things like have a competition potentially to say, look, we've got, uh, let's, let's see how we can develop medians at a maximum cost of $10,000. I, I think, when you engage the community in that manner, not only are we gonna see great input, we're gonna see great support. So I think that's where I, I can't support the, the proposal as it stands. And that's why I'm thinking if we move forward with number eight, which is half the cost um, and it supports, as we, as we were talked about in some of our committee meetings, supports a great need at our Southside Library I think the legislature would be much more open to supporting that than supporting a medium beautification project in, in the sense. Um, I wanna make it crystal clear, by no means am I saying we don't need to tackle the median problems that we currently have. I, I think that is a priority, but we don't need to tackle it with the high price tag that we are putting on it at the moment. The high price tag that comes at the taxpayer expense and I think that's what folks need to understand here. I, I, I've, I've uh, asked plenty of community members, do we have problems with weeds? Yes, there's a resounding yes. When we start asking them, should we start spending tens of thousands of dollars and the upwards of $70,000 per median, it's a resounding no, absolutely not. And I think that's where 
what, again, I'll circle back when we involve the community, we will get a much better product. Um, if we push the medians to number eight, there's nothing that would prohibit entities like Santa Fe, keep Santa Fe beautiful to go into the legislature to get those resources, should they want to fund it. I mean, if the legislature really wants to fund it, there's nothing that prohibits them from doing so. And I, honestly, there's nothing that prohibits them from doing so, even if it's not in our top five. I just think it's, it's, it's in bad form for us to go to them with such a high price tag project. Um, I think that's one thing that the public doesn't really, we're, we're not being fully transparent to the public is the price tag per median. Because again, if we, we put it out there, the cost per median we're looking at, you, you, we would all be getting the feedback Absolutely not. So with that, I move forward to with the motion to replace uh, item number four in the resolution with item that is listed as number eight in the memo, which is the Southside Library Community Plaza at a cost of $1.5 million. Thank you, Councillor. There's a motion to substitute a median project with the Southside Library project in our top five priorities. A uh, motion offered as an amendment from Councillor Garcia. Looking for a second. Second. Councillor Deal Coppler has seconded the motion. Uh, so the motion to uh, amend the amended main motion now has another amendment in front of us. Um, I'm open to discussion about this priority switch. If anybody wants to address it. Okay, I don't see any hands going up. I do wanna I ask uh, Mr. Duran to just have a brief uh, conversation clarification with me. I was smiling when you were describing our strategy from the last legislative session, which I think you were very effective at um, articulating and developing. And that had to do with uh, finding a series of what you might call smaller infrastructure projects rather than large scale, big ticket items and saving some of our, um, saving some of our political capital, if you will, for the next session, which is what we're coming up to now. And I'm not sure you, that, that really was a very effective strategy in the last go round. I don't know if you want to describe it a little bit because it does speak to the way in which over a period of time you've been able to work with the legislature. We never know exactly what the response will be or what the, uh, the, what the resources will be, of course, until a session actually convenes. But the effectiveness of having those kind of ongoing dialogues and building a sense of uh, relationship over our priorities over time has gone, in some cases, for big ticket items and in other cases for much more specific focused targeted uh, infrastructure investments that demonstrate have demonstrated to the legislature and to the governor that we have a, a, a wide uh, spectrum of projects that we want to work on. Uh, counselor, I mean, uh, Mayor, um, counselors. Um, that was a lot, Mayor, and, and I agree with everything you, you said. And, you know, I don't come and take a position one way or another. I take your priorities and I go sell them uh, to the legislature. Can I sell medians to the legislature? You bet. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, uh, last year we sold infrastructure to the legislature. Uh, is it normally, uh, have we been more successful in the past having a big name project that uh, uh, a legislator can point to like an airport or a uh, police station renovation or uh, uh, other projects. Uh, yes, I think that that's somewhat is of an easier sell, but uh, I'm not there to take the easiest sell. And so <laughs> um, I think that, that it, it, was a, it was a very good strategy. Um, and we still have to talk to our legislators, right? And, and they may very well say to uh, uh, Councillor Romero-Worth's uh, point that 
that they they want to fix the mediums. Uh, they may something say something different that's not on our priority list, and we can amend the priority list. We will adjust. We haven't talked to the legislators, and so I think that uh, uh, if we sold infrastructure and we did that really well, we can sell medians. Um, uh, we still need to talk to our legislators. They're going to have input on our priorities. They're going to have other priorities. It always works that way. And guess what? Even after we talk to them at our legislative breakfast, it can change again mm -hmm. as we actually get into a legislative session and people actually have their money uh, allocation. And so um, I think all of these priorities are good priorities uh, uh, and can work. Thank you, Mr. Duran. I appreciate it. Uh, other, anybody wish to address the amendment as proposed? Councilor Abeda, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to, uh, again, verify that with Mr. Duran, that something like the Southside Library, which I'm in full, full support of, if it doesn't make the top five, we can still request funding for it, especially if there are legislators or a senator that is interested in that project, correct? Uh, Mayor and Councillor, I'm glad you brought up uh, the point. Um, and, and I don't want to now open up a whole uh, uh, bag of additional projects, right? Because I think we, we're, we're successful as a result of submitting uh, top five projects. The fact is, there is not a top five limitation of projects uh, from an entity like the city of Santa Fe that you can submit. Um, uh, I have clients that submit 10 and 15 uh, projects. Does it happen that you get a little bit spread out all over the place and then you can't condense uh, legislator, their individual legislator funding into getting uh, completion towards a project and especially a bigger project, that's what happens. Um, but there is no limitation, uh, 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 reasonable limitation on the number of projects that can be submitted. If you were to say, all right, now we're gonna submit these top five and uh, let's add two more, let's add one more. I think you should be cautious there uh, but there, there is not a limitation there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Garcia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Mr. Duran, I've got a question for you. Could you sell the Southside Library to the legislature, to our delegation and to the respective folks? Mayor, Councillor, I could. Okay, I, I, and I think, uh, as we, you kind of mentioned in your previous comment to Councillor Beta, there's nothing that would prohibit uh, our delegation or the legislature from funding medians should they want to, if we put it at number eight. If they feel it's a priority and it's at number eight, they'll fund it. I think we as a community need to put forth the message that this is a priority for our community. And, and I think ultimately, as I said, at the price tag that the medians is in front of us, that's not a priority. If the, pri if the price tag was a million dollars, I could swallow that pill a lot easier. But at the price tag of up to $70,000 per median, that's a, that's a very, very tough pill to swallow. And I think the public really needs to understand that that's what we're going to be asking the legislature for is up to $70,000 per median. Um, with that, no other comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Abeda, your hand's up again. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say thank you to Councilor Garcia for raising the Southside Library issue. Um, but I, out of respect for the work that the committees have done and the fact that quite frankly, three projects uh, from District 3 are in the top five already, I think I won't, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll support what's been offered by Councillor Rivera, I think, you know, uh, again, out, out of respect for the work that the committees have done and the fact that we, we do have three projects in District 3, um, uh, I'll, I'll stay with Councillor uh, Rivera's amendment, but thank you, Councillor Garcia, for raising the Southside Library issue. Thank you, Mayor. 
Thank you both. Uh, other comments for the uh, amendment as offered by Councilor Garcia? If there are no other uh, hands up, could the clerk call the roll on the motion? Yes, Councilor Romero Worth? No. Councilor B. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? No. Councilor Abetha? No. Councilor Cassett? No. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Lindell? No. Councilor Rivera? No. Mayor Weber? No. Motion failed. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, amendment is one I'm offering. I'll just read it into the record at this time. Uh, it's the last of the ones that were in the packets. It says, I propose the following amendment. On page four, line eight, insert the following new paragraph. Be it further resolved that the governing body supports and endorses any legislation that would provide an option for local governments to opt in to adopting an emissions inspection program under the Air Quality Control Act. Uh, and that is uh, in support of any such measure were it to be in front of the legislature. Is there a motion to add this amendment? Well, isn't so that what you just did? Yes, I'm, I guess I make my own motion. So I, I would say second. <laughs> I move we adopt that and Councilor Bearworth seconds. Sir, sorry, discuss? Councilor Lindell. <laughs> I'm sorry. My bad. Is there a discussion of this amendment? If not, could the clerk call the roll on that? Yes. Uh, Councilor B. Hill Coupler? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Abetha? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Councilor Rivera? Yes. Councilor Marworth? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. So we now have a main motion that's been amended three times. Uh, Councilor Garcia, your hand's up. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just got a quick, I guess, uh, question in regards to next steps in the process. Um, should we approve this? And uh, then uh, Mr. Duran gets his kind of uh, next steps and this is what, how the city wants to move forward. Uh, who, who by authority has, or who has the authority to change or uh, tell Mr. Duran, don't move forward with advocating for item number two, so to speak? Who, who, who is it? I mean, could I call up Mr. Duran and say, Mr. Duran, don't, don't advocate for uh, number two, whatever it is on our list right now, which is Swan Park. Take that off your list, stop lobbying for that. Who, or do I not have that authority? Who, who ultimately, or does that decision have to come from the governing body? I think the city attorney may weigh in on that. Uh, although uh, I'm not even sure that the hypothetical you offer is quite how Mr. Duran would describe the way a legislative session unfolds, but taking your question at face value, uh, city attorney, is there a, an authorized uh, direction for Mr. Duran as he reports in on the process of pursuing the city's interests at the legislature? Uh, Mayor Weber, Councilor Garcia, I think the question might have a couple sub questions and maybe that's where um, Mayor Weber is going. Um, so in terms of actually changing the resolution, the governing body would need to pass a new resolution. Um, but I think probably your question involves some nuance of lobbying. And I'm guessing maybe Mr. Duran would wanna to talk to that. So I, I would guess that if something is no longer desirable by any of our representatives um, and they tell Mr. Duran that, then he would not continue to push it, um, but it wouldn't actually change the priorities of the governing body. Okay, so I mean, to that second part, I guess, Aaron or Ms. Attorney McSherry, you said if if we reached out to him and said stop 
And the reason why I, I bring it up is because last session we stopped. Mayor, Mayor Weber Council, I don't, I don't think those are my words um, at all. Okay, so then can, can you clarify me? Because you said who, who would give the direction to Mr. Duran to, to not necessarily pull an item off, but stop lobbying for a particular item? So Mayor Weber Council, what I, what I said was in order to change the priorities in the resolution, the resolution would have to be, we would need a new resolution. Okay. I and got then that. I said, there's probably realities of lobbying that maybe Mr. Duran would want to speak to regarding whether or not something is a viable option for the city to advocate. Okay, so then I guess it's better uh, a question for Mr. Duran then. Mr. Duran, if, if I reached out to you to say stop lobbying for a particular item, I mean, do I have that authority? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor, um, I'm really not the one to speak to what authority do you all have or don't have? Uh, I can say that the resolution is the resolution. And whether we receive funding for a specific project or not, or, or maybe switched from one priority to another priority because we're getting feedback from the legislature or, or there's different pots of money available or not, uh, uh, regardless, the priorities that you put in front of me are the priorities. I never stop advocating for that. Now, does, uh, can one uh, versus another then, then, then move to favor with the legislators? Uh, uh, that's what I do. That's what you pay me to do is to sense that and then push in that direction. And, and that's, and I'm still uh, uh, measured by my performance uh, to you. And so uh, I am here to try to help the city of Santa Fe attain as much capital outlay monies as possible from the list that is put in front of me. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Mr. Durant, for that clarification. And, 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 and as I mentioned, the reason I asked is because the last legislative session, there was a priority of ours, which was the airport, that uh, the way it was communicated to us, the governing body, is that staff then directed you to stop the push for the airport funding. And that was unbeknownst to the governing body. That was all news to us. And I think that came to us after the legislative session. And, I, and I'd hate for us to be in a predicament like that again to where somebody gives you direction and it's not necessarily the will of the governing body. And, and so I guess that gets back to, I guess the core part of the question, how, how do we as a governing body ensure that we are working together on these priorities, because I think that's ultimately what we need to do is we need to work together to ensure that if one of these, you know, Mr. Rance, Mr. Durant says, well, um, you know, the airport again is not catching any traction and we should really push for this. Um, are we, uh, I guess, what mechanisms do we have to be one, be told that real time information and two, kind of give you Mr. Duran, that guidance of yes, go ahead and pull the reins back on the airport, but really push for, um, since we were just talking about it, medians. We need you to go full court press on medians. And so what's the process for us as a governing body? Or do we just give you free reign and you check in with whether it be staff or I'm just, I guess, trying to understand the process. And I don't know if that's a Mr. Duran, that's a staff, because again, I'm, I'm relating it to the real experience that we had last session, where I think at least myself and at least one other counselor, counselors were kind of caught off guard when uh, the airport was staff told Mr. Duran to not, not push for the airport or, or it wasn't a priority anymore. If, if I could, uh... Uh, Mayor, just offer uh, at least a clarification. 
and I think this is really important. Nobody ever told me last legislative session uh, that the airport was not a priority. Okay, that's that's good to know because that's not what was told to us. Is because I remember having a conversation on the matter. So I'm, I'm glad that you continue to do your job, Mr. Duran. Um, again, I, I, the reason why I'm asking is I don't want us to be put in a predicament where the governing body is not in sync with what you're doing at the roundhouse. And, I, and, and so with that, I do appreciate the reports that you provide to us that give us those updates. But I think that's where there was some, in particular, the airport updates that were given to us last year were, did catch some of us off guard. Um, with that, I don't, I guess, I don't have any other questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, are there other, is there other discussion at this time? Uh, if not, Madam Clerk, oh, Councilor Rivera, your hand is up. But you are muted, sir. Sorry. I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Ms. Wheeler, uh, Mr. Duran, and all the staff that works at Public Works, all the city staff that helps put numbers, figures together to uh, try to get us uh, a good ICIP list. Um, they do a lot of work. They're short-staffed as well. So I think Ms. Wheeler was trying to take a vacation and um, is still having to do her job. So. Um, I appreciate uh, all the work that they're doing and will do on behalf of the city moving forward. So thank you, as well as all the counselors who, uh, it's not easy to come up with, with a list of five, but everyone did a great job and uh, appreciate all that work. Thank you, counselor. I would, I would second that. Um, the questions that were raised were really constructive. The deeper dive into uh, Albuquerque's uh, median and expenditures was really productive. The sense of uh, options across the city and uh, assessing funding sources was really probably the most comprehensive look I think uh, we've ever done when it comes to uh, trying to get ahead of the curve of our uh, capital investment strategy, not just for the session, but on an ongoing basis as we look to unmet capital needs. And they're spread out around the city. There is a great sense of uh, distribution around different kinds of investments um, and very thoughtful reflection by all of the com standing committees. Madam Clerk. Ready for a roll call, Mayor. We <laughs> have no other hands up. All right, perfect. Um, so I have, give me one second, sorry about that. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Perfect. Councilor Beta. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Garcia. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Councilor Rivera. Yes. Councilor Merriworth. Yes. Councilor Vigil Coppler. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Duran and Director Wheeler uh, for the uh, contributions you made to clarifying things. Much appreciated. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you take us to the next item then, please? Uh, yes, Mayor, the next item is 11A. It's consideration of a resolution um, supporting offering at least a wage of $15 per hour for employees of the City of Santa Fe and directing the City Manager to offer hourly wage increases for all full-time non-probationary city employees paid less than $15 per hour. And um, I'm not sure if Attorney McSherry would want to offer clarification on this in advance, but I know uh, Director Mary McCoy and our finance director and Bernadette 
Salazar, excuse me, our human resources director are available for this item. There's also a subsection with the request of approval um, of a budget amendment resolution in the total amount of $216,449 for the that, salary increases. That said, I believe item G on our consent calendar supersedes this, but maybe that's why Councillor Romero Worth's hand is up. Yeah, move to table this item. Second. Second. Well, there's a motion to table this and a second from, um, from Councillor Cassett or Lindell, one or both. Uh, is there a, do you want to uh, talk us through it, Councillor Romero Worth, for the public's benefit? Because not everybody's tracking the fact that there was an item on the uh, consent calendar that superseded this. Uh, I'd be happy to have the city attorney uh, address this. We've already approved uh, the $15 minimum wage increase for all city employees to be uh, implemented in November, um, but the city attorney can explain. Mayor Weber, Councilor Mayor Weber, thank you. Um, I think we just kept this item on the agenda because at our last meeting, there was a motion that passed to postpone it to a date certain, which was to this meeting. So we did need to include it on the agenda. Um, in case anything went wrong with the other proposal. Um, the other proposal um, was intended to incorporate the concerns that were raised at the last governing body meeting. And now we've adopted it for all employees um, to allow that increase in salary um, and the budget adjustment to effectuate it as well. So we don't need this one anymore, but it was on the agenda in case we did need it. And because the motion had passed at the last meeting. Great. And Mayor, Mayor, if, if uh and I'm trying to pull my agenda back up. Uh, the item for the public, if if uh, they want to see it, was I on the consent calendar item? Help me, uh, G. ten. G as in G. G as okay. in G. <laughs> G as in goat. Go um, okay, just in case anybody wanted to look for uh, what we approved on consent. And in tabling this, we are simply putting it aside because we've already acted on a replacement item. Correct. Okay, is there another discussion of the motion to table? I guess it doesn't need discussion. Uh, could the clerk call the roll? Uh, yes, Councillor Abeka? Yes. Councillor Cassett? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Rivera? Yes. Councillor Merworth? Yes. Councilor V. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councilwoman B. Rael? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. Could you take us to the next item then, please, Madam Clerk? Uh, yes. The next item is item 11B. It's a request for approval of the assignment of Santa Fe Regional Airport Lease Agreement. It's item number uh, 18-0188 from Gate 13 LLC to Gate 13 Hangar Condominium Association. And I believe our uh, airport manager, Mark Baca, is available for this item. Okay, can I get a motion on this? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second. Councilor Vigil, Coppler seconded Councilor Lindell's motion. Uh, we have their uh, point point of order yeah. and maybe that's why the hands are going up over here yes uh there's no packet material on this one what are we approving mm -hmm. and i i did refresh my uh gotcha my prime gov a couple times so i don't know if i just don't have it or what's going on all right fair enough is Mr. Baca, yeah, is Mr. Baca with us, uh, Madam Clerk? I don't see him on the screen at the moment. He might be in the attendee room. Uh, Mayor, he is not in the attendee room, um, but I do see Director Regina Wheeler, um, and maybe she has some additional information for us. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of the governing body, I actually don't have additional information, and I would think um, if there isn't packet material, we should bring it back when there is. Yeah, apologies. That's why the hands were up. Uh, we have a motion we should probably withdraw, and a second we should withdraw, unless, unless Council Lindell has some light she can shed on this. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
City Attorney McSherry, do you have do you have information on this? Uh, Mayor Weber, Council Wendell, I did review some materials on this, so I'm surprised they're not included. Um, and I don't know if Director Wheeler remembers if there's any sort of time issue. I think it's a relatively technical assignment, but it is an actual assignment agreement. There are terms. Um, it's not just you know two lines assigning this to a new company. Um, so. I, I would need to make a couple of calls to figure out where this went or what happened to it, or if there is a need to pass it tonight. Yeah, I think Director I, Wheeler looks like she's already started on the calls. <laughs> so um, I can also make one, but maybe we should um, at least delay it to later in the meeting. Can we do we that? Should, yeah, I think we should definitely withdraw the motions that people very uh, constructively made. It was my fault. We should have had uh, the, the questions in order beforehand. So can the motion in the second be withdrawn, please? Uh, I'll, I'll, with, I'll withdraw my motion. Um, can we delay this until later in the meeting if we can uh, get Mr. Baca? Mayor Weber, Councilor, I think we just need a, a motion to delay it to a particular time or until maybe a, until Mr. Baca can be located, although I'm not sure we want this to like pop up in the middle of our land use cases. So probably a specific time would be good. Move to the beginning of the evening session, maybe. Uh, that would be, um, that seems like a good motion. I've withdrawn my motion. Um, I. Who was the second? I forgot. It was Hill Coppler. Thank you. Um, so I'll withdraw my second. Okay. So the floor is clear now from this uh, for this item. We have nothing in front of us. We can delay it. We can move it to another meeting. Or whatever is the uh, move the, to after petitions from the floor in the evening second. session. Okay. Motion to move it to after petitions from the floor in the evening session. Uh, and there is a second. Uh, is there any discussion about that? Let's call the roll on that and then uh, see where people are. Madam Clerk. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor Rivera. Yes. Councillor Romero Worth. Yes. Councillor B. Hill Coppler. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Abeta? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Okay, we'll move it to later. And then if Mr. Baca still is not available, we'll, um, we'll change it. Um, could you take us to the next item? Yes, Mayor. Um, the next item is a consideration of a resolution sponsored by Council Rivera, Council Abeta, and Council Romero Worth. It's a resolution directing the city manager to identify and apply for federal and state funding sources for water, wastewater, and other water related projects. I believe Alan Hook, our water resources coordinator, is available for this item if necessary. Okay, can we get a motion on this? Move to approve. Second. And I heard a second from Council Rivera, second from the motion, main motion from Councilwoman Villarreal. Um, Mr. Hook, do you want to uh, give us a presentation on this item, please? He's in the waiting room. He is in the waiting room. There He's he is. promoted, so I think he should be popping in soon. There, there he is. is. Great. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, uh, Councillors. So uh, primarily this resolution is uh, for the purpose of uh, public utilities to provide, you know, investigation applications for federal and state uh, monies, whether they're grants or loans. And then the secondary uh, purpose of this is to provide a resolution to the Water Trust Board. So we did um, submit for fiscal year 2022, $1.5 million request towards the Nichols Dam Repair Project. Uh, and I would also like to thank 
with gratitude our city manager for showing up today for our presentation before the Water Trust Board for our um, request of that funding. With that, I stand for any questions. Very good. Are there questions for Mr. Hook about this item? If there are no questions, uh, we have a motion, we have a second. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes, Councilor Lindell. Yes. Councilor Rivera. Yes. Councilor Merworth. Yes. Councilor V. Hill Coppler. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes, and I'd like to co sponsor. Councilor Abitha. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Garcia. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I note that it's 703. Um, we have a Midtown presentation and then a series of matters, city manager, city attorney, city clerk, governing body. And the evening session, we have said we would take up petitions from the floor as an opportunity for people to weigh in on uh, ARPA funding. Um, we also moved this airport item to right before that, uh, although I don't know if there's any progress on finding uh, uh, more information about that item. Councilwoman Viral and Councilor Abeda, your hands are up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to um, change the order of our agenda so that we can, for the first time, actually start petitions from the floor on time, since there's a few people waiting. Um, so I'd like to move that up into the agenda on the agenda so that we can start that now. So we would simply bring that forward. We'll still delay the airport item that we Correct. had said technically was gonna go before petitions from the floor, but it won't now. And uh, that is a, a motion. Is there a second to that motion? So we, we go directly to petitions from the floor. Second. So we have a motion to move petitions to, from the floor to right now. And then we would come back to the order of business, presumably as it is laid out. Uh, Councilor Abeda. Uh, thank you, Mayor. My concern with the uh, uh, petitions from the floor on the ARPA funding is it wasn't noted on the agenda that we were going to we were going to discuss this. And so unless this is going to, there's going to be a series of discussions and it was just an oversight so that it was left off the agenda. I don't know. I mean, we could, we could take petitions from the floor from people that, that want to uh, talk about it, but this I hope is not going to be the only option or, or time that the public is going to be able to comment on, on ARPA. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we do have a, a pretty good attendance in the uh, waiting room and, uh, I think Councilor v Councilman Varial's point is well taken. If we bring them forward, that will give us a sense of what, whether how many of them are in fact here to talk about ARPA, and then we can come back and have another uh, discussion about it at a later at another opportunity. To your point, Councilor Abeda. Thank you. Um, so there's a motion to move immediately to petitions from the floor, and there's a second. Is there any further discussion? Uh, if not, can the clerk call the roll on that motion, please? Uh, yes. Also, uh, to clarify, who was the second on this? I have Councilwoman Villarreal as the motion, and I have Councilor Cassett as the second. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, perfect. Um, Councilor Rivera? Yes. Councilor Romero Worth? Yes. Councilor Vijo Coppler? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Baker? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Great. So, um, Madam Clerk, we're going to move directly to the petitions from the floor. Uh, and if we could, if you could instruct people in the waiting room or in the attendee room, uh, what they need to do in order to get recognized and then you can bring them in one at a time and we'll give each person two minutes to speak 
as long as it's not on one of the public hearings that will be later. I think it's important to always remind folks that if you're here for one of the public hearings that is scheduled for later, uh, this is not the time to make that uh, comment. But if it's either about ARPA or anything really unrelated to the public hearings, please do raise your hand and the clerk will uh, admit you individually for a two minute opportunity to address the governing body. Over to you, Madam Clerk. Perfect, thank you, Mayor. So yes, if anybody is on the meeting and is interested in speaking on any items uh, from petitions, under petitions from the floor, they can do so. Uh, specifically, if you wanted to talk about ARPA funds, you can do that at this time, as Mayor mentioned. So I, the first person I have uh, to speak is Rob Elliott. And uh, Rob, if you can just state your name before you speak, and then I'll start your timer for two minutes. Oh, there we go. This is not Rob, it's his wife, Sharon Woods. <laughs> and um, I'm on Rob's computer. Um, Mayor Weber and city councilors, thank you so much for this opportunity. I am president emeritus of the Santa Fe Children's Museum. And we are very excited about this ARPA funding. Um, it has been, uh, it, it, we have wanted for a long time, and I think the mayor and um, Councillor Beta has, have worked with us to do much more outreach to the South Side. Um, the museum is 36 years old. We rent a space from the, uh, our space is rented from the state, um, but we want to do much more outreach to the, to the children of the South Side. In March, 2020, after several meetings with the mayor and the city leadership, the Children's Museum responded to an RFP for $120,000, which would have established a Southside Children's Museum across from the Southside Library and in partnership with the YMCA. At the same time, we submitted a $30,000 grant to the Children and Youth City Grant to fund the museum programs and to improve the well-being of our children and families. Sadly, due to COVID, neither RFP was funded. Now, now with this money, this ARPA money, we have the opportunity again to reach out to the South Side and the museum can have a presence there and programs and exhibits for these kids. And so I would urge you and, and hope that you will look at this again and help us get to these kids on the south side. We can't do it. We can't do it without your help. And uh, I'm very appreciative of your time and thank you. Thank you very much. Who's next, thank Madam? You. Um, up next is Kate Noble. Kate, I just asked you to unmute. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, Councilors. It's nice to see you and be in a meeting that somebody else is running, frankly. <laughs> um, I am here to speak about the um, recovery funds and encourage you to invest where it will make a difference, um, to really look at those catalytic items that can change the game for those of us that live and work in this community. Um, child care is one of those areas, and I work with uh, an organization called Growing Up New Mexico, as I think many of you know, um, and we have been meeting with an early childhood steering committee for Santa Fe that has been um, really in, in operation for about nine years, and it's a very impressive group of folks who've come together and really started to work on creative solutions and how we can weave together uh, some serious solutions for childcare in Santa Fe. And this is one of those things that could allow Santa Fe really to get ahead, to provide a foundation for future economic success. So I uh, want to appreciate Councillor Cassett and the work that she has been doing on this and um, encourage you to consider child care investments that really could get us ahead with the workforce because everybody is competing for the workforce. And this is 
sort of an extension to the larger um, education workforce, but really early childhood is one of the most underinvested areas. It's one of the highest returns for society. Um, and if we invest now, we've really seen through the early childhood steering committee that Santa Fe um, can get ahead in providing support for working families. The other area, of course, is housing. All these educators in this community need housing and affordable housing is really something that is very important for the city to invest in um, and particular to look at the regulations, zoning issues, and the other sort of impediments to uh, affordable housing in this community. So thank you for your consideration. Um, best of luck with making these decisions and thank you all for your service. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Yes. All right, Ms. Stephanie Beninato is up. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not speaking about um, ARPA funds, but I do think the two speakers before me and their suggestions merit um, serious consideration. Um, I did want to just go on the record to say that I have filed a notice of tort claim with the mayor um, this morning and also delivered it by hand to the mayor's office this afternoon. I also think that you as city councilors should know that um, Salvador Perez Recreation Center is already has roof leaks. And given that it was under project, it was a project under uh, by process, I guess, for two and a half years and um, cost two and a half million dollars, you would think that the roof should hold up for uh, uh, some time. And it, you know, this is the same thing with the Chavez Center. It's the same thing also with Fort Marcy. I do appreciate that Councillor Morel is looking into having a warranty on the roof um, this time on Fort Marcy, which I'm surprised hasn't happened before. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next uh, person is Shannon. Uh, Shannon Palermo? That's correct. Perfect. Good evening, Mayor, Councilors. Um, as the governing body determines how ARPA funds will be spent, I'd like to bring attention to the failing irrigation system in the rail yard park. Um, due to rail yard operating budget cuts, um, maintenance to this infrastructure has been delayed for at least four years. Um, the result of this deferred maintenance is the death of the park itself. One third of the park is not receiving water. Um, plant life in the park's rail gardens, Rose Ramada and the strip along site are dead or extremely stressed and at risk of dying. The ash trees along the rail trail, the ponderosa pines in the open field and every single tree and shrub that is watered from a bubbler is not receiving water. We're currently working with volunteers to remove eight tra trees that completely died this year. Um, these were pines, gamble oak, and crab apple trees that were planted over 13 years ago. In the case of the rail yard parks irrigation system, the longer that this issue is kicked down the road, the more of the park will die. <clears throat> um, Conservancy volunteers have hauled like hundreds of feet of hose to hand water anything we can reach, but this is an impossible task and it's totally unsustainable. Um, an assessment of the park's irrig irrigation system was conducted in June, 2021, and it determined that the needed repairs are likely massive. This is the result of long time deferred maintenance and also the result of a system that was overbuilt in the first place. A simplified system that is easy to maintain is urgently needed. Um, the next steps, would be for the city to fund a redesign and then bid out the work. I've been enthusiastically waiting for these next steps, but was told last week that there is no money and that this process has been halted. Um, I'm here asking for ARPA money to be directed towards these critical infrastructure repairs. Um, the irrigation system is intended to use very little water 
um, sourced primarily from the rail yards catchment system and to support native and drought tolerant landscapes. Um, most of the zones within the park are intended to only offer occasional supplemental water, um, but these compounding problems have resulted in misuse of water in the park, unnecessarily watering some parts of the park while other parts of the park go without water altogether. And this despite the community's vision of an environmentally sustainable rail yard park where water conservation and water catchment is exemplified in the heart of downtown. Thank you for your time, and I hope you will consider funding the irrigation systems redesign and needed repairs through ARPA funds or through other funding sources. In the time of COVID, public trails and green spaces are a valuable city asset. Thank you for your work and the opportunity to bring up this need. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, the next person is uh, Rebecca Baron reese Hi, good evening. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Councilors. We appreciate your service tonight and always. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of uh, ARPA investments in childcare. Um, investing in a strong early childhood foundation, I think has been a key strategy for, for many cities. I think Santa Fe is poised to seize this opportunity as well, building off of um, really strategic work that's happening at the state level, that Santa Fe as a, as a city can actually do quite a bit to position ourselves um, to take advantage of that great work. Uh, research has also, sh has also shown just a huge ROI. Um, so up to 13% um, for childcare investments, which is a powerful vote for our youngest Santa Feans. This would also allow us to make huge strides for working families and businesses and get us primed for the economic success that we need as we work to recover from the, the COVID pandemic. Um, I work at an organization called Growing Up New Mexico in partnership with uh, the city, the county, and many early childhood and other organizations like Krista St. Vincent, um, PMS Head Start, and others that have joined together in the Early Childhood Steering Committee for Santa Fe to really prioritize and lift up um, these important investments that we think the city can make to advance both our, um, our youngest community members, um, but also the city as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, that is everybody in the waiting room that has their hand up. So if there's anyone else that would like to speak under petitions from the floor tonight, if you could please raise your hand. Um, if you would like to talk about ARPA funding, you can do so at this time as well. If there are no other hands, and I take Councillor Abeda's point that this doesn't have to be the last time we let folks talk about ARPA funding. This was just the first opportunity we could use the petitions from the floor to do that. Uh, we can come back and get more input for, for sure. Mayor? Uh, Councillor Lindell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Justin Green is trying to get into the waiting room as, and has been unsuccessful with the link. Have we been having problems with that uh, link, Ms. Ms. Helsick? I think uh, I did have another individual mention it. We refreshed the link and I did send it specifically um, to Mr. Green. Okay. So I hope he, um, he has received it. Okay. I don't see him in the uh, attendee room, however, uh, so it may not be working. Is there a phone in option? Uh, yes, Mayor, on the agenda, there's instructions for the phone in option as well. So if anybody's trying to get he in. Said, yeah, he said he got the link. He's trying again. Thank you. Okay, we'll give it another uh, another minute, hoping he can join us. Mayor? Yes, what, Councilor. What's our, uh, what's our timeline on this? Not, not waiting for Justin, but 
Okay. What's our timeline on the uh, committing the funding? Uh, is uh, Director McCoy on the uh, on point the of order? Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, I understand. Go Sorry, ahead. Sorry, I don't think we can take this up right here, right now. Yeah, I, I think we have to. Okay. I mean, it. even though it would be nice not to just stand yeah. in place, I think unfortunately we have to stand in place. Yeah, we'll wait and see if Mr. Green can join us. There, he looks Sorry. like there. I see him in the uh, attendee room. Uh, Madam, uh, Mayor, he is in the attendee room, and I've asked him to unmute. Okay, let's go to him then. Uh, Justin, you've been asked to unmute if you want to speak. There you go. Not yet unmuted, however. Yeah, Mayor, I keep sending him a push kind of notification. There we go. I think he accepted it to speak. Mr. Green, you have the floor for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, City Council. I hope you can hear me now. Absolutely. Um, wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, we are in the process. We are the owners of Dashing Delivery. Santa Fe's local centric restaurant delivery service that is one of the largest marketers of locally uh, run restaurants. Uh, we are in the process of developing a shared multi restaurant facility or multi kitchen facility that would be a uh, essentially a, an entrepreneurial incubator for the restaurant industry. We are uh, looking to get, um, you know, potentially some city support for this and would like to be part of the uh, discussion for three years of ARPA money if there is uh, some capacity for that. We have a uh, accelerator program signed on to help uh, as the programmatic aspect to this, but we are the infrastructure and the marketing side of this program. We hope that we can uh, get some pledge of support from the city. I can stand for some questions about this. And if anybody wants to follow up, uh, some of the city council and some of the folks over at economic development know how to reach me and can answer many, many questions about this. But we would like to help the entrepreneurial community of the restaurant industry, both for the fact that we need new restaurants always, but also that we have an issue with succession planning. We work with a lot of restaurants that don't have a way to retire. And so there are some restaurants out there that need to have some support system with training the next generation to step up and to buy into their restaurant. Uh, thank you very much. I can stand for questions, but I don't think this, there's a question period right now. Uh, right. Good luck uh, putting everything together. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So uh, Madam Clerk, is there, are there others in the attendee room for um, this specific opportunity for petitions from the floor? Uh, Mayor, at this time, no. There are no other hands that are up uh, specific to this item. Okay, then let's go back to our regular order of business and uh, take things up where we left them. If you could take us to the item next. Uh, yes, the next item um, oh, on the agenda, sorry. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is 12A. It's our Midtown overview. It's the Midtown Planning and Development by a weekly report given by the Office of Community Development. Uh, Rich Brown, the Director of Community Economic Development is available for this item as well as Daniel uh, Hernandez. Mr. Brown, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening to the members of the council. <clears throat> thank you for the time this evening. Uh, we have a presentation that uh, we'd like to express today and I sent a copy to you earlier this morning. I want to start off the presentation, though, by uh, actually thanking the community organizers and the staff that put on the block party uh, last Saturday. It was uh, highly successful, and, uh, <clears throat> and lots of people showed up, and lots of information was shared. Uh, we were compiling a lot of that now, but I just wanted to thank all the folks who organized uh, the event with the Art Institute was the main host with uh, with DPAC, but uh, all of the folks who uh, participated as volunteers and organizers, they did a great job and I wanna put that in the record. So I wanted to start out from that standpoint and uh, go from there. So I'm gonna share my screen and have Daniel uh, work, walk through the, the progress report we have. I have a couple slides myself, but 
I'll have him start. Good evening, councilors and mayor. It's great to be here this evening and uh, thank you for allowing us to give a general progress re report about what's happening with Midtown um, this evening. So again, thank you very much. Next slide, Rich. Sure. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm gonna, the, you will probably not see this slide after a couple of more times, but one of the reasons I just wanna make sure is there may be new people who are watching an update, a progress report on Midtown. And I wanna make sure that, you know, that they all know that it's really clear that we are, we are continuing an effort that had started some time ago. And that was even based off the Midtown planning guidelines. Um, but there's, uh, this was a, uh, a memo that came out of the Office of Economic Development in March of this year. And staff and the, the planning and consulting team has been working on these nine action items since then. So again, I'll begin moving away from this slide in, in upcoming pre presentations, but for the members of the public that may not have been aware about what we're working on, this still remains at the top of the agenda. Next slide. Um, this is also a slide that you, you've seen before. Also to make clear to the public that these are ongoing goals that came out of the 2018 planning guidelines. Uh, and there were goals set around land uses. There were goals set from public policy perspective about making sure that we invest in the property in the right way that would reduce our economic uh, burden um, that we experience every year. Um, and then from the community development perspective, um, making sure that there was a meaningful public engagement process and that the development represented that from equity to sustainability to jobs, um, but also the opportunity to have civic public open space and facilities at the site. So these objectives remain at the forefront of all the discussions and all the work that we continue to do. Next slide. Um, again, a reminder to the folks who may not have seen this presentation, we are in <coughs> the planning phase right now. Excuse me. Um, we finished the concept phase in 2018, which was about creating a vision. I was eating a Serrano chili a little while ago. <laughs> um, um, and now we're in the planning phase. So uh, a lot of work has been done in 2021 and will continue through 2022. Um, but uh, again, we're in as the as we near the end of that planning phase, um, things will be uh, set up so that the regulatory land use for vertical development will happen at the site. Um, and we're calling all of that the planning phase itself. The next slide, and you'll, I think it's the next slide, you'll see this, the general schedule. Um, yeah, so again, we are now in the fall of 2021, this orange bar, um, and there are two plans being created right now. Um, one is the community development plan. The other one is the development or land and land use plan. Um, these efforts are running parallel right now. They will continue to run parallel. The reason that the orange arrow uh, extends into the summer um, and probably into the fall of 2022, um, at least August, September, is we will begin to go through that public hearing process, which is regulated by the through the planning office, the land use office, before the planning commission. And then the final decisions about land use and the master plan, the development plan will come back to the governing body. That's why it's extended. And it's also running in parallel paths so that the community development input also has elements of land use within that, such as um, site regeneration and green building and uh, the types of development that happens there, whether it generates job, that it generates jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So those two will run parallel for a while and inform each other. Um, but again, we continue through the regulatory process of public hearings for approvals, entitlements um, for the development of the land. Next, next slide. And so one of the questions that was asked during our previous partner support meetings at the governing body uh, by Council Villarreal Copper was that uh, we wanted to know what the investment was on the internal side, on the external side. So I volunteered to put together an estimate uh, on these two slides here uh, to show based upon the department roll up uh, what we have invested so far, uh, we think uh, internal time because we don't necessarily track our time. Uh, from um, the date of our disengagement from the Midtown RFEI developer to, to date. So this is the number that uh, we have uh, budgeted so far. This is all budgeted numbers. It's not new numbers. It's not extra budget. Uh, this is all part of staff time and staff roles. But this is a, a time that I was able to calculate um, based upon input from all of the um, different folks on our team. 
Uh, the second slide really is about our external partners and contractors. Uh, it's updated constantly, so you will see a different one uh, the next time we go through this progress report uh, from what we have encumbered uh, through procurement, what has been spent so far, and then what's remaining in the balance. And so this is a part of the work that's that's happening from FY 2021 to the present, because most of these folks have been contracted previously. Daniel, you want to take the next? Thanks, Rich. Um, as we, so what is going to happen between now and as we head into the end of 2021, we are putting the elements together for the development plan and the community, the land development plan and the community development plan. This slide is there to describe the differences and the similarities in some ways between the two plans, meaning the development plan lays out the land uses, the infrastructure, particularly the primary trunk lines that will go into the site. And it enables, legally enables, future development and investment at the site. The community development plan is more policy oriented. Again, it's about job, job creation and access to those jobs. It's about levels of affordability, how many units of housing affordable to whom, a lot of policy issues so that the community understands as development happened, how their community goals are met, the community benefits, if you will. Um, so these are the two plans. They will both come back to the governing body ultimately so that they speak to each other so that people know as development happens, the, their community goals are being um, um, achieved. Next slide. So um, this week, uh, as everybody knows, or many people know, we are last weekend and Saturday, we had the Midtown Block Party, which is an amazing success. It was a very exciting event, fun. The spirit was right to actually talk to people in a welcoming, non-threatening environment. Uh, and I think, you know, just as many over close to 40 years that I've been working in re re redevelopment of large urban sites like this, I think it was the first time I've ever seen so many people come out in such a great mood. And it was all organized by community organizations um, supported by the city. It's a, it's a collaborative effort that I think is precedent setting. Um, and I think that other cities um, will take note of the accomplishments and the amazing amount of feeling and goodwill and participation people had that day. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so the count is right now that there were close, approximately a thousand people. Um, the event was planned and um, all the community organizations said, if we get 500 people, that's success. Well, they doubled that amount. Um, so they're very excited about the numbers that ultimately came in. There are ongoing engagement um, uh, uh, efforts that it will continue by the Midtown engagement partners, the local community organizations. And I have a couple of slides that summarize what some of the work that that will be. Next slide, Rich. Mm -hmm. Oh, before I go into that though, uh, we did document, we, you know, we not only talked to a lot of people during the day, but we had uh, uh, surveys that people were filling out. Um, we, the city table had surveys mostly focused on land development, future uses of existing buildings, what people thought about whether government services would come to Midtown and the parameters that like, yes, if sorts of questions from them about, about it, government services, municipal government services there. Um, but on the community development, it was about the policy issues. What is important about, uh, and what would bring you to Midtown? Community services, civic spaces for, that could be programmed for public um, gatherings, et cetera. Um, so we'll compile all of that survey information. We'll be working with our public engagement consultant, uh, the, the, the Design and Planning Assistance Center. So we plan on coming back to November to give you some information about the survey results on land development. We'll come back in December, what we learned about community development goals. And then in January, we'll actually have a synthesis about these two um, surveys and the information that we got so that we can then begin to describe how they are informing those land development plans and the community development um, plan as well. Next slide. Um, again, just a photo of the day. We were so lucky to have such beautiful weather, people leading outside and food trucks. And it was just, it was fantastic. Uh, the next slide. Um, so uh, as I was saying earlier, um, there were people talking about this notion that I've heard actually the mayor talk about the the notion that it's not just bringing people to the same table, um, but it was about, and, and or not creating a new table, but it was about making the table bigger. So it was new voices um, that we heard, which was probably the most important thing. Yes, we got a lot of confirmation about ideas, strategies, approaches, things people wanna see, but what was different and really important 
is the event brought people together that may not and probably did not participate in previous efforts. Families with children, low-income households, people of color who are frequently marginalized from public policy making and planning efforts like this, and their voices were there. And the exciting part is it was a lot of consistency, but what we've heard all the way along, but they were saying it in their own words, and that was probably the most exciting part about it. The other thing, as I was saying earlier, is this was precedent setting, government realizing that the best way to get public engagement is to go to the communities that actually work with constituencies all day long, and that's their mission, and supporting their efforts to do that. The other piece was creating a partnership among those local community organizations to do that work with shared commitments about going out and making it transparent, equitable, accessible, welcoming, safe, um, and and that was their that, that that was their objective, and I think it was well achieved on Saturday. Next slide. Um, I, I was just inspired and motivated by so much that was happening that day, including this beautiful mural that was going on against the barracks um, uh, beside the the SFAI at Santa Fe Art Institute area. Next slide. And here's some of the upcoming events. So you see the dates on the right side, the organization that are part of the Midtown Engagement Partners, um, and we'll make this available on the Midtown website. Um, but some of the stuff that will continue, it's everything from just doing some asset map, uh, mapping that La Familia Medical Center will be doing. There will be door-to-door uh, -door, uh, polls that will be taking place. Um, so I, I, rather than just reading them um, out loud, uh, just you can take a quick scan and again, if there's a desire by the city councilors uh, for these two pages, the next page, uh, uh, Rich, um, I can just send those two pages to you. They were made available by, uh, to me by the, our public engagement consultant at UNM. <laughs> next slide. Again, just amazing stuff that happened that day that I think it was, uh, anyway, it was just an exciting day. Uh, with great music as well and dancing. Uh, next slide. Um, these were uh, the, at the city table. We received a ton of additional comments. Um, we will be writing all of these comments and putting them, just listing them so that they're verbatim the comments and then we'll begin to decipher them on how uh, you know we use them in the development plan particularly. Um, so we'll be compiling all that. And when we come back in November, <laughs> um, uh, we'll have these compiled for you. Next slide. Again, these were stuff that you saw. And the reason I reiterated this slide was to say, again, it wasn't necessarily new. It was consistent. Yes, we heard some really cool new ideas, but there was consistency on key elements of what people wanted to see there. The exciting part was they were coming from people that we hadn't heard from before. Um, so again, uh, we'll continue to, to put these, um, all of these list of uh, thoughts that people had and we'll make them available uh, to the public. Next slide. Um, so moving forward, what are we doing right now? Um, again, like I was saying earlier, we're beginning to, to put all of this, synthesizing this information so that over the next couple of months, we'll start drafting outlines, actually the land development plan. We started, uh, we had a conference call early this week about the outline for that. Um, so then we'll be start building it and filling it in. We'll be doing the same with the community development plan. Um, so those are all in motions right now. They will be we, what we would consider them the Midtown Redevelopment Plans. Next slide. Um, we were also, uh, we're also gonna be issuing the request for proposals, um, both for the Visual Arts Center as a community arts and design hub, as well as the Garson Studio Lot Development and Expansion and Job Creation. And we'll be writing those over the course of November as well and getting them out. Next slide. Um, we are, these are studies um, that the city will be taking. Regina was on earlier talking about doing the study for the Fogelson Library. What does it mean to be the 21st Century Library Education and Innovation Hub? So uh, Maria Tucker, the, uh, the uh, library director will also be holding sessions about what does it mean and who are potential community partners to activate that space into a 21st century library. The other one that we'll be looking at is a study of the government and community services building. We asked lots of questions from the public um, on Saturday about what they would like to see if we did decide to move the government services um, to Midtown. 
there's lots of discussion about whether it should be an existing buildings, a new building, or a combination of a new building and existing buildings. Um, but clearly everyone wanted to see that it activated Midtown. It didn't feel like a box where it closes at five, um, but that it actually was open um, to other services besides government services and what potential community services could be inside of these buildings as well. Next slide. Um, and then finally, we, um, we, were, we are now building the models for the land economics, meaning if this, what is the city's rate of return on investment? Um, if we are spending this time and, 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 and dollars that Rich presented earlier, um, as well as building infrastructure, how much is too much investment? And what is, the, what is enough to be able to recoup our investment through land pricing uh, over a period of time? So that model is being developed right now, and we'll give more of that information probably beginning in 2022 as we begin unfolding the development plan. The other thing that we're looking at is, uh, is creating a midtown redevelopment area, the pros and cons of it. So again, it's a study um, about create and looking at the district, not just the site, but area surrounding the midtown site um, uh, as a mechanism for uh, incentivizing development, financing tool, um, also for particularly for infrastructure and community oriented projects. Um, like uh, that we envision. Um, also, we will be continuing. We met with the, uh, the state about a potential land swap. There's a lot of support for that. And we'll begin going through the committee process in 2022 so that we um, are able to uh, uh, negotiate uh, the land swap between the city and the state. Next mm -hmm. slide. And that's the update, the progress report for this month. And again, these are the websites. Um, I'm sure that on the Culture Connects, they'll be doing a lot of new stuff based on Friday. Um, and we're also planning on updating the Midtown District Santa Fe website with some additional information as well. So mm -hmm. um, please visit. Thanks, Rich. Sure, thank you. Uh, and so Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we stand for questions. Very good, point. Councilwoman VRL, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and just wanted to give a shout out again to all the partners that were involved with the Black Party. Um, the community partners that organized this did a great job, and I think the reason why it's successful is because it was community powered and, and led. And I think because they built trust with community members and have their own respective networks, it was able to be expanded to folks that don't typically go to um, city meetings. Um, so I think that was just a really important piece to the puzzle. And so wanted to thank staff for being there. It was, I came at the latter part of the day um, and there was still a lot of activity and staff had been there at like 745 setting up. And so I just, I, th I really appreciate that um, staff and consultants were there to be able to like see the end of the, you know, be there from the beginning and all the way to the end to be able to tear down. So thank you. Um, I actually think there were more people. I, I've heard, talked to partners and they thought it was closer to 2000. So um, I think that when our numbers, when we calculate it, we'll show that there was actually a lot more people that came through and great representation from our community. Um, I also, I just, I wanted to just get an understanding. So there were quite a few, um, surveys, hard copy surveys that were filled out. So who synthesizes that information then? And do the partner organizations get copies of those survey results? Uh, the, uh, the Design and Planning Assistance Center has the copies right now and she's <laughs> planning on getting some interns from the school um, to help out uh, kind of categorize and decipher them. And then the, the engagement partners will you know, review them, analyze them and figure out how to sort of communicate them back to the public. And there's, they're going to, well, it's because more activities happening in November. They're planning on doing that in December. Excellent. Okay. Um, let's see. If I have any other questions? I think overall it was, there was just a lot of energy and um, I, I'm look forward to hearing what people had to say about that. How, um, I guess I'm always trying to figure out, like once we get input, we've gotten various input, but this, obviously was a very different group of um, folks giving us input. How do we then incorporate it into all the steps that you just described that we need to do? I'm always trying to figure out like, are they parallel? Do they cross over? Um, I'm just not always quite clear about that piece. 
Yes. Um, so they are on, they will run on parallel tracks. Um, and again, we'll, we'll, we early on, we set up a general outline of what the community development plan will include. Um, and we'll make that presentation in December. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll give examples of like policy issues that we heard from the community and how they get inserted in certain chapters within that, that, that outline. Um, so again, in, in, in December, we'll, we'll, we'll show you how these different comments come in from a policy perspective. The land development perspective is more about a land use. Can we build X there? And, and so <clears throat> that kind of stuff will be part of the land development plan, which buildings stay, where, the size of parcels. So when people talk about walkability and connectivity, that's all sort of physical stuff, not necessarily policy. So the development plan will sh show people's ideas around that. So anyway, so that's why they're running on parallel tracks and, and, and they'll begin to unfold in 2022. But these next two months, we'll show you kind of the outlines of what those things will look like and how, we, how they are fed, if you will, through public comment. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Um, overall, I just want to thank everybody involved. It was a lot of moving parts and you could see who was involved when you were actually tearing down. There was all these different people that came through that you're like, oh yeah, that person was involved, that company was involved. So I appreciate it. And I also appreciate being able to get in a couple of cumbias before the, the event <laughs> finished. So well, thank you. Thank you, Rich. If I can just, I, I know there's not a question on the table, but I, I want to say that uh, Councillor Villarreal was there to the very end, carrying tables and chairs with all of us <laughs> I mean, they were exhausted and it was an amazing help. So thank you so much, Councillor, for helping with that. And you did mention the community um, organizations and I forgot in my presentation to name them, the Santa Fe Art Institute, Little Globe, um, Chainbreaker Collective, Youth Works and Earth Care were our main partners that day. And I am touched by how amazing they just pulled it together and really, really represented their constituencies and brought them out. It was really amazing. It was inspiring beyond belief. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilor Lindell, your hand is up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if we could go to the um, page two, the nine step action plans. Mm -hmm. Why is that numbered the way it's numbered? <laughs> it was um, yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Lindell, I think it's just the way that Daniel had added the uh, inputs, but it's actually one to nine. It, it has no uh, real significance beyond. It's really one to nine, but I think PowerPoint didn't uh, uh, take the spaces in between the numbers. Okay. Uh, what reads as number three, but it's probably really number eight. It says, um, access and establish a public funding mechanism. What does that mean? Um, uh, it, it's, it's part of that slide that I showed you about the MRA, the Metropolitan Redevelopment Area. <clears throat> but also within that, it's looking at the potential for tax increment district financing and other public tools that are available to cities, to public entities for large scale development like this. Okay, let's move down to page seven. Post developer investment external. What's the term of these contracts? Um, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Lindell, uh, they have different uh, they have different expiration dates. Um, so I've, I'm, I, I don't have them in front of me, but I can take the ones that I do know uh, that uh, Holland and Hart's uh, contract has expired. Uh, so they didn't spend all the money that was allotted. Uh, uh, Daniel uh, Hernandez's proyecto and uh, his contract, I think, expires in 2023. Uh, Strategic Economics, uh, they have a contract that uh, it's a four-year contract, but there we have to amend it to, to finish in 2023. Uh, so, UMD, so, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, what what um, what is strategic economics? What do they do for us for uh, six hundred and fifty thousand? Then you want to take it, or you want me to go? It's the, yeah, the we issued people. we issued an RFP, uh, a joint RFP for land economics and land planning. 
Um, and so Strategic Economics is the lead and the sub-consultant is Opticos. And have we had a report back from them yet? Yeah, you had a report, God, I don't remember what month that was, maybe two yeah. months ago, Opticos presented, Dina presented yeah. in right. February, March, something around there. Yeah. And then they will be coming back with me next month in November. Um, uh, and again, as a preliminary synthesis and outline of the development plan that they will assemble with the land use, uh, with, with the land use office, and the office of economic development, um, that will be the basis for the uh, zoning and master plan application. And Councilor, so additionally, should... they did um, they did also some of the uh, September and early October uh, on-site uh, planning sessions that we had at the HCC and the library with the model and all the different uh, uh, posters of, uh, of, um, of land planning uh, designs that were just framework designs. So in September, we said we were having um, October engagements. Um, mm -hmm. Did those all occur and do we have any more of those that will occur? Yes, so the, the engagements happen in July, September, October, and then the slides, I don't know the numbers of the slides, but there were two pages of upcoming events that are happening throughout the November as well. Not events as much as just projects that the, uh, the, uh, the community partners are doing. Okay, I, I would suggest that I don't know who's responsible for it or how it happens, but we need to check and make sure that the website is correct with what we're actually doing because it's, it's actually not. So that would be really helpful if the website was correct and showed people really um, what the opportunities are. And I'm, I'm still not sure why do we have um, multiple websites with this that have, we have, why isn't it in one place? So the city sponsored website is the Midtown District website uh, and the Culture Connects is managed by the community partners. Mm -hmm. And they wanted, a, 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 they wanted to be a little bit more facile than the city uh, website to be able to kind of update and upload stuff that they're working on. Um, so uh, that's why there's two websites. And, and I know that it can be cumbersome for pub some people in the public, but what, we're, what we it, are going to do, or if it's not done already, and I'll check in with the website people based on your comment, um, is to make sure that uh, if, we're, if you're on our Midtown District Santa Fe website, that there's a link to the Culture Connects website and vice versa. <clears throat> so. Yeah, I just think that it's confusing when people are trying to find information and there's two websites and uh, that you need to search two different places. I, I really think they should be mirroring each other. But um, the other thing, I, I, the survey that was given out um, Saturday, um, who designed that survey? Uh, the, the Midtown Engagement Partners. The community All organizations. Pardon? The, the, yes, those community organizations that are the Midtown Engagement Partners. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Vigil Coppler, you have the floor. Thank you. I, I too wanted to thank staff for, and the, the um, nonprofit organizations that were there at the Midtown party. I thought it was uh, very well put together. And I think that the, the people who uh, were manning the booths were, were knowledgeable, they were friendly. And, and I, I just, I did enjoy it. And I really liked um, just the, the feeling of community. So um, I didn't get to see uh, my colleague do her cumbia though. So I'm very, <laughs> That would have made my day. <laughs> um, but anyway, thanks to all uh, who did that. Uh, I think it was it was well done. Uh, I would also uh, like to say that the Economic Development uh, Advisory Committee uh, got the presentation that we had tonight. Mm -hmm. And I think I've seen a little bit more excitement on their part about uh, feeling like we're moving forward. I think, Mr. Brown, you might have sensed that as well. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they, they finally understand, you know, not finally, but they came to the realization mm -hmm. that, you know, they're seeing uh, the pieces fall together. And so that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the, the things that they don't want to lose sight of, though, is that we need to be sure to incorporate revenue, uh, some kind of revenue, keep an eye on that, mm -hmm. because, you know, we still have a big bill to pay. And we need some money coming in to pay it. So, um, you know, that that's part of the planning process. So, uh, you know, we, we did briefly talk about that. So I, again, thank you. Thanks to everyone for putting this together. And um, I guess uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Councilor Garcia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'll echo the comments of my colleagues, you know, Big shout out to the city staff and all the hosts that made the block party a success. But I think we'd be remiss if we didn't put, give a huge shout out to everybody that attended, all the community members. I think that, it, you know, coming out of COVID and having an opportunity such as this block party to not only provide input in their space, but be able to interact with each other to provide that input and listen to what other folks had to offer, I think was invaluable. Um, you know, I think, uh, Daniel, the only kind of concern I had is I didn't find the cotton candy while I was there. <laughs> I know you asked for it. <laughs> I, I uh, uh, may or may not have uh, contributed to the community spray paint wall that was there, the last panel. I mean, the artists there were fantastic. Um, and the music was great. The food was great. Um, and I and I must admit it, it was a, a raging success. We we took uh, we took the little one there, and and he was there, you know, probably just like Councilwoman Villarreal doing his little jig and his stroller. But uh, <laughs> it was a, it was a blast. Th thank you all for doing uh, such a great job on this. I uh, just my hats off to everybody. Uh, with that, no other comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, thank Council. you, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Villarreal. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One thing I forgot to ask, and, and Councillor Lindell kind of raised it, that internal contractor list was helpful, and it would be helpful to put the time period that those contracts, um, when they expire, or what, what that, that amount encumbered, what it time period okay. that holds. I mean, I know, I know not all of those grants, like the smaller grants to the community members, yeah. Um, that was encumbered this year, but I just, I think that'd be helpful to know okay. that amount and the okay. time. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments? I, I, I'd add my accolades and support. Thank yous to everybody. Also, uh, thanks to police and fire who were there mm -hmm. to make sure everything was safe and sound and to La Familia that was there uh, taking care of healthcare issues and uh, vaccinations and tests and recognizing that it was not only a community event, it was a COVID safe event. And people were very mindful of wearing masks and staying safe, even while we were having this community-wide celebration that was just a tremendous, tremendous uh, outburst of energy, vision, sense of coming together in one place uh, to create a, in one in one place, the, the future of that space, uh, it was on display. So thank you, uh, Daniel and Rich, and please do pass along the governing bodies. Total thank you to all of the groups that made it happen, as well as city staff who were there from early on to set up to late at night to tear it down. It was, it was well worth it, and we should think about phase two block party, block party yes. 2.0. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, it is eight o'clock. We are cruising toward our evening agenda. Let's see if we can get through the next items uh, and then maybe take a break. But we do have uh, uh, matters from the city manager, city attorney, city clerk, communications from the governing body. You want to take us through those steps, Madam Clerk? Uh, sure, the next item is item 13. It's manager uh, matters from the city manager. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the governing body. I just wanted to remind folks, there were a number of notices that went out, um, but there is a prescribed burn up uh, in the mountains today. Uh, the smoke will likely linger 
Um, we have uh, coordinated with all of our uh, usual uh, tracking folks, but if you if you are getting questions or concerns, it is a prescribed burn, um, and all of that information is posted on uh, the National Forest Facebook and Twitter pages. We do ask that folks do not uh, call to report the fire as it is uh, a prescribed burn, but every time you see it, 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 it uh, causes a little uh, agita, rightly so. So just wanted to state that for the record and uh, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam City Manager. Um, City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor, members of the governing body. I don't have any updates tonight, thank you. Thank you. In that case, we go to matters from the city clerk. Um, thank you, Mayor and City Councilors. I just have a few quick updates, um, kind of dates to remember and save the date. Uh, we do have the election coming up on November 2nd. So uh, remind everybody to please get out and vote for that. And thank you to everyone that's been coming in to report um, their finances. It's been really great and everyone's been awesome. I also just wanted to note that we will have a celebration on the Plaza for Veterans Day. Um, there will be the Navy band is going to be in town and will be performing at 2 p.m. So invites will be um, going out shortly, but wanted to do a save the date. We're also working with um, local organizations to have a car show in conjunction with the event. So uh, we're really excited about that. And then uh, just wanted to put it on everyone's calendars that we will be doing the puzzle lighting on uh, November 26th. So again, save the date, of course, more information to come. And I did want to give a few quick kudos. I apologize. Last meeting, um, I did yield my time because we were very close to uh, the, the time to give. But I wanted to give a huge shout out to the Southside Library. They received 99% uh, positive feedback from our happy or not um, uh, feedback towers that we've been uh, that have been out at a variety of facilities across the city. So uh, really awesome to the Southside Library. The main library and GCC also had a 96% uh, positive feedback at their locations. So I also wanted to note that. And then um, just to give a quick update on the shopping cart pilot program, uh, we have collected over 750 carts to this point, and uh, we've collected some really amazing data. So I believe there's going to be some forthcoming steps on that. But uh, just a few quick updates and save the dates. Uh, you'll be receiving additional information from us. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Communications from the governing body. Uh, Councilwoman Villarreal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I already sent my kudos on to the partners and staff for the Midtown Block Party, so I have nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Vigil Coppler, you have the floor. Thank you. I would like to co-sponsor uh, Councillor Lindell's resolution supporting efforts by state and local educators to alleviate staffing crisis. And um, I would also like to read into the record legislation, uh, which is a resolution allowing the city of Santa Fe's participation in a transportation project fund program to reconstruct Henry Lynch Road. And that is all. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Cassett. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, didn't have a chance to speak at Midtown, but I did also want to send my thank you to um, the staff and to our community partners who were there. It was a wonderful time. Uh, I was there with my son. It was, it was really uh, quite an achievement. So thank you everybody for that. Um, and then just uh, echoing what the city clerk said, we have an election on Tuesday. Make sure to make your voice heard. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lindell, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a couple of items. One is a resolution supporting efforts by state and local educators to alleviate the staffing crisis in public education throughout the state. Uh, the next item is a resolution designating certain property for public use requirements for Kenyatta Rincon multi-use trail project. And a third item, a resolution allowing the city of Santa Fe's participation in a transportation project fund program to reconstruct Bishop's Lodge Road. Um, additionally, um, 
I was busy asking questions, but I, a thank you to staff and everyone involved in the Midtown uh, party. People had a lot of fun. Um, and uh, Mayor, you mentioned La Familia was there and they gave out a bunch of flu shots and also uh, COVID. So uh, that's terrific. Re really wonderful that they were there. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, thank our friends um, in the schools and at Meow Wolf. We had a dedication of a, a little uh, library this morning that was uh, designed and manufactured by Meow Wolf. You can see it over at Fort Marcy. It's awesome. It was super fun. And there will be installations the next three Wednesdays, one in each council district. And um, it was just super fun. We had kids from uh, Tosuke Elementary School there. And, um, we, we had a terrific time. So thanks to everybody that participated in that. Um, I would like to sign on, Mayor, as a co-sponsor um, to the second resolution that you will be reading into the record tonight. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Garcia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, I don't know if folks had heard, um, but just want to bring to everybody's attention that our over this past week, our beloved caboose that's there at the intersection of St. Francis and Cerritos was vandalized. And uh, I just so I just want to give a huge, huge shout out and big thanks of appreciation for Rick Martinez for quickly resolving and remedying the, the caboose. Um, you know, I think that that place that caboose holds a very special place in a lot of people's hearts. So thanks, Rick, for, for everything you do to add to our community. Um, I want to echo what uh, Councillor Abeta brought up earlier in regards to the ARPA comments. And I didn't know if it was possible for us to, uh, during our next governing body meeting on November 10th, to have a completely separate agenda item that lists out that it is ARPA comment instead of just public comment. And, and I think that will help folks clearly understand that this is solely dedicated for that. So if we can do that, that would be fantastic. Um, I'd also like to sign on to Councillor Lindell's resolution supporting efforts by the state and local educators to alleviate the staffing crisis. Um, and then lastly, just happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, hope, hope everybody has a safe Halloween. Have fun, dress up if that's your thing. Um, I, I know my thing is to dig into the kiddos candy late at night after Halloween. So, you know, some, somehow they just mysteriously go missing. Um, Hey, I don't know who took it, but it wasn't, it wasn't Pops. It wasn't Dad. Uh, so have, have a happy Halloween, everybody. And as uh, Councillor Cassett said and reminded us and City Clerk, next week's the, the election. And so if you haven't voted, you can vote tomorrow. You can vote Friday. You can vote Saturday. And then you can vote uh, Tuesday. So lots of opportunity. Get out, vote, let your voice be heard, have fun. And uh, yeah, participate in democracy. Uh, with that, no other comments, Mr. Mayor. Many thanks, Councillor. Um, Councillor Rivera, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would also like to sign on to Councillor Lindell's resolution supporting efforts by state and local educators to alleviate the staffing crisis. And then I have some, myself and Councillor Beta have uh, legislation that we're introducing. The first is a resolution allowing the city of Santa Fe's participation in a transportation project fund program for the Agua Fria South Meadows intersection. The other one is a resolution allowing the city of Santa Fe's participation in a transportation project fund program to construct an extension of Paseo de Sol. And then uh, lastly, I, I believe Councilor Councilwoman Villarreal and myself are uh, sponsoring a resolution updating the terms of resolutions number 2020-29 and 2021-17 to extend the duration of the Community Health and Safety Task Force through the end of the calendar year 2022. And I know uh, a lot of you have been getting questions on this and just want to let you know that we'll be doing uh, a presentation um, on the work that's been done at the November meeting, I sent an email to uh, the mayor and 
uh, the city clerk and uh, hopefully we'll get on that list to do a present a presentation to let you know what work has been done and what we're going to be doing moving forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Abeda, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor, but uh, Councillor Garcia and Councillor Rivera both covered the uh, matters that I had. So thank you. All right. Councillor Romero Worth, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, very quickly, just uh, echo my colleagues. Thank you to everybody who made the block party this last weekend a success. I also uh, was there for a while and um, it looked like everybody was having a great time. And uh, I think that we got uh, some good community feedback and uh, accomplished some other things like uh, vaccinations. So that's, that's all awesome. Um, I'd like to sign on to Councillor Lindell's uh, resolution about staffing crisis. And I think that's all I have, Mayor. Uh, get out and vote, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I have two items I'm introducing. I'll read them into the record. A resolution requesting approval of first quarter budget amendments and associated New Mexico Department of Finance and Administration Local Government Division uh, scheduled for fiscal year 2021-2022 and a resolution extending the time frame for permitting temporary use of any city sidewalk street right of way or other specified property for the sale and consumption of alcohol pursuant to section 23-6.1 E5 SFCC 1987. Um, I would say what I said at the beginning of our meeting, we passed uh, a tragic milestone in the state of New Mexico with more than 5,000 people who have lost their lives to COVID. Um, I think we all need to take a minute and reflect on how different this pandemic is from anything any of us uh, has ever experienced. It's not something that goes away and we are all adapting to it, learning from it, how to be compassionate, considerate to each other, hopefully uh, extending uh, our best selves to each other and taking the steps to keep each other safe. Uh, continued thanks to our first responders, to our nurses, docs, emergency room individuals. This is a long and hard uh, effort that they're making on an ongoing basis. It's not over. It's not over anytime soon. So please uh, be, be thankful for the work that all those folks do. Uh, we are so great grateful to them for what they contribute and to their tireless efforts to keep us safe and healthy and to our city employees the same. Uh, the uh, number of people who have gotten their vaccinations as city employees has gone up steadily. People who are being tested, we thank you for that as well. To everyone who is mindful of the benefit of wearing masks in our indoor spaces and in our meeting spaces, uh, thank you for uh, keeping our public and our community safe. I think it's safe to say that over the last year and a half, Santa Fe and Santa Fe County have set a standard for the country in terms of combating the spread of COVID and keeping each other safe, keeping each other housed, keeping each other fed, looking after each other in a way that is exemplary uh, across this whole community. Uh, with that, um, it's 8.15. We're gonna to move to the evening agenda. I would recommend a 15 minute pause. We haven't actually had a chance to stand up, maybe uh, grab a quick bite to eat. We've got hearings tonight. We have still that postponed airport item we need to return to. We have uh, some planning commission appointments. So let's, let's come back at 8.30, uh, ready to roll up our sleeves and take on the evening agenda, if that's okay with everybody. I'll see you back here in 15 minutes and we're on pause. Thank you.
All right, it is 8.31 by my clock. Time to reconvene. Uh, if you're present, please click on your camera. There we go. All right. Hope everybody had a nourishing dinner in the 15 minutes that were allotted. Yeah, I hear you, Councilwoman VRL. <laughs> All right, uh, we're missing a few folks still. If you're with us, please click on your camera so we know we've got a full working governing body. Well, we have a quorum, but we don't have everybody. Uh, maybe with our quorum, we can tackle that uh, airport issue and dispense with that before we take on other matters. I understand, uh, Madam City Attorney, you might have been in touch with um, uh, Director Wheeler or direct or uh, Mark Baca. Is my understanding is we need to postpone this item to a future date? Do we have a do they give you a recommendation on how far into the future or what date we should postpone it to? Yes, Mayor Weber, I think we can go ahead and postpone to the November 10th meeting and hopefully we'll get it to a committee or two before then as well. Okay, great. So if that's the recommendation from the, uh, from the staff, can I get a motion to postpone the uh, airport item, that, the lease that we had in front of us that we put into the agenda, we move to now on the agenda. The goal would be to postpone it until our November governing body meeting. Can I get a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Okay, there's a motion to move it to our November meeting and there's a second. Uh, is there, yes, Councilor Rivera. Yeah, thank you. I did speak with uh, Mark Baca and he uh, had informed me that uh, he did have a death in the family and wanted me to let everyone know that that's the reason that uh, I guess the packet materials weren't in there, he didn't realize that this was on the on the agenda. So he extended his uh, uh, apologies, but well, it was okay with postponing. So, um, you know, thanks. condolences to him and his family. Yeah, thanks for checking it. I was guessing there were some extenuating circumstances that would keep him from being with us. So thank you for checking with him. Uh, any other discussion before we vote on the motion to postpone? If not, uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes, Councilor Romero Ward. Yes. Councilor V. Hill Coppler. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councilor Abeka. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Garcia. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Councilor Rivera. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion has been approved. Good, thank you. Thank you again, Councilor Rivera, for the checking on that. That's good to know and sad to know at the same time. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you take us to the uh, item 19A on our agenda? Uh, yes, uh, 19A is appointments. We have two appointments tonight to the Planning Commission. Uh, the first appointment is Daniel Pava. It's an at-large appointment with a term expiring uh, in June of 2023. And the second is for Janet Clow. It's a change in membership to District 2 with a term ending in June of 2023. Move to approve. Second. 
I heard a motion to approve from Councillor Lindell and a second from Councillor Vigil Coppler. Is there a discussion? Councillor Cassett, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I'm very excited about both these appointments from what I hear Dan Pav is gonna be a great, great addition and uh, Janet Klaus already a wonderful member of the Planning Commission. Um, my question is about the one uh, position that is still open, which is um, a representative from District 4. Um, and I believe that it's been vacant for a few months now since Amanda Chavez uh, resigned. Um, so I was hoping to get an update on where we are in terms of filling that position, especially considering how much development <laughs> happens in District 4. I think it's really crucial to be sure that that um, that our district is equally represented. Good, good question. Uh, Noah, do you wanna talk about where we are with candidates from district four and whether we would reopen the field or have we got a full uh, set of options in front of us? Is it timely to ask for more people at this time? What would you recommend? Um, thank you, mayors, and um, good evening, councilors, and thank you for the question, Councilor Cassett. Um, I would recommend uh, that we re-advertise for that position, perhaps, um, so we can see who, um, if the interest is um, garnered in that area. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Okay. And I would just request that we do that sooner rather than later. Again, I uh, just want to make sure that District 4 is uh, equally represented on the Planning Commission. Thank you, that was all. Good, thank you for raising it. Other questions about the nominations for the uh, planning commission that's in front of us? Uh, if not, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? <clears throat> yes, Councilor B. Hill Coupler? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yep. Councilor Abeta? Yes. Councilor Cassa? Yes. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Councilor Rivera? Yes. Councilor Romero-Worth? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Appointments have been approved. Thank you. Um, can you take us to the first of our public hearings, please? Uh, yes. The first item is 20A. It's consideration of bill number 21-23. 20, yeah, it's an adoption of an ordinance amending section uh, 9-1.7 SFCC 1987 regarding ranked choice voting to amend how a tie vote between two candidates is resolved. Uh, this was sponsored by Councilor Garcia and I believe attorney uh, Martinez is, a here, is here as well as myself for this item. Thank you. Um, I think what we'll do is ask for a presentation from uh, Attorney Martinez, and then uh, open the uh, open to public comment. It's a public hearing, and then come back to the governing body for a motion and discussion. So, Marcos, if you can please walk us through the uh, the ordinance that's in front of us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the governing body. Very briefly, the purpose of the proposed legislation is to amend the way that the city resolves tie votes in ranked choice voting elections. The current code uses the pre-ranked choice voting method of resolving ties, which we accomplished by drawing lots. Common Cause of New Mexico brought it to our attention that the Secretary of State had this summer in July adopted new regulations for resolving ties in ranked choice voting elections. <clears throat> and then just jumping to the legislation, uh, the proposed legislation, I should say, it states that if a tie between candidates occurs at any stage in the tabulation, the tie shall be resolved in favor of the candidate who received the greatest number of combined first choice votes and transferred votes at the previous stage of tabulation. So um, I would say, number one, this is now the proposed legislation is consistent with the Secretary of State's regulations on ranked choice voting, and uh, therefore there wouldn't be any conflict between what our code currently says and what the state Secretary of State is recommending. Um, there's also an additional provision for if there's a tie that occurs in the first round of tabulation, uh, then the tie would be resolved against the candidate who received the least number of combined second choice votes. Um, 
That concludes my brief overview of the legislation, but I'll be happy to stand for questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, that's, that's a good uh, overview. Let's go to the attendee room, Madam Clerk, and see if there are individuals who'd like to uh, speak to the open public hearing on this item. Um, if anyone would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. All right, uh, Ms. Stephanie Beninato. Let's uh, have a two minute uh, time for this. Um, thank you very much. Um, my concern is the last provision where there's a tie on the first round, because what's going to happen is you'll get a candidate who's a plurality candidate, which is what the whole system is to avoid. Um, the other part of that is um, following Secretary of State recommendations. That, that does kind of make sense to me, but it's seems like that would be a situation where there would be multiple candidates or multiple stages um, before two um, candidates would tie. So anyway, I'm concerned about the, the latter part where basically we come out with the plurality can, uh, uh, win. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the attendee room who wants to speak to the ordinance in front of us regarding the uh, calculation on uh, changing how we resolve a tie vote. No, Mayor, there is not. I don't see any hands up. So let's come back to the governing body. Are there questions uh, for uh, uh, Marcos or for uh, the city clerk? Comments about this item or would any of the sponsors like to speak to it? Not at this time. Uh, Fair enough. Can we get a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion to approve from Councilor Garcia and a second from Councilwoman Villarreal. Any further discussion before we call the roll? If not, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Uh, yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Beta? Yes. Councilor Tassa? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Rivera? Yes. Councillor Romero-Worth? Yes. Councillor Vigo Coppler? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. Uh, I think our next public hearing is a, a series of related items running from, well, why don't you walk us through it, Madam Clerk? It runs uh, forward from a number, of, uh, a number of different individual motions, but one land use case that covers a series of uh, subset hearings. Well, here it is one hearing, but we'll have to have individual motions on each of the sub categories. But do you wanna walk us through that, Madam Clerk? Uh, yes, so um, this is the first item is 20B. It's consideration of a resolution amending the general plan future land use map designation from low density residential, which is one dwelling per acre and one to three dwelling units per acre to moderate density residential uh, three to seven dwelling units per acre for approximately uh, 8.38 acres of land located on the east side of Cates Way, north of South, South Meadows Road, uh, also known as the Alexander Estate Subdivision General Plan Amendment, uh, case number 2021-3805. So this is, um, as I mentioned, case number 2021-3805, the Alexander Estate Subdivision General Plan Amendment. Um, it's presented Montoya Land Use Consulting is the agent for Next Generation Contracting, Inc. Owner requests approval of a general plan future land use amendment to change the designation from low density residential, again, one dwelling unit per acre and one to three dwelling units per acre to moderate density residential, which is the three to seven dwelling units per acre for approximately 8.38 acres of land located on the east side of Cates Way, north of South Meadows Road. 
Um, Donna, our case manager, is available for this item. And I, I'll read each, um, each item as we go through. Okay. I'm going to just walk through our uh, process. So the members of the governing body are familiar with this, but I think there may be members of the public who, for whom it's new. Uh, we start by the members of the governing body disclosing any pre-hearing communications regarding the merits of the appeal. If a member feels they cannot be fair and impartial, this would be the time they would rec recuse themselves. Uh, then we would go to a staff report for no more than 10 minutes. The applicant would then begin with an opening statement, sworn witness testimony for no more than 20 minutes. Uh, then if desired, according to our process, the applicant can ask questions of staff by directing questions through me. The public then will be asked if they would like to be sworn in and comment. And that's usually uh, no more than two to three minutes per person. The governing body then is free to ask questions of the staff or of the uh, applicant of witnesses and or the public. Uh, we then come back after we close the public hearing. Once the public hearing is closed, further questions of witnesses are appropriate only if we reopen that public hearing to allow responses. So the question period needs to be utilized to get those questions answered. Come back to the governing body for a motion and a second on whether we will prove or not. Uh, and then we're at, we always ask for the person making the motion to state their reasoning so that there are findings, discussion, deliberations, and finally, we'll go to a, uh, a roll call vote. So Mayor, that's our problem. Yeah, Councilwoman. Now that you've outlined our process, could we have the city attorney talk about uh, the special role that we play here? Uh, this is a quasi-judicial uh proceeding and it takes us out of our normal uh, role as uh, elected representatives of the community. And if she could just speak to what we're doing here tonight, it's I think sometimes confusing. Okay, uh, city attorney, a reminder of the change in statute status that we are now operating under. Sure, thank you, Mayor, Councilor Romero. Um, so uh, for the next two matters, and there's gonna be one essentially hearing for the three items on the agenda for this matter. Um, the governing body will be sitting in its quasi-judicial um, stature, which means instead of creating policy for these matters, um, the governing body will be hearing evidence and con considering arguments and then applying the existing law that has been passed in prior meetings and years to the case at hand. Um, so as opposed to certain situations where the governing body has more leeway to establish new policy. In this case, the governing body must consider the facts and evidence that are presented during the hearing um, by either witnesses or submitted materials and apply the existing code to those materials. Thank you. Uh, so let me go back to the process. Step one, if anyone has had pre-hearing communications they wanna disclose, now would be the time to do that. If not, we'll then go to staff for a presentation of up to 10 minutes uh, staff presentation. Uh, Donna, is that coming That's to you? Me. Yes. You have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, Mayor Weber and counselors. Uh, Alexander State Subdivision is comprised of the three cases uh, will be presented concurrently in one single presentation, but you will be voting on each of the three cases separately and those sample motions are laid out in your staff memo. So I'll be brief since the applicant will be giving a presentation and going into more detail. Uh, I think that first case caption was read to you, the 2021-3805 um, uh, for the Alexander States Subdivision General Plan Amendment. Um, I'll go ahead and read this one and breeze through the other two. Um, Montoya Land Use Consulting is the agent for Next Generation Contracting Incorporated, who is the owner, requests approval of a general plan future land use amendment to change the designation from low density residential, which is one dwelling unit per acre and one to three dwelling units per acre, to a moderate density residential, which is up to uh, three to seven dwelling units per acre, 
for approximately 8.38 acres of land located on the east side of Cates Way, which is north of uh, South Meadows Road. Uh, the next case is 2021-3806, uh, which is the Alexander Estates subdivision rezoning. Um, this is the request for approval of rezoning from R1, which is one dwelling unit, to R7, which is seven dwelling units per acre. And case number 2021-3807 is the Alexander Estates subdivision preliminary development plan. And this is a request for a pre preliminary development plan approval of a uh, pre preliminary subdivision for 59 single family residential lots. Uh, so again, this proposal consists of the three applications in terms of the order of the cases, uh, the general plan must be amended first uh, before any approval of the change in, in the zoning designation request, which is R7. And that zoning district requires um, the submittal of a development plan, which is why that is before you this evening. So if the governing body approves the general plan amendment, the rezoning request and the development plan, the uh, proposal will then go back to the planning commission who will then review a future application for a final development plan and final subdivision plan based on, of course, the approved preliminary plan before you this evening. So the planning commission conducted uh, its public hearing on August 5th, 2021, and found that the proposed rezoning and development plan requests are compatible with the uses, character, and densities of the surrounding area, and found that the development plan will not increase or create any nonconformities with Chapter 14. The Planning Commission recommends the governing body approve the preliminary development plan subject to certain conditions of approval and technical corrections set forth in the staff report and attached exhibits. The uh, Planning Commission in its review also found that the applicant satisfied all subdivision criteria set forth in 14-3.7C and approved the preliminary subdivision, which is subject to uh, the, zone, the uh, governing body approving the applicant's rezone request to R7 with the proposed development plan and adopted findings of fact and conclusions of law to that effect. The applicant has complied with all the procedural requirements for rezoning, uh, which includes the notice requirements, pre-application and early neighbor notification. In uh, conclusion, the uh, governing body should approve case number 2021-3805 and 2021-3806 and 2021-3807 as recommended by the Planning Commission. And again, those motions for the three cases are presented on, on page two of your staff report. Um, I, I will point out that um, the uh, third motion for the Alexander Estates is um, I, for, the, for the development plan is not not related or directly tied to the ordinance, but it basically is, is a development plan that you vote on because that is something that, um, as mentioned before, a development plan is, is required to be done with the R7 zoning district, but you're just approving, you're just uh, voting on the development plan. So hopefully that's not too muddled. But um, with that, um, I'll stand for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back to the Q&A after we go through a few other steps, but thank sure. you for the presentation. Uh, that brings us then to the uh, applicant or owner. I think it's represented by Ms. Montoya. Uh, you have the floor uh, for up to 20 minutes to make a presentation to the governing body. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Do I need to swear in? City Attorney, are we swearing, or Madam City Clerk, are we swearing her in at the moment? Yes, I do. Weber, yes, we need to swear in if she's going to make any factual. Let's, which, let's, no. be, let's conduct the swearing in then. Thank you. Uh, yes. Can you uh, say I and state your name and then your full address or would you reside? I, Monica Montoya, 726 Gregory Lane. Hey, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Monica Montoya of Montoya Land Use Consulting, Inc. here in Santa Fe. I am joined this evening 
um, by, with my clients, Nick Montoya and Anthony Montoya of Next Generation Contracting Inc. I'm also joined this evening by Oralyn Guerrero Ortiz of Design Ingenuity, who is the project engineer, the civil on the project. And also Bert Thomas of Bohannon Houston, who was the traffic consultant on the project. I know that the city council has a full description of the project in your packets, but if you will indulge me, and I know you guys are tired, very likely, I can review just a few major points and then stand for questions if that's okay. And I will share my screen at this point. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, so just briefly, I uh, prepared a presentation outline. I'll first go over the project um, just to, to show you what we have in mind, the location of the project, its vicinity. I'll share with you the subdivision design, the architectural design, and then I'll go over the general plan and re rezoning, and then I'll stand for questions. First of all, what is Alexander Estates? Um, it is a single family residential subdivision with 59 fee simple lots on 8.4 acres. It has a component for 12 affordable homes um, and it will provide individual ownership and it will have custom quality homes intending to add to the the housing inventory in Santa Fe. There are some very unique characteristics of the subdivision, which I will share with you just um, in the next few slides. First of all, where is the project? The project is on 8.4 acres on the north side of South Meadows Road and on the south side of the New Mexico 599. If you can hopefully see my pointer, this is South Meadows Road. It's a connection on the south at Awafria, and then it goes to the north and connects to the roundabout at New Mexico 599. Right here, this shaded blue area is the subject um, subdivision. On our east side, which I'm calling our east side, is the El Camino Real uh, Academy, the school, uh, to the north of of us, of course, is the, the Veterans Highway. To the left of us is partially developed property. And then to the west of even that is the Cottonwood Mobile Home Park. Here is another view of uh, with the image overlay so that you can get a perspective of what the lands around the property um, look like, densities, roof areas, et cetera, et cetera. Cottonwood Mobile Home Park to our west, the El Camino Real to our east, you can uh, get a good shot of the football field um, to the South South Meadows, New Mexico 599. This parcel right here is a 30 acre owned by the state of New Mexico and currently leased by the city of Santa Fe, um, according to the lease documents for economic development purposes. Now I'll go over the design now that we know where the property is. This right here is the same little, uh, the same 8.4 acres that you saw in the previous two screens. This is the layout of the subdivision. The property is basically or, or flat. There is a general slope from north to south. Kate's Way here on the south, New Mexico 599 on the north. Kate's Way has an access point off of South Meadows Road to the south here. And um, will it's, it's partially constructed. Our intent is to completely construct it um, so that it goes all the way up to the north end of our subdivision, providing a, a, an access, a public road access for the Sangre Azul subdivision, which you may uh, recall you recently made decision on um, for development. And then some partially vacant parcels to the north will have access to that public right of way. That right of way will also service the lots on the west side of the subdivision. And then we propose a loop street along here, which will service the, the remainder of the lots. 
So earlier I showed you this one access here, connection to Kate's way. The next screen will show you, we have a second access from the north end of the property. It'll parallel New Mexico 599 and connect to the roundabout. It might not be on your page. It's not showing up on my page, but it connects to the roundabout at South Meadows Road. So this, this um, leg or this new public road extension, we are committing to construct two public street standards and then turn it over to the city of Santa Fe for your use um, in this economic development effort that um, you have with the 30 acres that belong to the state. Um, so one other thing I wanted to, to talk about is this, this road does meet public street standards, but in addition, we have also added a 10 foot asphalt um, pedestrian way along the right of way at the request of your MPO staff to create some connection pedestrian and some recreation activities for the area. We have committed to construct that and then turn it over to you guys for for uh, maintenance and for use in your economic development efforts on this 30 acres. And now I will briefly go over the architecture with you. Next, my client, Next Generation Contracting, built some incredible homes in my professional or my personal opinion. What I'm showing you right now is a house that they've recently constructed. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's very beautiful in my opinion. It's got the clay tile roofs. It's got a lot of accent, architectural accents. It's got uh, nice windows, nice big windows. It's, uh, it's got a lot of depth, a lot of character. It's got wall step backs and shades to create depth and shadow. And it's just a very interesting uh, building to look at. And this is one of their recent buildings. This is another one that they've done in the city limits. Um, and this has the same uh, feeling to it, correct character, depth, wall step backs to create shade, nice windows. It's an attractive building. And this is just an architectural feature that you'll find on, one of, on, a, on some of their homes. So you can see it's very custom and very beautiful in my opinion. This is a streetscape that I thought I would show you. This is one of their existing subdivisions. And this particular photo was taken in the winter time. So the trees are um, uh, not green, but if you would imagine um, this street in the summertime with these large um, mature trees, the street is quite beautiful in the summertime. And now I'll just briefly go over our general plan amendment. So what you're looking at here is, uh, is your future land use map. And our parcel is this piece right here. It is partially one unit per acre and partially one to three units per acre. This one unit is, is basically everything that you'll see along New Mexico 599. And this was probably created as a buffer um, to create a buffer um, of, along New Mexico 599 is, is what I'm guessing. The school itself has a public institu institutional designation to the east of the school. There's a density. Your future land use uh, has a, a designation of 12 to 29 units per acre. And then this, the parcel that the city controls under the lease has a seven dwelling unit per acre, which is essentially the same uh, zone we're requesting. Uh, the, um, at the Cottonwood Mobile Home Park has a density of 12 units per acre at the top. And so we're proposing that the project is consistent with the policies of the general plan and it's appropriate for the site based on density patterns in the areas I just presented. Um, the, um, excuse me for a moment. The project is consistent with the goals of the general plan regarding economic development the general plan has established a community commercial use on land in the vicinity of the project to support the area. Medium density residential uses are established on New Mexico uh, 599 and South Meadows Road node. The fundamental framework for the residential communities exist, including roads. Um, New Mexico 599 is there. 
the city water and sewer, sewer are there, schools are there, et cetera. And the medium densities are consistent with the, with the growth management policies of chapter four and the general plan, chapter 14 that is. The guiding policies for growth management call for a concentration of populations at greater densities in developing areas with centrally located neighborhood centers. In addition, the proposed density can be supported by the existing fundamental infrastructure in the area. We feel like the medium density will contribute to a coordinated land use system in the immediate area of New Mexico 599 and South Meadows Road. Many amenities for a healthy community exist or are in the planning stages to promote a prosperous community, including access to an interchange, shopping, in close proximity, employment centers, schools, parks, pedestrian trails are in close proximity. Our rezoning, here again is our subject parcel, and this map is taken from your city GIS data, essentially just showing what the zonings in the area are um, in comparison to the parcel. And so you can see there are some um, higher densities uh, districts in the area, including the R1. There's also, which I was surprised, uh, some mixed use commercial residential, which is kind of a, you know, a live work zone with some commercial um, uh, factors and uh, mixed with residential use, kind of a live work, live there and work there, which is also in that area. I didn't know that, but that was pretty interesting to see. So the R7 district is established in the city code to allow for a greater intensity of residential use. The R7, which we're proposing, is an infill zone for development of vacant land and promotes a compact urban form and efficient use of public infrastructure and services. So the existing infrastructure is sufficient for the zone we are proposing R7 as a medium density district. The area has evolved to include much higher densities than R7, including two apartment communities in the area. Um, we, we have worked closely with staff on the design of this project and we uh, agree with all of the conditions that staff is recommending. Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, have gone beyond the, the um, Santa Fe City Code requirements with the right of way that we will we'll be constructing from the north end of our project to connect to South Meadows on the east by adding a 10 foot wide asphalt pedestrian trail. And, and essentially what that does is it creates a, a, large, a large loop for folks to walk from the subdivision to South Meadows Road, down South Meadows Road and up Cates Way and loop. There's also an opportunity for a connection at Kate's Way to the Santa Fe River Trail, which is in the planning stages right now. Um, we also added a sidewalk at the request of staff at the south end of South Meadows Road. Um, that was not a requirement of Santa Fe City Code, but we added that in there just to, because we agree that it made the, the pedestrian circulation factor um, improved. And we are, um, of course, adding utilities stubs to our neighbors on the west, which was something that came out of the neighborhood process. And we are also working on some red line comments that staff has for us. Um, one thing I forgot to mention um, was that when I was going over the architecture, I wanted to, um, to make sure that the council understood that it, the affordable homes that are built by my client will not be any different um, structurally or architecturally from the market homes that are in the project. I just wanted to, to make sure I conveyed that to the city council. And with that, I stand for questions. Hope I wasn't too long. No, you were perfect, thank you. Um, I think we'll offer you the opportunity should you wish to, according to our processes, you have the opportunity to ask any questions of staff. You're not required to do it, of course, if there's nothing to engage in at this time. And we'll come back around to questions for you and staff after we listen to the uh, public's comments. No questions for Thank staff you. at this point. Thank you, Ms. Montoya. With that, then, um, 
Madam Clerk, uh, this is the part of the uh, hearing where we go to the public for sworn public comment. If there's anyone in the attendee room who wishes to uh, offer sworn testimony, now would be the time for them to raise their hands, be sworn in, and we'll give everybody who wishes to testify two minutes to speak uh, to this proposal. Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, Stephanie Beninato. Um, good evening, Stephanie Beninato. Do I have to get sworn in or? Yes, you do. Yes. To be yes. sworn in. You do. Um, so if you could please say I state your name and then residing at with your full address. I, Stephanie Beninato, PO Box 1601, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Right. Uh, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think my only general comment or negative comment is that, again, it seems like there's still this sort of piecemeal development or changing to the um, master plan on some level. However, uh, I see that it does fit in with the zoning or the density that's already there. And I really think the developers are going out of their way to um, improve, you know, give pu the public improvements that are also needed there. And particularly the pedestrian um, trail or walk. Um, so I, you know, and again, affordable housing actually being there, not just be in lieu of. So I, I hope and, uh, that you will approve this, but I really do hope that you will have a, uh, a proposed general plan and changes to master plan so that uh, there isn't a piecemeal approach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else in the attendee room from the public who wishes to be sworn in and testify at this time? Uh, Mayor, yes. There's Joanna Garcia. Joanna, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, good okay. evening. Uh, um, I actually need to swear you in, sorry. Uh, can you please state your name and then your full address? Yes, Joanna Garcia, 1190 Morning Drive. Perfect. And do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, um, Mayor and Council and uh, Mrs. Montoya. I do have to say that the homes that Next Generation, um, they, the, they're beautiful homes and they, they do take um, into um, consideration an awful lot of uh, extended items that they're helping the city out with. Uh, my main question is the traffic in that area because of the, um, the curve and the school that's next door to Kate's Way is horrendous. It is, um, you know, it's just, um, it's an accident waiting to happen because I usually go to work through that roadway and now with all of the new apartments that have come up that's just going to add more to the traffic so that's my question and then of course I have a question on the water because of those apartments that came up now I have to say that um, next generation's homes they're just gonna they're gonna stand out beautifully I don't know why they have to be so dense I you know I understand that affordable housing is um, dense, um, but the new apartments that went up are, they're aesthetically, aesthetically horrendous. They just look like a bunch of columns that went up. And I do have to say that uh, Ms. Montoya's, um, the idea of the homes in there, that would have been, I think, a much better idea for that land in that area. But uh, those are my questions is the, the traffic. I'm I'm very concerned about the traffic and I know that the intersection is going to be expanded here pretty quick. I understand that South Meadows and Alfreya are going to be expanded, but that is a, that's a very dangerous situation uh, coming and going um, 
and I don't know what the traffic impact is. So that's my that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Garcia. Anyone else in the attendee room who wishes to uh, offer their testimony at this time? If the answer to that is no, then we'll come back to the governing body for questions of staff, questions of the uh, applicant of Ms. Montoya. We'll begin with Councilor Abeda. You have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I do. I share the same concerns as uh, one of the speakers this evening regarding the traffic. So if you can talk to us more about traffic, uh, the way South Meadows does kind of bend around the school, I could see where concerns about pulling in and out of the development uh, as far as sight distance. And then, uh, so yeah, if I could have a little more detail regarding the traffic and what you're expecting as far as uh, amount of traffic and traffic patterns. Thank you. Sure, I, I can start with that and perhaps turn it over to our traffic engineer if um, more information is needed. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Councillor Abeta. We worked early on with the uh, city traffic folks even before the design, um, the, the subdivision design, we did a scope meeting and uh, there were three things that the traffic engineer wanted us to look into and that was the counts at the, um, the roundabout at the new road we're building and the roundabout, the counts at Kate's Way and South Meadows. And the third thing was the visibility of um, you know, being able to see traffic on uh, coming in either direction when you're exiting Kate's Way onto South Meadows. Our traffic study did find that the, the numbers at the two intersections uh, off South Meadows was were in within acceptable levels. And the, the we did a design, um, a, a visibility design that we submitted and was approved by the traffic engineer. So those were three areas that we did, um, did some extensive work on um, and, had, and were approved by the city staff. Councilor Abeda, did you wanna follow up? Yes, yeah, so, so the traffic counts that you did, did they take into consideration the full build out of not just the apartment complex that is under construction now and almost completed, but all the other development that we have approved over the years in that area and maybe just hasn't started construction yet? Mayor and City Councilor uh, Beta, yes, that we did. We factored in all of the counts from the, the Madera um, apartments, from the Gearhart apartments, from the school, and, um, and did it for the present, the existing, and three year out, I believe that is. Bert, would you care to elaborate a little bit on the details of the study? We'll have to swear uh, uh, Bert in before he can do that, of course. And Mayor, it might be helpful if we could go back to the full screen and see the development and then they can describe the, the different access points. Good. Let's, let's go back to a visual and also get the uh, witness sworn in at the same time. Yes. Uh, Bert, can you please state your full name? Uh, so I, your full name, and then residing at with your address? Um, I, uh, Albert Tom. I think we, we lost the audio. You able to hear me? Uh, uh, you're back, yes. Okay. Okay. I, Albert Thomas, residing at 12 Community. Oh, we lost you again. Can you uh, state your address again? Mino de Fe, Moriarty, New Mexico. Okay, um, can you, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item you're tes tes testifying about, sorry, <laughs> shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? Yes. Okay, thank you. Very good. Mr. Thomas, you may have heard the question that was put by Councillor Abeta and looking for a more uh, detailed response about traffic uh, now, uh, future development, this development, surrounding development, what the load factors are and so on, safety issues as well. Uh, yes, uh, 
Mr. Mayor, Councillors. So um, we did take into consideration all of the approved um, uh, plans that, that were previously approved by the city as background traffic. Um, we took the existing counts, we added all those approved developments, and that became the no build um, that was considered as the base traffic prior to our development going in. Um, and we analyzed Kate's way and we analyzed the roundabout and both of those intersections, as was stated earlier, uh, they, they uh, were able to operate at acceptable levels of service in the year 2023. Um, we grew that existing traffic count by 1% per year to get to the 2023 numbers that were used. And then uh, um, with that, we also then added in our subdivision traffic where the amount of trips that were generated by these 59 dwelling units. Um, I do wanna point out that the primary access for this uh, new subdivision is gonna be coming off of the new road that's being constructed, tying uh, along the north side up to the roundabout. Um, and so that's expected to be the primary entrance into this subdivision. However, uh, we also know that people will use South Meadows to get to this location. And so there is some traffic that will get to Catesway intersection. Um, and we added that traffic in. There was approximately seven left turn vehicles in the peak hour that are going to be coming up South Meadows, making a left onto Kate's Way. Um, and so very minor amount of left turn traffic going in in that direction. Um, coming from the north or coming from South Meadows um, down into this area, uh, there is going to be a right turn that is going to be installed to allow for uh, right turn traffic into the Kate's Way. Um, that will help to um, alleviate some of the congestion in the area and make sure that the, the through traffic uh, is not conflicted with any of those right turning vehicles. And that right turn lane can happen after the uh, El Camino Rail School entrance. So all of that was taken into consideration. Um, the other question was about site distance. We took a look at the site distance, uh, especially for traffic that is coming over the bridge um, and wanted to make sure that they could see any traffic that's coming in and out of Kate's Way, um, making sure that there's enough time for them to, to uh, stop or slow down for any traffic that's going to be making a left turn into Kate's Way off of South Meadows. We also took a look at the site distance for any traffic coming out of Kate's Way um, into uh, South Meadows, either making a left turn or a right turn. And the available site distance um, actually it would even allow for a large truck. If an 18 wheeler was coming out of Kate's Way, making a left turn, they would have enough time to, to find a gap in that traffic and be able to get up to speed without having um, any problem of, of somebody overtaking them without having adequate sight distance at that location. So I'll look into consideration to make sure that we create not only a, a, a good operating intersection, but a safe intersection at that location. Thank you. Um, Councilor Abeda, you still have the floor. Okay, so if I understand it there, and I think another slide, maybe the one after or before this one, showed you are going to build the uh, road there, the, the new public road extension as part of this development, the entire thing, the entire stretch is going to be constructed. Uh, Mayor Weber, Councilor Abeda, that is correct. We are taking on the, the construction of that road. Okay, and then if you could go back to the previous slide that you had, you just had up. Oops, that one? Uh, the next one, the aerial. That one. Yeah, okay, so I think, uh, Ms. Montoya, you referred to state land that the city had a lease on. You had said, you had referenced the economic development, but uh, a question for staff, isn't that where fire station number two it was gonna go or is gonna go? Or are we talking about a different piece of property? Mayor Weber, um, councilors, um, Councilor Beta, yes, that is uh, fire station two is slated to go on the northern edge of that property. Okay. All right. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Rivera, your hand is up. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll try to uh, continue where Councilor Beta left off, but who else would have access to that main road from 
I guess, a north part of the subdivision to the roundabout? Would Gerhard Apartments have access? Would Cottonwood have access to that road as well? Um, Mayor Weber, Councilor Rivera, at this time, the, the only access would be the state, unless the city were to grant an easement through the 30 acres that they um, control, that'd be the only way that there would be access granted. Um, I, I suppose it could happen, but it would have to be the city to take that step. Um, as far as the Cottonwood to the west, there isn't, there's private property uh, between the, the, the highway and, um, and the city would have to acquire an easement um, from all of those private landowners in order for it to connect, for that ever to make a, a further west connection. I suppose it could happen, but it would take some, the city, it would take some work on the city's part to try and, and acquire the right of way. And I'm not sure how much space there is between the north boundary line of the Cottonwood um, Mobile Home Park. I'm not sure if there's any right of way along there. I suppose it could be, I just have not investigated that. So I guess the, the, the short answer is, is there's a potential, but it would take some work on the city's part to do that. Donna or Noah, do you wanna comment on that? Um, Mayor Weber, um, Councillors, Council Rivera, uh, I don't think that uh, the city is at this point in time uh, talking about connecting um, the Cottonwood Mobile Home Park. Um, as Ms. Monica Montoya alluded to, it would probably take some effort on our part to go through private property to connect. Um, and Gerhardt Apartments was only granted um, access onto South Meadows Road at this present time. Um, I think if we were to grant any access to Gerhardt Apartments onto uh, the state parcel would require road improvements, further road improvements, as well as um, it may or may not require us to relook at the lease agreement with the state um, as well. All right, so all of these um, agreements that, that have happened over the last couple of years, I guess, have all, um, the concerns have all been around traffic and if we could ease some of the traffic on the South Meadows by uh, using the uh, access road that um, Ms. Matoya just talked about, why would we not consider that? I mean, is this something that we would want to pursue with the state, I guess? I'm not, you know, based on what you said, is it is it something we should or want to? Um. Mayor, Councilors, uh, Council Rivera, um, I, I really can't speak as if, uh, if we should or if we want to. Um, I do know that we had to uh, do a special agreement with the schools just to get um, the connection that we got. Um, and so um, I don't know. And also we had to uh, speak with the state to make that connection as well. So I'm, I'm, I think it would be a bigger conversation, um, but I don't have the answer um, in front of me tonight. Sorry. All right, if, I heard... may, if I may, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry, Councillor Rivera, but our engineer says that the mobile home park uh, has access off our Fria. Uh, that's correct, but all, all those homes on Cottonwood have access to <laughs> one part of our Fria, which was supposed to have a roundabout by now, but that hasn't happened either, so. <laughs> All those homes you're looking at, exit, enter and exit through one, one place on Awa Freer Road. So if we could find some kind of relief for them to be able to exit in a different manner, I think that would be huge for, for that whole subdivision. Um, we heard from the uh, applicant's traffic engineer, I haven't heard from the city's traffic engineer. Uh, have we got our uh, contract engineer on the on the uh, call or not at this time? Um, Mayor, um, Councilor, Councilor Rivera, uh, we tried to get our traffic engineering consultant, but they were unable to attend tonight's meeting.
All right, so um, I guess back to the applicant's traffic engineer. Um, <laughs> I think I heard the, the words that based on the dwelling units that they were presenting, that they found that there would be, a, that this was a, an acceptable traffic design. Is that what I heard? That for Mr. Thomas? I, I guess, I don't know who their traffic designer is. Yeah, I Mr. believe, yeah, go ahead, sir. Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilor Rivera. Uh, yes, we, we conducted the traffic analysis and we showed that the, uh, the intersections at Cates Way, um, the traffic on South Meadows will operate at level service A and the traffic on Cates Way will have a level of service C once, the, once this new um, subdivision is built. The roundabout will continue operating at level of service A with um, one movement at level of service B within the roundabouts. So we've shown that, that all of the traffic impacts uh, associated with this area uh, still lead to an acceptable level of service for those intersections. And did you mention uh, South Meadows and Agua Fria? Uh, the, the South Meadows and Agua Fria intersection was not included as part of the scope for this. So I apologize that I don't have any traffic data for that. All right, so that's a concern because that's currently a, a, a failing intersection. So uh, clearly we have uh, um, designs and, and money to improve that intersection, but at, at current levels, it is a failing intersection. Um, Ms. Montoya, and I guess city staff, um, with regards to Gerhardt and um, the other uh, apartment complex across the street, um, they were willing to dedicate impact fees specifically to South Meadows and Agua Fria to improve that intersection. And I assume that with this um, uh, this area, if it were approved, um, we would be able to do the same thing and, and dedicate impact fees to uh, improve that intersection, even though we have, it appears that we have the money right now. I know with uh, escalating costs, it would be nice to have um, those impact fees dedicated in case uh, fees or uh, cost of construction were higher than we thought it was going to be. Um, is that something that can be done here? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilors, Council Rivera. Um, so we're at 90% uh, design submittal um, with Santa Fe Engineering for um, the intersection of Agua Fria and South Meadows. Um, in fact, we are, and we're pretty much um, working on the right of way acquisitions and acquiring um, through card certified um, certifications through NMDOT. Um, so if, uh, if there was a project um, that the council felt um, needed this impact, needed the money for the road impact fees allocated towards, um, towards it, um, that could be done. Um, but uh, for that it's the exact intersection, the money's already allocated and we're already in design and acquisition phase. But it seems like everything that we've done lately has a higher cost than we initially anticipated. So um, was just hoping that those impact fees from this um, area could be uh, dedicated to South Meadows and Agua Fria in case uh, there weren't enough monies at the end to complete it. Um, with regards to affordable housing, are those homes going to be mixed in or are they going to be in a specific area of the subdivision? Ms. Montoya? Uh, Mayor Weber and Councillor Chris Rivera. Yeah, they are. They're, they're scattered throughout the development. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I have a map that shows the location of them, but they are um, spread throughout the development. They're not just in one particular area. All of the lots in the subdivision, you know, the, they're all the same size. The, um, the, 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 they will, you will not be able to tell a difference between the market homes and the affordables. 
Um, that's been something that has been next generation's practice in all of the existing subdivisions that they've built, and they intend to carry that on here as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. And then um, with regards to pedestrian trails, did you have a, a slide that showed that? Um, this might be the best one to show it. Let's see. This guy right here. So so the pedestrian trail, of course, as I mentioned, this is, there's gonna be a 10 foot wide asphalt trail that will come along parallel to the New Mexico 599 connecting to South Meadows, South Meadows connecting to the South Meadows uh, sidewalk uh, network that comes down South Meadows Road. And then we are adding another sidewalk connection through uh, from South Meadows Road up to Kate's Way. So that'll, it'll be this loop um, connect pedestrian connection. There's also south of this, and it might show it better on my this plan. Uh, the city of Santa Fe, which you're probably aware of, there's a, a plan in the works for a pedestrian trail along the Santa Fe River. I think I believe that's constructed um, just to the. I, I'm not. I can't say how far along it's been constructed, but there's opportunity for connection. Uh, from South Meadows Road to that. So that's another opportunity for, for pedestrian connection to the area, you know, to the east and west to uh, the South Meadows Road. There's also the Romero Park, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is located right where about where my pointer is at. Um, um, there's a master plan, I believe, for that particular park as well. Um, so it feels like there's it, at least in my mind, it felt like there were a lot of opportunity for recreation and for pedestrian connections and biking and, and uh, um, you know, and that to keep people exercising. Yeah, I guess. Uh, so my main concern is uh, there's a number of kids that walk from uh, Cottonwood Mobile Home Park um, to El Camino Real School. And I believe right now they walk through like a dirt trail that goes you know, in front of uh, Kate's Way along uh, South Meadows. And uh, we've done some sidewalk improvements there, I believe, uh, Ms. Wynant, is that correct? I believe, uh, Councillor, uh, Mayor and Councillor uh, Rivera, I, I believe that uh, with the Sangre Azul uh, subdivision, that was a requirement to um, have sidewalk along that frontage. And then this, um, so that, yeah, it's just a short distance between that and the school. So I'm, I'm not really quite sure about the sidewalks. That portion along um, South Meadows uh, belongs to another property owner there. So I don't recall, I believe there is a sidewalk there. I just, uh, sorry, I can't speak with uh, any cert certitude on that, quite honestly. Uh, I'll find an answer to that. Um, Mayor and, and Councillor, I can tell you that the my client also has control over this parcel right here, the Sangre Azul. They'll be, uh, they've purchased that subdivision and will be constructing it. And I'm going to find out um, whether there's, there's sidewalk along South Meadows there. If you can give me just one minute. I see a, a hand up from uh, Eric. Uh, is that a indication you have something to contribute on this question about uh, transportation, Eric? Maybe we can get you sworn in, sir. Madam Clerk. Uh, Mr. Mayor, who's Eric? Yeah, Eric Ani, he's our staff. Eric Ani oh. from the uh, MPO. Got it. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have used the shorthand. My 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 apology. All I see is five people on the bottom of the screen, so I don't I know. see everybody else. I know it's it, when we go into the share screen model, it's a little tricky. Um, Madam Clerk, did you want to swear Eric in so he can speak to this issue? That needs to be sworn in. I think all witnesses could be wrong, but that's been my understanding in the past. We're city attorney. Are we swearing staff staff in? Uh, Mayor Weber, counselors, if, if we're testifying as to facts, if it's about our city code or something like that, then, then not necessarily. Um, so for example, 
Pat Begali, who is the counsel on this matter, would not need to be sworn if she's talking about legal issues. Um, so I guess depending on the question. I think it has to do with the uh, some of the ongoing concerns Council Rivera was raising about pedestrian and uh, other sidewalk and other other uh, uh, tr uh, mobility issues, which is where Eric comes into the picture. Have we lost our city clerk? Where are you, city clerk? I'm here. Sorry about that, Mayor. Um, yes, I can swear in uh, Eric if he's going to be providing. If it's about matters of fact and this and this area, it might be useful just to have it on the record. Uh, sure. Uh, Eric, will you stay? Uh, so you'll say I with your full name and then residing at with your full address. Uh, Eric Onis, living, residing at 1232 Apache Avenue, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for raising your hand, Eric. If you can uh, offer some factual uh, information to Council Rivera's questions. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, members of the council, I, I would be happy to, and, and some good news too, I think. The, uh, just recently, as of um, yesterday, um, MPO staff working with city staff are working on a preliminary engineering report already funded to create a sidewalk connectivity from Cottonwood Home to El Camino Real School. This has been part of a uh, initiative by stakeholders from the schools uh, the neighborhood, the city, and the county for the better part of two years. Uh, it just happens to dovetail that this particular development is going to benefit from this. I'd also like to reiterate that our um, evaluation and work with the developer and the developer staff for this particular development, we believe they're going above and beyond from uh, what we've uh, viewed and, and recommended. Uh, and uh, support that uh, development. Number uh, two, as it relates to traffic, though we are not traffic engineers, uh, we did uh, an analysis review of the traffic study and we've been um, focusing, the MPO has been focusing on this particular area for, for some time for a number of reasons. Uh, the roundabout that is in uh, design and, and ready for construction at Cottonwood and Agua Fria is gonna alleviate a lot of uh, traffic issues. Uh, the city participating in the uh, New Mexico Local Roads Transportation Program, additional funding for the intersection of Agua Fria and uh, South Meadows. Uh, we've been involved with the uh, uh, percent designs on that and look forward to a, a, a new intersection that's going to accommodate a, a greater amount of traffic. So in short, um, this particular area is uh, well suited for the um, the, the traffic that's being planned both from this development and from the uh, proposed developments within the area. So I'm hoping that helps. Thank you. Thank you. That is very timely information. Uh, yeah, uh, Miss, um, I don't know, Wynett or uh, Noah, do you, who, who do we have um, contracts with, with regards to traffic studies for the city? on the city's behalf. Right. Um, thank you for that question, um, Mayor and Councilor and Councilor Rivera. Uh, so we have Wilson and Company as our contracted um, consultant for traffic engineering um, for development review. Um, we also have uh, Public Works has Wilson and Company on, uh, on contract for do, undertaking some of the traffic pro projects as well. Were they contacted to let them know about the, e the meetings this evening? Yes, they were. And do we know why they aren't available? Um, Council Rivera, the, the primary contact um, at, who does our traffic engineering reviews um, is divided among two people. One's a supervisor and then the other one um, is their subordinate um, there and what wound up happening was uh, the traffic engineer who reviewed this um, is at the Navajo Nation on assignment this week um, and was not able to make it. And 
subsequently uh, requested uh, that the end of other individual or supervisor attend and uh, the supervisor um, did not respond. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but I do know that traffic engineering did provide comments that are um, in Donna's report as well under uh, DRT comments as well, but that's the best I have to offer. And I apologize about them not being here tonight. We did try. No, you don't have to apologize on their behalf. They didn't, they didn't make it. And I'm sure they're getting paid well to be here tonight. Um, it, it's tough to try to make a decision based on really what's the most impactful part of any growth in this area, which is traffic and not have somebody representing the city on this. It's, it's frustrating on, on many levels. Um, I don't, I don't know how I can vote for this without having the city's opinion on traffic. Um, uh, I'll just leave it there. I'm super frustrated that we don't have somebody uh, available to answer uh, questions on the city's behalf. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Other, it, it is hard to see hands that are up with the screen share. Maybe we could do the take the screen share down for a moment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we are still entertaining questions from the governing body of staff and or uh, the applicant. Uh, and or anybody who is testifying from the public, if there is a question from the governing body, uh, now's the time to raise it. If, ah, Councillor Abeda, your hand is up. You have the floor. You're muted, however. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would move to postpone so that we could have our traffic engineer come in address these cases, because as Councilor Rivera said, that intersection at South Meadows and Agua Fria is failing, quite frankly, right now. And I think we need to uh, to talk, hear from our traffic engineer side. And, and maybe they could clear this all up and it won't be a long, a long hearing when it's postponed to, but that traffic is a major issue. And it, it is unfortunate that we don't have anybody on staff that could explain that intersection to us and how what this project is proposing is going to alleviate what's going on out there now. So that's my motion, thank you. Okay, there is a, uh, Councilor, you're, uh, let me see if I can paraphrase or clarify what you're saying. I postpone this to our next governing body meeting with the explicit instruction to have traffic engineer representing the city available to answer questions. Yes, thank you. And is there a second? second? Councilor Rivera has seconded Councilor Abeda's motion. Is there a discussion of the mo of this motion? If not, could the clerk call the roll on the motion? There's Councillor Cassett. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor Rivera. Yes. Councillor Merrillward. Yes. Councilor Vigil Coupler. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councilor Abeka. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Item has been approved. So apologies to the applicant. The city should have had its traffic engineer present. It's not your fault, uh, but the questions about traffic are significant. And I think the discomfort in going forward without that technical support from the city side is what you heard tonight. It's not your fault and uh, apologies for this delay. Thank you. Madam Clerk, can we go to the next item then? Uh, yes, the next item is item C. It's consideration of bill number 2021-22, it's adoption of an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city of Santa Fe and changing the classification from R1, residential one dwelling unit per acre to R7, residential seven dwelling units per acre with respect to a certain parcel of land comprising approximately 8.38 acres located on the east side of Cates Way, north of South Meadows Road, uh, also known as Alexander Estate Subdivision Rezoning. Case number 2021-3806. So the subcaption on that is caption number, uh, case number 
uh, 2021-3806, Alexander Estates Subdivision and Zoning, Montoya Land Use Consulting Agent for Next Generation Contract Contracting Incorporated, owner requests approval of rezoning from R1, one dwelling unit per acre, to R7, seven dwelling units per acre, for approximately 8.38 acres of land located on the east side of Cates Way, north of South Meadows Road. Staff on this item is Donna Langett, our case manager. Move for postponement. Second. So this would be postponed till the same, uh, ne to the next council meeting as we did with the prior item. Yes. There's a motion, there's a second to postpone this to the next governing body meeting as a companion to the prior item. There's a motion, there's a second. Is there discussion? If, if no discussion, could the clerk call the roll? Yes, Councilor Garcia. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Councilor Rivera. Yes. Councilor Malworth. Yes. Councilor Michael Kopler. Yes. Councilwoman Virial. Yes. Councilor Abeka. Yes. Councilor Tassett. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. City Attorney, your hand is up. Yes, Mayor Weber. Um, on the first um, matter that we extended, we do have a rule about postponing public hearings and we need to probably designate whether or not we'll still be taking public comment. On the second one, obviously we'll need to because we haven't done it at all. Um, but on the first one, our rule says that if, if a motion is made to reschedule an item that has been advertised as a public hearing after the public hearing is closed, which in this case, I'm not sure we closed the public hearing. We no, did we, not. Did not. Okay. we have not done that yet. Okay, so basically we would be accepting further public comment if there is public at the next meeting. Very clear. Yeah, we, we, we had not, we had been going through the uh, Q&A from governing body members. We had not yet closed the uh, public hearing part of the, of the uh, process. So it'll still be open when we resume. Thank you for that clarification. Madam Clerk, can you take us to the next item on the agenda, please? Uh, yes, the next item is item D. It is um, case number 2021-3807, Alexander State Subdivision uh, Preliminary Development Plan. It's Montoya Land Use Consulting Agent, Next Generation Contracting uh, Incorporated Owner Request Preliminary Development Plan Approval Subdivision um, for 59 single family residential lots on approximately 8.38 acres. The property is zoned R1 residential and is located on the east side of Kids Way, north of South Meadows Road. Um, staff on this item is Donna Wyatt, our case manager. Move for postponement. Second. Okay, so this would be postponed to the same hearing uh, as the prior two items. Uh, as to discussion, please call the roll. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor Rivera. Yes. Councillor Merrill. Yes. Councillor Vijo Coppler. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councillor Cassett. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Item has been approved. Thank you. Could you take us to the next item, please? Yes, the next item um, is actually item E. It's a resolution amending the master plan. So, oh, sorry, let me refocus. This is a separate item. Um, so this is consideration of a resolution amending the master plan for Terra Contenta to include modifications to infrastructure, parks, trails, land uses, and density for phase 3A, which consists of parcels known as track 7A, as shown in book 39. Um, six, page 014, lot eight, as shown in book 396, page 11, track nine, as shown in book 231, page 46, and track 8A3-7C, as shown in book 738, page 15, within section 13, and Pacheco Grant, 
directed section 11 T169 R8E and MPM comprising an area of approximately 216.52 acres located in the southwest of Capitol High School. This was case number 21-3818, Terra Contenta Master Plan Amendment number one for phase 3A. Um, noting this is case number 2021-3818, uh, Terra Contenta Master Plan Amendment number one for phase 3A, Jenkins Gavin Incorporated is the agent for Terra Contenta Corporation owner requests master plan amendment for phase 3A. The amendment, which includes modifications to infrastructure, parks, trails, land uses, and density. The property is an undeveloped tract of land located southwest of Capitol High School containing approximately 216.52 acres and is zoned PRC, planned residential community. Dan Esquivel is the case manager on this item. Noah, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mayor um, and Councilors. Given the fact that the previous cases was um, postponed because of lack of having our traffic engineering consultant here, um, I would just caution that we, we might run into that same scenario um, for this case because the traffic engineer consultant is not here to speak on their review of the proposed amendment. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Uh, Dan, your, your hand is up. Yeah, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilors. I also might add that while there was a traffic analysis or some traffic studies that were done as part of the master plan, there will be more traffic analysis done as each indiv individual phase is brought forward to the the Planning Commission uh, for more detail. This is at a very high level review uh, designed to manipulate the original master plan to something more usable and current for today's market. Okay. Well, I, I would like to do whatever we can do to get move forward on the item. And then if we hit a speed bump and we have to do what we did with the last item after we've opened up the presentation and we've covered as much as we can cover, it's already 10 o'clock. Uh, maybe whether we bring this all the way to completion with or without the traffic engineer on hand, we'll see. But let's get the uh, let's get the uh, information out on the table and begin the process and see where it takes us. So I'm going to repeat the process that I uh, described previously. We're still using the same uh, quasi-judicial uh, process. We'll start with disclosure of any communications that may uh, need to be. Uh, revealed or disclosed. We'll then get uh, Mr. Escobel will give us a up to 10 minute presentation followed by a presentation up to 20 minutes by the applicant. We can have the applicant ask questions of staff if they so desire. We'll go to the public for sworn comment, come back to the governing body for Q&A. Uh, if at that time we've completed Q&A, we'll close the public hearing piece, go to uh, motion and deliberation and uh, if we get there, a vote. So with that in mind, again, procedurally, if anyone in this quasi-judicial process needs to disclose some sort of uh, communications that would be uh, require somebody to recuse themselves, now would be the time to say so. If not, uh, then we'll move to staff. Mayor? Yes. If we could just have the city attorney repeat quasi-judicial because if somebody comes in to listen to just this portion of the meeting and right. it's unique enough and misunderstood enough that I think it's worth repeating, even Fair though enough. most yeah. of the people on screen are aware of it. Fair enough. Madam City Attorney, remind us again, or anyone who is just joining us, what this quasi-judicial uh, proceeding changes in the way of the uh, governing body's roles. Sure. Thank you, Mayor, Councilor Merwer. Um, so this is a matter that is um, different from a policy-making matter for the governing body. Um, in a policy-making matter, they get to make the law. In this matter, they have to apply the law that exists before the hearing to facts and um, as to testimony and evidence that is introduced during this proceeding. And so they cannot change the law during the proceeding, um, and they must consider what is in front of them and not evidence that's from outside the hearing. Thank you. With that said, uh, Mr. Escobel, you are the present presenter of the staff uh, uh, report. I turn the floor over to you for 
uh, up to 10 minutes to bring us your report, please. Thank you, Mary. I will, uh, I've truncated my, my presentation, so about six minutes, please. Thank you. So I won't repeat the case caption. Uh, what I will uh, identify is its location for everybody to see. Uh, again, Tierra Contenta is made up of about four tracks that are within the Tierra Contenta Master Plan, uh, and it is southwest of Capitol High School, identified by this blue circle. Uh, recommendations, the governing body should approve case 2021-3818 as recommended by the Planning Commission. Uh, should the governing body choose to approve case 21-3818, the governing body should also adopt the resolutions identified in Exhibit A, amending the Tierra Contenta Master Plan, neither approve the findings of fact and conclusions of law identified in Exhibit B, or choose to amend them should the governing body choose to deny case 2021-3818. It should direct staff to draft proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law, reflecting the governing body's decision to re be reviewed and adopted as a subsequent meeting. There are mo example motions that are here. Move to approve case 2021-3818, Tierra Contenta Master Plan adopted ad amendment number one for phase 3A with design guidelines subject to conditions of approval recommended by the Planning Commission and City staff listed in Exhibit C, and move to adopt resolution adopting the master plan amendment with design guidelines for Tierra Contenta master plan amendment number one for phase 3A subject to conditions of approval recommended by the planning commission and city staff listed in exhibit A and move to approve the findings of fact and conclusions of law for case 2021-3818 master plan amendment with design guidelines for Tierra Contenta master plan amendment number one identified in exhibit B. Also, you can move to deny uh, case 2021-3818, Tierra Contenta Master Plan Amendment, uh, number one for phase 3A, direct staff to draft proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law reflecting the governing body's decision. On September 2nd, 2021, the Planning Commission recommend the governing body approve the proposed master plan with design guidelines subject to conditions. Uh, the conditions are listed in, in the resolution as Exhibit A and in Exhibit C. The master plan amendment application is a request to outline a phase-by-phase -phase development process for entitlements of phase 3A. These include design standards, subdivisions and subdivision phases, the infrastructure, affordable housing, parks, open space, and other public uses according to the annexation agreement. Um, these will include mixed residential uh, residential uses, mixed residential uses, civic and commercial residential, and a school. Um, the residential phase tracks are designed to promote and enable the creation of a diversity of housing types. The current housing density is stated to be a total of 4,368 dwelling units for Tierra Contenta, with phase 3A representing about 1,175 dwelling units remaining per the TC master plan. And of those existing 3,193 dwelling units within the TC, 41% is considered affordable housing. The applicant's request proposes to increase the remaining balance of the 1,175 dwelling units to 1,500 dwelling units, which is a difference of 325 dwelling units. The applicant's master plan report states that the affordability will include 40%, which translates to about 600 dwelling units. To achieve this goal, the applicant requests an increase in the residential density governed by a form-based design. The form-based design provides predictability in how the buildings fit together and reinforce each other relative to the street within the public realm. The design guidelines will regulate development to achieve a specific urban form for phase tracks within the Tierra Contenta Master Plan Amendment Number 1 for Phase 3A. The applicant is also including uh, pocket parks throughout the development, and will also include uh, an integration of bikeways and trails within that development, connecting to our bikeway and trail paths. The applicant will need to obtain easements through New Mexico uh, School for the Deaf, uh, as this again is a different master plan the original, than the original one that was approved. Uh, I believe they are working on that. There are connections throughout the area so that we will provide connectivity throughout that area 
And with that, Mayor, I believe the applicant has complied with all application process requirements for the city code. Uh, that includes your pre-application meeting, your early neighbor notification meeting. The master plan does adhere to the annexation agreement. And on September 2nd, again, the Planning Commission recommended that the governing body approve case 2021-3818, Quiero Contento Master Plan, number one for phase 3A, subject to conditions. Uh, the applicant has agreed to all of the conditions, including the conditions that were required prior to the application moving forward to the governing body, and those are included in your packet. Uh, that will conclude my presentation, and I can answer any questions. Thank you. We'll come back to you uh, subsequently. I appreciate that. Um, we'll move now to the applicant or the representative of the applicant. Uh, Ms. Jenkins, you have the floor. Uh, you may have others you wish to be participating. We'll need to swear folks in. Thank you, Mayor and Councilors. Good evening. I am Jennifer Jenkins with Jenkins Gavin here this evening on behalf of the Tierra Contento Corporation. Um, we also were going to try to be as brief as possible. I think Dan actually covered um, a lot of the the key points quite thoroughly, and I know um, we're reaching a we're reaching a late hour. So I will go ahead and uh, and share my screen and um, go through our presentation. And oh, let me get sworn first before I do that. Madam Clerk. Uh, Jennifer, if you'll say I and then state uh, your residence in full. And actually, may I ask um, Daniel to unmute himself and we could maybe get sworn at the same time? I can do you and then I'll do Daniel right after. Post okay, that. perfect. Okay. I, Jennifer Jenkins, 130 Grant Avenue, Santa Fe. All right. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this case shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, I'll do you next. If you could say, uh, I state your name and then your full residence uh, address. I, Daniel Warwath, 1611 Camino Porvenir, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Awesome. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this case shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Back to you, Ms. Jenkins. You have the floor. Great. Thank you, Mayor. So um, as I mentioned, we are here this evening um, in request to amend the master plan for phase 3A of Tierra Contenta. The um, ownership is the Tierra Contenta Corporation, also um, with um, management of the project via the Santa Fe Community Housing Trust. I am joined this evening by Daniel Warwath, who is the executive director of the Community Housing Trust, who is gonna be speaking with us shortly. Planning for the project is provided by SEC planning, civil engineering locally by design ingenuity, traffic engineering by Walker engineering, and of course, Mr. Escobel is our case manager with, um, with the city. So I'd like to go ahead and um, have Daniel um, Mamute himself is going to share with you a little bit of background. I think it's, it's been a while since Tierra Contenta um, has been before the governing body with any requests. So um, Daniel, take it away. Thanks so much, Jennifer, and thank you, Mayor and Councilors. I'm excited to be here tonight with this particular project. Um, as many of you know, I rejoined the Housing Trust uh, in April of this year uh, with a host of important priorities, but certainly Tierra Contenta being the largest of those and the largest, I think, near-term opportunity for affordable housing in our community. Um, and not just the 600 uh, affordable units we're talking about, but also, also hundreds of kind of high quality missile, missing middle housing, housing that is for people who make a little bit too much for our affordability programs, but still have a big gap on market rate housing. And we do that both through, um, I think, some innovative land use design, some naturally affordable housing like ADUs and duplexes and things like that. Um, but I think... 
you know, we're really committed to moving this project forward quickly. We see it's a, a, a huge community need right now in this unprecedented, uh, unprecedented affordability crisis that we're facing. Um, and one of the other sort of updates I wanted to provide is that we're currently in a job search for a full-time executive director to lead Tierra Contenta and make sure that this has the leadership and priority to move forward quickly. Um, we're working to secure the financing for the infrastructure and are about 85% uh, of the way there. And I hope that we can figure out the last four or $5 million in gap funds and, and have this move to construction next year. Um, I think we wanna start just remembering that Tierra Contenta was a city created and city sponsored project. It's most ambitious affordable housing project or policy to date. Um, it's created nearly a thousand units of affordable housing on 1,400 acres of city land um, that was bought expressly for this purpose. Um, the Tierra Contenta Corporation was created for the sole purpose of managing and developing the Tierra Contenta development. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, during the economic downturn uh, after 2009, it was uh, taken over, sort of absorbed by the housing trust. Um, because of a lack of land sales to support its ongoing operations and the housing trust um, helped support almost a million dollars in, in overhead costs in that interim time. Um, and what we're really working on right now is to stand Tierra Contenta back up as, it, as its own entity with staff and uh, a very clear prioritized charge to move this project forward. Tierra Contenta sells, you know, as the master developer, we leverage economies of scale and below market land to sell individual tracks with an affordability requirement of 40%. And that actually predates uh, the city's inclusionary zoning policy by two years. This is sort of, this was an, a voluntary inclusionary program before we had the HOP program and later the HOMES program. Um, the great thing about this program is it, it's, it helps both um, increase the supply of developable land. It helps develop builder capacity and grow production building capacity from local smaller builders and nonprofits, um, while also providing the highest percentage of affordability, twice that of what's required in our inclusionary programs. In phases one and two, we've developed over 2,300 homes and over 40% of those homes have been affordable to folks below 80% of the median income. And it's worth noting that um, you know, we did change that program to go to match the city's income limits. So now that goes up to 100% of median income going forward. Um, the final phase is 410 acres. We call this phase 3A because only 216 acres are owned by Tierra Contenta Corporation. That is certainly the number one thing that has held this project up aside from the land use um, is just that we're uh, having to build 100% of this infrastructure with uh, just 55% of the land and land that's sold at a discount uh, to finance it. So that's certainly the one of the big challenges and something to come after the land use is a discussion about some of the gap financing ideas that we have. Next slide, please. So as said, um, Tierra Contenta secures the entitlements for the master plan. Then individual developers, when they buy a track, they make an agreement with a for, uh, Tierra Contenta to provide a certain level of affordability. They then go through a city development process that um, a development plan approval process that includes, as Dan mentioned, um, things like traffic studies, their individual designs, um, and the subdivision platting and all of that, which goes through the planning commission. Um, prior to the review by the planning commission, uh, the Tierra Contenta Architectural Review Committee, which is comprised of uh, land use experts, uh, reviews for compliance with the master plan and design standards. Um, and then uh, everything else that's not included in the design standards defaults to chapter 14. Um, you know, before uh, Jennifer jumps in, I just want to emphasize that like this master plan amendment, we have an approved master plan. The goal of approving this, this amendment is to upgrade this project. It's to um, incorporate the lessons learned from uh, the last 2,300 homes built um, and hopefully make phase three um, better than ever imagined. Um, we want to pilot some innovative zoning, including this uh, density idea. I would point out that uh, even with the increase in density, we're requesting seven units per acre density, which is about the essential minimum you need for affordable housing in development. But um, the idea is that we would um, 
we can increase the amount of affordable housing about 1300 if it's fully built out, built out. But the idea is we're gonna use density to incentivize things that we wanna see within the development, energy efficiency, uh, variation of housing types, things like that. Um, and then ultimately to increase the amount of affordable housing is the other goal. We're in a, a huge affordable housing crisis and, and you know, the allowance of, for this increase in density means another 130 affordable housing units. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jennifer, and she will walk you through what I think is a very excellent land use plan that I hope we think about incorporating into Chapter 14 someday. Thank you, Daniel. So um, I think we all know where we are, and um, um, Mr. Escobel did cover this, but we are 216 acres. It is the going to be the second to last phase of Tierra Contenta. Um, again, just southwest of uh, Capitol High School, and um, and you can see off to the east here. This is the uh, this is a Super Walmart. This is Paseo del Sol East and the roundabout at Herrera Drive. Here we have Paseo del Sol West coming through the existing Tierra Contenta community, and this is the intersection of Paseo del Sol and Jaguar. And there's a little bit of a stub street coming out, which is going to be the future connection of Paseo del Sol. Um, that's the key piece of infrastructure for, for this phase. The property is zoned planned residential community, it, which does um, allow and really um, encourage innovative design, innovative planning, and a mix of housing types, mix of uses. So um, that was what was selected when, um, when the property was annexed and master planned originally was to establish it as a planned residential community. So all that purple that you, that you see there. And um, so this is how we sort of relate to the existing Terra Contenta community that you can see here kind of running on both sides of the, of the country club property. Um, directly to our west is Swan Park. Here we have the Arroyo de los Chamisos running along here along the south. And um, our proposed open spaces will be connecting with existing open spaces and existing trail networks. We'll connect with our trail networks. Um, so this is going to be, you know, relatively seamless um, um, connection with, with the existing community. And as Dan mentioned, um, the, um, we are finally going to be completing the Paseo del Sol loop, which is one of the key pieces of, um, of backbone infrastructure for all of Tierra Contenta. So from its current terminus at Jaguar, it, we're going to be con constructing it all the way through here and to connect to the um, Herrera Drive roundabout and we will have that, um, that circulation that is, is so critical for, uh, for this part of town. There, um, so existing conditions, you can see um, a little bit of the topography. The beauty of this phase is we have a lot of really nice, relatively flat, developable area. And then we have these lovely, what we call the little fingers that kind of jut out over the drainage areas that really create some really beautiful, um, areas for, um, for homes with a lot of natural open space um, surrounding, surrounding, those, surrounding those fingers. There is an existing um, City of Santa Fe trunk sewer line that moves through the property that we will be um, connecting to, and obviously um, additional water and sewer infrastructure to serve the space that will be connecting to existing infrastructure at the perimeter. This is the current approved master plan um, that was established in 1994. You can see the subject phase outlined in blue here. And what you see here based on the legend is all these different sort of pochets or hatches identify different, um, different use types, different permissible densities, different housing types. So that's what, um, so what you can see here is, you know, there are certain development tracks that are conceptually identified. And then each track has, this track is intended to have, you know, lower density. This track is intended to have moderate density. This track is intended to be a commercial track or high density. So this was the way the master plan was originally contemplated. It's fairly prescriptive on a track by track basis in terms of land uses and densities. This is a kind of a color version of that same concept. 
So all the different colors identify um, different residential densities that are permissible on the various tracks. And um, in the blue, of course, are the institutional tracks primarily occupied by different um, school um, educational institutions. So this is the proposed master plan amendment. So we, um, we still have the legend because it still is reflective of the earlier phases. But what you will notice as you zoom in on um, phase 3A is um, there's only one patch for the entire area, except for we have a proposed school site and we have our mixed use parcels here at 58 and 59. But all of our residential parcels are just that. They are residential parcels. So we um, are identifying them as mixed residential. And what that means is that all housing types, all densities are permissible on all tracks. So we are backing away from being so prescriptive and we're allowing and encouraging and incentivizing innovation and, um, and encouraging a diversity of housing types within neighborhoods. This is one of the key things you'll see this theme repeated consistently in the city's general plan. There should be a mix of housing types in all neighborhoods. As it say in some neighborhoods or in some parts of town, in all neighborhoods. There should be a mix of uses in all neighborhoods, existing neighborhoods as well as the new neighborhoods. So um, that and that's a, those themes are 20, over 20 years old. And we haven't really achieved a lot of that yet. This is an opportunity to really achieve those very worthy objectives that were laid out in the city's general plan over 20 years ago. So again, um, this is a little easier to read here as we get into a, an illustrative um, colored version of the proposed master plan. So um, as you can see here, here's Paseo del Sol. We are, um, also including as part of this sort of backbone infrastructure for this phase is a loop road here that provides access to the various development tracks. And um, in constructing this loop road as at the same time as we construct the Seo del Sol, this allows um, us to have access at the front end to a lot of tracks. So we don't have to wait for one track to develop and develop their roadway network in order to achieve access to the next track over. So this really will accelerate development of, of the entire phase. So as you can see, all the yellow are our residential tracks. You can see our park areas that are identified here. So we have um, we're gonna have one um, community park that will be a public park to be owned and maintained by the city. And then the, bound, the other four parks will be smaller neighborhood parks that will be owned and maintained by the applicable neighborhood association, which is the, um, the um, typical policy currently moving forward in new subdivisions. We also have a school site, full over 10 acres in this location. And then we have um, kind of at the really the gateway or entry into the community, we have tracks that are um, identified to allow for a mix of uses um, and civic uses, potentially um, other commercial type enterprises on, um, on those tracks in that area there. So what, as uh, Daniel mentioned, we have some very key objectives and what we're trying to achieve with this, with this amendment. And, um, a big part of this is we are really upgrading our street design. Um, the Housing Trust went through an, a really extensive outreach process with the existing Tierra Contenta community. And some of the key things they heard were, there's not enough on-street parking, there's not enough pedestrian amenities and sidewalks. That was a pretty common refrain that, would, that, that we heard through that process. So um, all of our proposed street sections incorporate on-street parking. It is actually required. And um, in every single street will have sidewalks on both sides, every single one. And, um, and then also through the, some feedback we received from the MPO, we're also going to be doing a fairly innovative approach with respect to the, um, creating protected bike lanes on Paseo del Sol. So basically you will have a bike lane and then you'll have your on-street parking and then you'll have your drive lanes. And so that creates a really protected um, corridor for, for cyclists. 
and um, a mix of residential housing types. This isn't just about single family and multifamily. There is a broad range of housing types um, um, that fill in that, that gap. And it is a spectrum. And we really are trying to serve a lot of different housing needs in our community. Not everybody needs a three bedroom, two bath, single family detached house. And not everybody is interested in living in a traditional garden apartment community. So there are a lot of ways that we can serve the needs of all spectrums of our community. And in doing this, we create diversity and we create a dynamic community driven environment. And that's what we are seeking to achieve. And, um, and as um, Daniel also mentioned, we are um, developing a really innovative density bonus program where we're gonna use density as a carrot. Um, so if a developer comes in and they want to do just a traditional single family detached community, and there are some of the parcels that, you know, with some more challenging terrain where that is going to be completely appropriate. But if they want to get more density, then um, they're, we're going to incentivize them mixing it up. Don't just do single family detached. Let's throw in some duplexes. Let's throw in some townhomes. Let's really mix it up to create, um, to create the diversity in the community. And with respect to our design standards, again, we're pivoting away from being so prescriptive, really trying to encourage um, innovation and um, um, with respect to planning and architectural design. So we are, um, we have these different, you know, housing typologies that we are using to really support the builder community and thinking outside of their own box and in terms of different housing types that, that um, can be implemented. So as I mentioned, you know, we are really the poster child for so many key um, elements of our general plan, obviously affordable housing being um, the most critical, economic diversity, higher densities in a compact urban form, community oriented development and mixed use. And then again, mix of housing types and mix of uses in, in all neighborhoods. So this just is a, a snapshot of, of the amendment itself. Um, based upon the existing approved master plan of 1,175 units, we're asking to bump that up to a maximum of 1,500. And that delta is that's our that's going to be kind of our, our density bucket, if you will, that we will utilize in order to incentivize um, really the, the the vision for for this project, as well as incentivize innovative sustainability measures and energy efficiency in the construction itself. Um, and then you can see, you know, the um, we've actually greatly increased the um, the parks, the park acreage and extensive pedestrian connectivity. Um, we've increased the amount of open space and the elementary school site also has gotten larger. And so this is just again a snapshot of, of the allocation of the different of the different land areas. Again, we're achieving almost 40% open space for the project. And so with respect to the design standards, so our mission for this phase is to develop this final phase in a way that improves upon previous phases. We really have learned so much about things that worked really well and things that did not work really well. Generate affordable housing, encourage a diversity of housing types, foster dynamic and sustainable built environment and promotes innovation. We're taking an inclusive form-based typology approach. The standards focus on the form of buildings and how they relate to the street, how the buildings relate to one another, and how they relate to the natural event, environment around them. The key here is activating the streetscape. We want to create streetscapes. People were, there's no buildings or no lots that are turning their back on our roadways. We have active streetscapes with opportunities for community interaction, with connections into our open spaces and our parks, and um, and this is how you build community. So we have everybody's facing outward and facing outward to the street, to the, to the pedestrian environment. And so the design standards will, will touch on three kind of typology areas, roadways, um, the buildings themselves, and also open space trails and parks. And then as we said, um, density, the density bonus program. Ms. So, Jane, are we close to the end here? 
Yes, we are, sir. I'm, this is, I, can, I can actually stop right here. This is actually a perfect slide to end on. So as Daniel also mentioned, what we're really trying to achieve here is, um, is really addressing this, this missing middle um, in terms of these types um, of, of housing types that actually are already present in a lot of Santa Fe's traditional neighborhoods. If you look at South Capitol, you look at the East Side, you look at some other neighborhoods, there's not just one housing type. You have big single family homes, you have small little casitas, you have duplexes, you have large homes that have been converted into apartments. Those are really dynamic, diverse, very desirable neighborhoods. And so we're, we're, not, we're not actually doing anything that new. We're just looking at what's worked and, and, and trying to implement it here. So with that, I will complete my presentation and be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you were pushing the time envelope. No, I appreciate it. I, I, it's good to have a timer. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think now we'll go to the uh, people in the attendee room who uh, may want wish to testify. We'll get them sworn in and take their comments. Uh, each individual who is there who wishes to speak uh, on this uh, proposal should raise a hand, get sworn in, and we'll give you a, a two minute opportunity to speak. Okay, uh, Mayor Alba uh, Blondes is in the room. Alba, I just unmuted you. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Yes, we can hear you. And then uh, I do need to swear you in. So if you can state your name and your um, address, full address, please. Um, my name is Alba Blondes. I, Alba Blondes. I live at um, 7042 Valentine Loop in Tierra Contenta. Perfect. Thank you. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Okay. Thank you, Alba. Um, I just want to reiterate um, what both Daniel and uh, Jennifer have stated about the uniqueness and creativity of the development of uh, this phase of Tierra Contenta. Um, I think that while there will be some people surprised by this development because they're new to the area and uh, do not realize that this indeed is a planned community, I think the result of this build out uh, will be very good for this area of the city and offer uh, a lot of opportunities for, uh, for housing for our community that, um, that we desperately need. Um, the, connection finally of Paseo del Sol and Paseo del Sol West uh, will be a wonderful addition for the traffic pattern that we have here uh, that now Jaguar is the is the street that carries most of the traffic but suddenly there will be another option um, to actually exit the area and go out into Cerrillos Road. Um, very very pleased with uh, with the future of phase three. Uh, and those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing them. Is there anyone else in the attendee room who wishes to be sworn in and speak to this proposal? Now would be the time to raise your hand. Okay, Madam Clerk, I don't see any other hands going up at the moment. You are correct, Mayor. With, with that said, let's go to uh, the governing body. Questions for either staff or the uh, applicant and applicant represent, uh, representative. Now would be the time to raise hands on the governing body, and I'll recognize you to ask questions. Councilwoman Villarreal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I hope I can articulate well. Um, I think we're all feeling it right now. Um, and thank you all for your presentation, Mr. Warwath and, and Ms. Jenkins. Um, this was a lot of work to be done to get us to where we're at now. And I appreciate all the components to the changes. Um, it was a lot of information, a lot to review. Um, I think the one question, well, I had a couple of questions 
But um, you did say, Mr. Warwath, about the AMI for this next phase and that it was matching the city standard of 100% AMI. And I wanted you to talk more about that because I'm, I'm assuming that there's gonna be all income ranges. It's not gonna be at 100% AMI. And, if, and just for folks to know, can you give us an idea of what that, what a person would make to fall under 100% AMI so that we can understand the, the different um, levels of, of income? Sure, and uh, Councilwoman Villarreal, uh, Mayor, other counselors, thank you for that question. Um, so this was this change was actually, I was trying to make a distinction. The slide referred to 80% AMI, which was the original annexation maximum income targeting. In 2005, following the passage of the Homes Ordinance, which created our inclusionary programs, uh, then going up to 100% of median income, uh, uh, when they were previously at 80% of median income, the TR content uh, affordability plan and annexation agreement was amended to go up to 100% of median income. Um, that median income number as it currently stands on one of the many spreadsheets I have open on my computer is um, for a three person family, 65,750 a year. Um, and for a single person is just over $50,000 a year. Um, uh, the TR Contenta affordability program for single family homes follows the same tiered methodology that the city's inclusionary zoning program does. So we're not gonna come in with just a bunch of units right at 100%. It requires that we serve all income ranges inclusive of um, you know, people down to 30% of median income that would presumably be served with, say, a tax credit project or something along those lines. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that clarity. Um, there was a, in the phase, the amendment phase that you're, that you discussed, there's a school site. And I was just curious if you all had more information about what school was being considered. Thank you. I'd be happy to address that. Thank you, Councilor Villarreal, Mayor and Councilors. We have been in communication directly with Santa Fe Public Schools, and we actually made some adjustments to the layout of the school site and the size of it in order to accommodate their needs. Um, there's, there's, to my knowledge, um, and based on our communications with them, they, they definitely have expressed interest in, in wanting a school site in, in to serve this, this neighborhood and this part of town but um, that there's not a specific plan at this time for something specific, but it's something that will, you know, once the, the land is secured and it kind of becomes available, then that would inform their planning going forward so they can know they have that site at their, at their disposal. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, I was impressed by the connectivity aspects of it um, really, Actually, I'm thrilled to see that our staff and MPO is involved with these kind of discussions to kind of give the bigger picture. Um, so I appreciate that staff has been on there, has been with us tonight, um, MPO um, staff to just weigh in on um, this piece of the next phase for um, Tierra Contenta. The one question I did have, um, I didn't really see this much in the packet material, but about energy efficiency and design standards and what you all were, were, gonna, were, were going to be required for future developments in this through this amendment? So we are um, at, a, at a minimum, the, um, you know, the builders will have to comply with the um, city of Santa Fe's green building requirements. And and that, and so, but obviously encouraging similar to what the design standards already do is encouraging other elements in terms of whether it's solar or how, you know, types of materials that are used or different elements. But with this density bonus program that we're developing, our goal is, is to really make it more possible and financially feasible for builders to, to go above and beyond. And so that the density bonus program is going to be used not only to incentivize the diversity of housing types that is so critical to, to the vision for the project, but also to incentivize more aggressive sustainability measures. 
And I think at least part of that to jump in, sorry, Jennifer, um, oh, is just to say that we um, will certainly be aiming for net zero as like the highest level of incentivization for this, but have some level of incentivization for um, active generation, things like water harvesting or gray water reuse, things like that. So really focused on you leveraging density to go above what is already a really great energy efficiency standard in the city's green code. Yeah, that's good to know. I think we should require that more often. I know it's being used as a incentive. I just hoping that people will take advantage of that. Hopefully they will because of the density um, bonus, but we'll see. Um, the other thing I just want to mention that um, I don't know if everybody knows this, but the fact that we have this development has been a blessing for um, our city. <laughs> the fact that that they were planning ahead for affordability, um, and I did want to remind folks that this is important. Anytime we sell land in Tierra Contenta, a third of the house, third of the land sales goes to housing, and the rest of it goes to economic development. So. As it relates to what we see for the Community Development Commission, this is a, a very important piece of the puzzle to being able to support other initiatives related to housing and rental assistance and down payment assistance. So I just wanna remind folks that's that's key component. And so I'm supportive of this project and excited to see where it's gonna go next. Um, and I think that's it, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councillor Cassett, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Daniel and Ms. Jenkins, for being here tonight and for your presentation. Um, I just had a couple quick questions. So this new master plan, we have up to 1,500, correct? Am I getting my numbers right? As many zeros as units. Um, what, and, and I was reading that each parcel would still have a minimum number of units. So what would be the minimum number of units for phase 3A if nobody took advantage of the density bonus? That would be 1,175. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then my other question had to do um, with, there was a pretty robust discussion at planning commission regarding the MPO's recommendations for the six foot sidewalks and um, the street design there. And I know that planning commission had passed with the recommendation of incorporating that design. Can you speak to that a little bit more and how that has, have you been able to factor that design in um, and the impact there? Great, thank you, Councillor Cassett. And thank you, Mayor and Councillors. So um, as you may be aware, the um, chapter 14, the city's land development code um, has a minimum sidewalk requirement for five foot sidewalks. And so we were, um, our roadway sections are, were, were really modeled after the city's standards that are, that are embedded in the city's code with, with some, you know, some elements elevated somewhat, if I, it's a good way to, to, to explain it. Um, and so the MPO says, well, we should have six foot sidewalks. We, um, we, were, we thought it was a little odd um, that that requirement with a project that is providing 40% affordable housing, that has cost implications. And so, yes, are six foot sidewalks better than five foot sidewalks? Probably. And so we, we respect the Planning Commission's recommendation in that regard. Um, and it, it is just important to recognize that, yes, can that be incorporated? Yes, it can. And we are prepared to, to um, adjust the plans and adjust the design standards accordingly, um, if that is the wish of, of the governing body. But it's also, it's, it's important to recognize that, that that does have cost implications when, as Daniel pointed out, you know, we've got half the real estate and 100% of the infrastructure in terms of the backbone infrastructure. So there's a funding gap that we are working closely with the city to close. And so, um, so when we start beefing up the infrastructure beyond what the city's own code says is required, that's fine. But we all have to know that when we make those decisions, those, those decisions have implications. Um, and, and so with that said, can you quantify those implications at this point? What, what does that cost implication look like? 
So um, we looked at it with respect. We did crunch some numbers with respect to um, just Paseo del Sol. And to um, go to six foot sidewalks on Paseo del Sol was, is probably about a quarter of a million dollars. Okay. Um, and you did already incorporate, I believe that the change for the kind of order of the road. So yes. for the parking and then the bike lane, that yes. was also a request of the MPO. Yes, right? we are. We already um, um, analyzed that with our civil engineer just to ensure there, because <clears throat> this doesn't exist, A, in the city's code or any in, anywhere in the city. So we, before we, we were comfortable with this, we did want to, you know, review it with our civil engineer. And they said, yes, it's doable. It does have a, a modest cost implication, but nothing, nothing significant. And so we're, we're fine um, implementing that along Paseo del Sol. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there anybody from MPO here to, to, to yeah. speak to this discussion about, I think Eric was here. I think Eric is still here. Oh, or Leah. Leah is raising her hand. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would, I would uh, defer to Leah. Okay. We let's there you are, Leah. We need to swear you in. Sounds good. Thanks. So Leah, I'm going to have you state your name and then uh, your title and then I'll uh, read you. Uh, yeah. Leah Ingby, uh, transportation planner for the Santa Fe Metropolitan Planning Organization. Perfect, thank you. And uh, Leah, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Perfect, thank you, Leah. Um, yes, so uh, I guess this is regarding the, um, specifically the six foot, the increase of the sidewalks from six feet to six feet from five feet. So um, the impetus for that was that there is going to be a large amount of density and we were really looking at the context of this development and thinking that if there's going to be this density here and uh, promoting the context that uh, would really create conditions for a walkable environment, then let's actually make it a walkable environment and allow um, you know, families to walk together and people to walk together. And I think um, it sounds minor, the addition of a foot, but um, if you're on an airplane, you know, every inch counts. And I think that when we're in, um, when we're thinking the context of people next to each other, that extra space really does um, make a difference. And it, and it's, a, it's a, a difference if you go around the city, I think if you pay attention to the sidewalk width, you will notice a difference um, between five and six foot sidewalks. Uh, regarding the cost, so I, um, I'm not an engineer and uh, I can't speak to those costs, but I can say that we looked at the, the road design and there is a way to add um, an extra foot of sidewalk and take a foot away from the, um, the, uh, tr the vehicle travel lanes. I think right now they're at 11 feet, which is a very generous lane width for a vehicle um, travel lane. Um, 10 feet is, is definitely adequate and narrower lanes slow traffic down. And um, that makes it safer for everybody on the road, for people driving, for people walking, for people biking. And, um, and by slowing people down, I don't mean that we would be causing congestion. I just mean that instead of cars feeling like they can speed through the neighborhood, they'll probably have more appropriate speeds um, on those streets. So that is, um, I think, a way that I would encourage the, um, that uh, the developer look at how that, that road and the increase in the sidewalk width could potentially um, not cause a huge increase in the budget, though, of course, that would have to be analyzed. Um, the other thing that I want to add is that uh, this, the design of this road did receive funds from the state government um, through the transportation project fund. Uh, I'm, if I remember correctly, it's $800,000 and, um, and perhaps those funds could help, you know, since it is publicly funded, um, I guess maybe that would help make the case for, uh, 
for, for a publicly driven um, design. So hopefully that answers any questions and I'll also, um, I'll be here to answer any others. Thank you, um, council and mayor. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, Councilor Cassett, you still have the floor. Thank you, Leah. Um, Ms. Jenkins, when you were discussing the quarter of a million, was that taking, taking more sidewalk from the street or from the, um, whatever, whatever you would call that, the other side, the not street, the open space in front of the houses? So, um, thank you, Councillor Cassett, Mayor and Councillors. So <clears throat> we did not consider um, the um, narrowing of the drive lanes themselves. That is something we, we could consider and that would, um, you know, that also has implications because, you know, Paseo del Sol is an arterial in the city's own code. Again, I'm just going back to what's written in the code. <laughs> that's, what, that's kind of our starting point at, at all times. Requires 11 foot drive lanes. And I think there, and there's a reason for that when you have arterial roadways um, carrying, you know, a fair amount of traffic. And so we, you know, that as we finalize and, and refine the design for Paseo del Sol, we're, we're, we're happy to consider that. But, um, but, you know, the city's roadway standards requiring 11 foot drive lanes, it's, it's there for a reason. And Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but our cost calculations aren't mostly land loss, but the actual construction, the cement, the, the yeah, extra. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just the, the cost of the concrete on the ground. The loss of land that we're quantifying. Yeah. And That's it also has implications, for example, with the individual, because um, they, they're not asking for six foot sidewalks just on Paseo del Sol or even just on the loop road. They want six foot sidewalks on our small, you know, intimate neighborhood streets. And so when we're going to sell individual tracks to developers who build those neighborhood streets, they look at, well, what are my roadway construction requirements? What are those costs? So it depresses the, the value of the land inevitably. Okay. Um, I, I find this to be a bit of a challenge just in the sense of, you know, I love a lot of what, what is happening here with Tierra Contenta and, and, you know, as Mr. Werroth said, that there are opportunities here to really use Tierra Contenta as a, um, I love this phrase, it's come up recently, a proof of concept. Um, and, but, but I also, you know, there's these aspects of, of um, really having the walkable neighborhoods and the sidewalks. And then um, Councilor Romero Worth brought it up earlier and it's something that I know both she and I have been looking at is, is traffic calming and how we use the built environment to deal with the fact that we have a lot of people speeding and our police officers can't be everywhere. And so really thinking about these opportunities as we are creating new communities, as we are building new roads, um, to start to look at some of those best practices and, and be thinking about those. So I guess I'll leave it, I'll leave it there for now. Um, I'd be interested to hear if any of my colleagues have, have anything to add to that. Um, I don't believe I have any additional questions right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councilwoman Villarreal, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Just to follow up on that question, I thought that was a requirement of this approval that we actually would be increasing sidewalks to six feet. Thank you, Councillor Villarreal, Mayor and Councillor. So um, the that was a, um, a condition of approval that was recommended by the MPO. The Planning Commission did adopt that condition of approval. So their recommendation to the governing body includes the six foot sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And um, and if I may, as as a potential you know compromise, um, that you know Paseo del Sol is really our, our key multimodal way with respect to sidewalks, bike lanes, you know the whole the whole nine yards. And so, as a potential compromise, we could look at requiring the six foot sidewalks on Paseo del Sol as our more significant spine you know roadway and then allow the, um, the smaller scale roadways, the loop road and, and the neighborhood streets to comply with the, the code uh, with five foot sidewalks as written. That, that's, that's a possibility that may be worth 
worth considering. So just to follow up on that, um, I mean, I have friends that live in different phases of Tierra Contenta now, and there's just, the roads are so narrow and the sidewalks are so narrow that you really can't have any kind of um, fluid mobility, whether it's in car or in your car or um, a pedestrian. So there was a change though with the street um, width, right? And allowing for more parking, street parking, on street parking. Yes, so that absolutely. was a modification in within the subdivision areas, right? Or the potential for subdivision to have that design. Exactly. Yes, thank you, Councilor Villarreal, Mayor and Councilor. So we have basically three roadway types. We have Cerro del Sol, we have the Loop Road, and then what, and that, that's what, those will be constructed by Tierra Contenta. And then as each tract is developed, there'll be whatever those internal neighborhood streets are. So our, what we call our local roads. Our, um, there'll be on-street parking on Paseo del Sol. There will be on-street parking on the Loop Road. And there will be on-street parking on the, um, on the local roads. Now, let's say there is a land use plan for a tract. And because of you know, narrow lots and all the driveways coming into the street. And so if it really makes on-street parking challenging to accomplish, then as an alternative, a developer or builder could say, you know, my the way this is laid out, on-street parking is going to be really hard. So we're going to provide actual off-street guest parking. So they're going to they're going to provide it one way or another. And if it's going to be on the street, it's going to be on the street. And if not, they're going to have to find opportunities to create off-street guest parking. So we are incredibly committed to ensuring that there is adequate and accessible um, on-street parking and or off-street guest parking on every single roadway in the neighborhood. I'd also just jump in and add that the five foot sidewalks are throughout the entire project. And that isn't the case with the previous phases. The individual subdivisions had smaller or one-sided um, sidewalks. And so this revamped design has full five foot sidewalks on both sides um, of all streets. So that's, I mean, from a practice, I understand the practicality and the benefit of having a wider walking space. It's just, we're trying to put a lot of things in this development already. <laughs> um, we've added back in a lot of fundamental um, multimodal transportation opportunities. Um, I like the idea of a compromise and doing six foot on part of it. I also would just throw out there that you guys are the ones who can change city code and require six foot sidewalks in our code rather than doing it experimentally on an affordable housing project, which would be the best way to do this. But we're certainly happy to do a proof of concept to use a recent phrase um, on Paseo de Sol. But it, it just costs money. It's going to come out of somewhere. It's going to mean more money that the city needs to help us with on GAP. It's just, if you guys want that, great. But understand that we're going to have to come back to the city for help with infrastructure, just like the city helped with previous infrastructure phases. And that's that's just a reality that you guys need to accept as elected leaders when you make that decision. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you on some point, but it's almost like, well, give us more money. Because sidewalks, I don't know, I guess the conversation just sounds like it's something that we should already have and it should be in our code. So, yeah, I'm, I'm guess I'm... And again, just Councilor Villarreal, go back to the fundamental framing of this. We're building, this is the, the build out and sale of this property is a $40 million project. It has about a $5 million gap already. Um, we sell land at discount prices. The cost of infrastructure have never been higher. And the second largest landowner in this phase is not participating and not paying for any of the infrastructure development, which was never contemplated when Tierra Contenta was created in 1994. I, sold, I told this to Joseph Montoya and his face just went blank. He was like, school for the deaf is not participating in phase three. How are you ever gonna do that, right? And this is a change in condition, um, but like this is the reality of, affordable housing. It's a push-pull all the time. All I do as an affordable person creating affordable housing is make compromises all the time. Do I wish I could do six-foot sidewalks in every development? Yes. Do I need to eke out every unit that I can get? Like, is a six-foot sidewalk 
better than, you know, 10 families getting affordable units. Like, I don't know, like these are push pulls and these are value decisions that you guys need to make. What we're trying to present is like the articulateness of that push pull, you know, like if we're already have a negative gap on the development of this phase and we're going to have to fill it with public monies somehow um, that can't be supported by land sales. And so um, we can only borrow so much money for how much land we have to sell. And that's just, it's a finite problem. And so that's all we're really trying to articulate here. I would love to see six foot sidewalks. I think it would be great. I would love to see like three foot sidewalks on Agua Fria. I would love to see like two and a half foot sidewalks on, on Baca street where I live. I mean, it, or just not telephone poles in the middle of the street that, in the sidewalk. That would be sweet too. Um, but like five foot sidewalks are not like, uh, and that ADA, that ADA compliant too. I, I was, yeah. But a yeah. five foot sidewalk is not like a bad sidewalk. It's larger than most of the sidewalks in our entire downtown. We'll just okay. point that out. Like a yeah. five foot sidewalk is a great sidewalk. <laughs> Six foot is even better, but five yeah. foot is, is, is pretty good. Well, the back to the question about school for the deaf. So why aren't they participating? The, um, Daniel, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, so they've been involved in the land planning process and they sent representatives to all the work sessions, which I also participated in as a stakeholder prior to working for the housing trust. Um, I, think, I think what it comes down to is they don't want to sell any land. <laughs> um, and, they, and so they don't want to participate. Um, they're also in the middle of a leadership transition um, and so it's very hard to get them to even, as you can see, one of our conditions of approval is, is moving that right of way for the redesigned Paseo del Sol. We've been working on that for months and, um, they are conceptually in agreement. They don't have a board meeting until November. It's just a big, it's a, it's a bureaucracy that, you know, has a different board than when Tierra Contenta was envisioned in 1994. Um, I also have at least been, uh, relayed information that they don't want to realize revenue from the sale of land because they think it'll hurt their state appropriations. And so um, it just puts us in a hard situation from a land development point of view. Um, you know, even in the city's uh, past legal agreements with the school for the deaf, the city said that they would help support um, the infrastructure development of this. Like um, what we're talking about in that gap funding too is, you know, ultimately, 10,000, less than $10,000 an affordable unit, which seems like a pretty good ROI from any sort of public investment. Um, but, you know, ultimately uh, they just don't, don't want to participate and there's nothing we can do to compel them to. Got it. Thanks for the additional information. Uh, I'll yield the floor. Thanks. Thank you, Councilwoman. We have two more hands up at the moment. We have Councilor Lindell followed by Councilor Cassett. I'm keeping my eye on the clock. It's 11.03. Uh, I think we're having a good dialogue. If we hit a point where we need to extend past 11.30, I'll ask for a motion to make that happen. But at the moment, Councilor Lindell, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I, I will be um, brief. Um, you guys have climbed a very, very steep slope with this. And... Um, there's so much that I like about this project and I'm not willing to get hung up on a six foot sidewalk as compared to a five foot sidewalk when our five foot sidewalks are meeting code. Daniel, you said uh, a compromise on this would be a six foot on the Paseo del Sol. I, I think that's a very generous, nice compromise. Um, I think it's unreasonable for us on an affordable housing project that has a very steep slope in the midst of a housing crisis to ask for more than what is code on sidewalks. Um, I love the mixed residential of this project. I think that that is just Absolutely wonderful. There's so much about this project that I like. Um, and I know to get it to this point has been a massive, massive push. 
say one more time to me how many units we are talking about. So thank you, um, Councilor Lindell, Mayor and Councilors. So the current master plan um, for, um, for this, for phase 3A is 1,175 units. It is about a little over five per acre. So it's like 5.4 per acre, which is a pretty traditional suburban kind of density. And with a new maximum, a new ceiling of 1,500 units to allow the density bonus program we, we described, if, if we achieve 1,500, which is frankly could be unlikely, um, but if we did achieve 1,500, we'd be just under seven units per acre. So, um, which is, you know, um, not out of the realm of, you know, a suburban type of, you know, a suburban type of density. So, you know, probably at the end of the day, we, we think, you know, looking at the project, looking at the terrain, you know, we're probably going to end up somewhere around 13, 1350 is, you know, I think could be something that, you know, might, might make sense. And <clears throat> just one other question. Um, when can, when could you start moving dirt on this? So uh, thank you, Council Lindell, Mayor and Councilor. So our next step after um, um, assuming we are approved this evening is we will prepare a master plat. So those, dif those different development tracks that I showed you on, on the land use plan, we actually have to establish those at, as a subdivision essentially. So we, um, we generate that, we finalize the design for the infrastructure. So we submit essentially a, a subdivision application to land use that establishes each of those master tracks and all of the design for the roadways and utilities. We go to planning commission, we get that approved. And, um, and as a parallel path to that, we are, um, we've been work, already working closely with the city on some, um, some financing options to, to address our, our, our gap in terms of funding the infrastructure. And it, the gap, frankly, for a project of this scope is, is not enormous. This is not insurmountable at all. There, there, there are quite a few different options you know, available to us in terms of some um, public financing um, measures. And so, you know, we would, I'd love to be out there moving dirt this summer. Yeah, Q2, Q2 of next yeah. year, the Q2, current Q3. goal. Q3, yep, yep, absolutely. And wow. one of the final stages of talks and the board of TCs authorized me to work with HomeWise on securing infrastructure finance for the land-based portion, uh, the portion repaid from land sales. So it's really just that last mile funding we've got to source out. We've got some ideas about that. We've, we've been workshopping that for a while. And I think we're, we've got some, several proposals to present to, um, you know, staff and or the governing body as appropriate to provide a menu of options for, for getting that last piece taken care of and getting this underway as quickly as possible. That's our number one priority. Well, I, I, I think that we have a really exciting opportunity here tonight talking about 1,300 to 1,350 homes. Um, we all know we have a housing crisis and um, I, I really appreciate the massive amount of work that has gone into this. And um, I, I'm excited, uh, I'm excited to vote for this. This is, um, 1,300 to 1,350 homes. That's a big win. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Lindell, thank you. We go to Councilor Cassett followed by Councilor Vigil Coppler. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to follow up real fast. There was a brief mention of the 800 grand that we got from DOT. Is, Leah, can you, can you expand on that for a minute? Sorry, it was... You said it and I kind of- Yeah, no problem. It. It's the transportation project fund and it, yes, it's from the, um, the state NMDOT from the state legislature. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I appreciate you. Regina, did you have something to add to that? I saw you're, you're, you're popping on and off. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't been sworn in. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. 
All right. Um, Gina, if you'll just state your name and your title, and then I'll give you uh, the portion that you can confirm. Okay. Regina Wheeler, Public Works Director for the City of Santa Fe. Perfect. Thank you. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Thank you, Regina. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor, Councillor Cassett. Um, yes, I, I could add a little bit to this, that um, this was some pretty special DOT funding that was provided in response to a specific request on staff's part to the DOT to fund um, Tier Contenta um, Phase 3, the, the spine loop infrastructure. Um, and it's special funding from DOT that doesn't actually require adherence to all of the DOT specifications, which costs uh, quite a bit of cost increase. So um, it's a really great um, already beginning of the capital stack to support this project. And I just wanted to share those additional details with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I appreciate, again, back uh, the comments of a I'm so sorry, it is late and I am not feeling well tonight. So I apologize. My, uh, my language is not as uh, pristine as it normally can be. Um, the compromise of looking at the main street and really expanding those sidewalks. I, I know it seems like a little thing, but um, again, really thinking about those quality of life pieces, really thinking about a livable, walkable community. I, I, I really think that's important. So um, I would be in favor of looking at that compromise of, of on the larger streets um, of working on those pieces. And then if it's not as feasible on the smaller streets that, you know, it's still meeting code. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vigil Copper, followed by Councillor Rivera. Thank you. I, I, I may be getting ahead, but I'm wanting to know, um, will there be a, the same builder or different builders? How will this work? Thank you, Councillor Vigil Coppler, Mayor and Councillors. So um, each individual tract theoretically could be sold to, you could have a different builder slash developer for each tract, or you could have a builder, you know, um, but it is, it's, it's available to the open market. And also, we also prioritize um, to some degree our local nonprofit developers as well. Um, so we want to make sure that there's land that could support a tax credit project, for example, which land like that can be very hard to, you know, to come by in Santa Fe. So it's really about taking a, a balanced approach. And we're really interested in supporting with some of these smaller tracks, you really can support our small local builders. And that is a big, it's a big priority as well. There were a lot of small local builders who really kind of cut their teeth into Tierra Contenta and really learned home production. There were builders who maybe it only were used to doing like five houses a year and all of a sudden they're doing 20, 30 houses a year. And so um, and so we're really we're really interested in supporting and supporting that as well. So it's it's a really balanced approach, but it it is, you know, open to to the community, to to the builder community. And so uh, would there be any um, standards for how long the original home warranty would be? Um, you know, typically um, the, you know, there's always gonna be um, a standard, there's a one year home warranty. And then for certain systems, like the roof is always gonna come with a 10 year warranty and there are certain systems, but um, I don't believe the design standards are prescriptive in that regard. And I don't know, Daniel, if you can speak to that, but there are industry standards that are, are, are common throughout that you would see for, for, newly, for newly built product. I don't really have anything to add just to say that, um, you know, there are add-on warranties and stuff that folks get a lot of times now. Our affordable buyers, I can tell you, I get phone calls from folks uh, going back now almost 27 year, 20 something years in the um, that we work with if they can't afford to do repairs and things like that. Um, you know, so, um, certainly, uh, we're striving to have higher quality homes here always. Um, especially the nonprofit homes you'll see are built at a higher standard, typically higher energy efficiency, more of that profit being invested in the quality of the home. Um, so some of those are, you know, the nonprofit built homes are among the, the higher quality in town for production building, but, um, yeah, nothing special built into the design guidelines at this point. 
Okay, the reason I asked the question is because in some of the first newly built uh, areas of Tierra Contenta, uh, homeowners purchased, you know, affordable homes, uh, you certainly people on low budgets, and uh, it, it was one of those mass builders. And uh, there were there were issues with the with the homes, like in the first year. And it was one of those developers who came in, built the homes and left town. Wow. And it was very, very difficult to get any activity or action on, on some of the, certainly some of the, the repairs that were needed and were, were surely covered, uh, but it was, it was very, very difficult. And, you know, maybe we've, we've learned since then because that was some time ago, but that, that's the purpose of my question because we really did have uh, issues with some of the first homes that were built then. Um, then the other question I have, and this is also maybe a futuristic question, but uh, uh, maybe um, um, well, anyway, uh, the question is how how and when do we discuss the extra um, staffing that's needed, such as police, fire, you know, there's a there's a great deal of homes here, and so there's a lot of extra protection from first responders, um, and then of course, you know, some of the the maintenance, streets maintenance, parks maintenance, and the like. Uh, when when do we discuss that, and what the impact of of some of that is going to be on the community? Now I know Fire Station Eight is right there, but uh, is that going to be enough? Thank you, Councillor Vigil-Coppler, Mayor and Councillors. So we did conduct a fiscal impact analysis that addressed the, the cost to the city to provide key services, you know, at the time that this community is built out and, and occupied. And so we looked at the revenue side, because obviously new development generates revenue for the city, whether it's impact fees, property taxes, gross receipts tax from construction. I mean, so there's a, there's a revenue picture, but there's also an expense picture. So what we analyzed was um, based upon the city's current adopted budget, we looked at on, on a per capita basis, what does it cost for um, maintenance of streets and, and drainage improvements? What does it cost or maintenance of utilities? What does it cost for um, provision of emergency services? And so um, based upon the, the, the revenue, so we have a revenue side and an expense side, the revenue well exceeds what the city's expenses will be potentially increase to, um, to serve this community with, um, with vital services. We also have land set aside for potentially civic uses. So if the city determined we need a police substation or we need a fire station, we've set aside land for those for those purposes. And so we, you know, we we don't have, it's not up to us to determine if those, you know, if a substation would be necessary, but we are providing land to accommodate that. And there is a significant revenue picture here to offset the city's um, expenses. And and just to okay. add in counselor, mayor, counselors, um, I think it's also worth noting that these aren't 1,175 newly approved homes. This is an already approved project um, with a slight increase in density. and. Probably most important as it relates to the conversation about first responders, this is about creating homes that they can actually afford and to live in in our community. So regardless of the increased uh, burden on our public safety system, I hope that we provide some very tangible benefits in terms of providing those uh, critical first responders housing uh, in our city where they where they work. Um, thank you. Well, I, and I appreciate that because you know, it's it's something we've demonstrated for a long time that we do need. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, the question I ask is more about, you know, offering protection and, uh, you know, maybe contemplating what the city's will, costs will be in the future, just, just so that we, you know, kind of keep an eye on what would net what would necessarily need to be budgeted in the future to, to make sure that we can accommodate the, the response time for any tragedies or, or fires or, you know, 
particular police coverage that will be needed um, and so on. And, and I guess it also applies to, you know, environmental services and, and trash pickup and, and which are all uh, necessary things. And I don't ask the question because I'm at all complaining about it. I want to be clear. And uh, I, I mainly want to ask it because sometimes these, these things are not planned for. And, and uh, it's important to just know that along with new housing and new neighborhoods comes uh, other uh, intangible, maybe at the time, uh, services that we would need to plan for for the future. So that, that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I would entertain a motion right now that we're going to go beyond 1130. I don't think we're going to wrap up in the next 10 minutes. We may, but it, let's not wait till 1129. So could we get a motion to suspend past 1130 and then we'll continue with Councillor Rivera? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Okay, I heard a multitude of voices. I don't actually know who made the motion or who seconded it. It was Councillor Veal Coppler. Were you making the motion initially? No, Councillor Romero Worth. Was that you? Romero Worth and Lindell. Okay, yes. thank you. Pick, so pick whatever way you want to do it. All right, I just wanted to get it for the record. Uh, so there's a motion to recognize we'll go beyond 1130, and there's a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll and then we'll go back to the question and answer? Yes. Councilor Merworth? Yes. Councilor B. Hill Hopper? Yes. Councilwoman Gareal? Yes. Councilor Abeka? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Councilor Rivera? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Okay, so that just takes care of that housekeeping measure. Councilor Rivera, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a quick question for the clerk on um, Prime Gov. So when you look at public comment, it has a number behind it that says 54. What does that number mean? <laughs> Sorry, I was talking and I was on mute still. Um, I want to pull it up to make sure we're looking at the same thing. It's the automatic population um, in PrimeGov. So it's just a document assigned number. It's the number of times that we've uh, used that title on a document. All right, I don't know if we can. So my interpretation of that is there's 54 public comments, but clearly that's not the case. So it's a little bit confusing and it may be for the public as well if they're looking at it, but. Just wanted to ask that quick question. Um, the other thing, um, I don't know if uh, Ms. Jenkins or Mr. Warwath or Mr. Esquibel or any of the uh, intersections that we're talking about, either Paseo del Sol West and Jaguar or Herrera Drive and Paseo del Sol, or any of those failing intersections that we know of right now? Um, thank you, Council Rivera, Mayor and Councilors. No, none of those intersections are failing. They are all operating at acceptable levels of service and will continue to operate at acceptable levels of service through the horizon year of 2040. All right, that's what I thought, thank you. Um, and with regards to uh, sidewalks, I think, you know, I'm not opposed to um, some kind of compromise, but when, when would that compromise take place? Is it tonight here at this meeting or, or some other some other time? Yes, I believe, if I may, that um, that would need to be part of the governing body's motion in terms of making a, a modification to the condition of approval as um, originally suggested by the Planning Commission. Okay. And uh, Councilor Rivera, can we get uh, Dan to comment on that, please? Sure. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. That is true. It would, uh, since it, it is a recommendation from the from the planning commission, it does take, uh, I believe, a supermajority to override that or modify it. Uh, but you would have to do that uh, at this meeting, and then uh, that would mean we'd have to modify the findings of facts, conclusions of law, as well as the resolution with the conditions as well. So you'd have to keep that in mind. Uh, if you're going to make those changes. 
Okay, thank you. And um, I think I think some of the sidewalk recommendations have come from lived experiences. Um, you know, I've lived in Terra Contenta for uh, close to 20 years, and uh, there have been plenty of times where I've seen bicycles and strollers or strollers and strollers coming um, to a head on a sidewalk, and there's just not enough room. Someone's going to end up in the street. So I'm sure some of those recommendations are coming from, again, those lived experiences where it would be nice, especially, and, and this, this is where I think the compromise might be great is if you're on those busy roads like Paseo del Sol West, you don't want somebody in the street on, on a busy road like that. If you're on a side road, it may not be that big of a deal. You can be a little more careful, but you don't want um, somebody with a stroller or a child on a bicycle having to move onto the street because there's not enough room for uh, both of them to, to get through on the sidewalk. So I just a, a, a little uh, life experience, I think, uh, on that, I think, is important to keep in mind. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was just with regards to the fire station. And again, I was the fire chief at one point, and it was when we were uh, building fire station number eight. And we built it there with the um, idea that Paseo del Sol would have been completed much sooner than it than it is, than it has been. So it was designed to provide coverage, um, quick coverage to Airport Road, the airport, and also to um, Surreal Road, the Walmart area. So this um, completion of Paseo de Sol West to um, Herrera Drive would um, complete basically what our plan was, you know, probably 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, to make fire, state, fire Station 8 really um, a, a central point uh, to be able to cover many of the areas um, that, we're, that we're talking about tonight. So just wanted to uh, make that point as well. And then with the addition of Fire Station number two, which we approved on the ICIP list tonight on South Meadows, I think uh, we would be providing our fire department, um, putting them in good position to um, make best use of all its fire stations and be able to cover all those areas uh, appropriately. So just wanted to say that. Um, I think that was it. I, I'm happy that we're moving forward on this and thank you all for all, all your hard work and um, am in 100% support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Abeta, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> so you might have cut, uh, touched on this, Daniel, but um, shared driveways. This is, we have a lot of shared driveways in these phases. And I think the belief or the concept back then was it'll create this kind of better neighbors because they'll have to communicate with each other if they're, you know, because they're sharing the driveway. And I get a lot of complaints about how that was a bad idea and all it takes is one bad neighbor or a kid of a neighbor that is constantly blocking the driveway. And so I, I don't think it's good to have shared driveways based on like Councillor Rivera said, our living experience out here. What has that issue come up or are you gonna, how is that gonna be addressed in this next phase? Thank you, Councillor Aveta, um, Mayor, Councillors. That was one of the number one things we heard in our uh, multiple public outreach sessions for Tierra Contenta residents and the door-to-door -door surveying that we had done of the existing neighborhoods. It's one of the primary things we wanted to uh, correct for in the road designs. I think we're moving past some of the... Um, uh, the utopian new urbanist ideas to more practical uh, ideas based on live, lived experience. And so, yes, they've been eliminated in this future phase. And um, yeah, the street design guide designs all our complete streets, uh, individual driveways for each unit, uh, each, each home. 
um, so there won't be any shared uh, driveways. And, and it's also been reflected in the addition of parking in some of the sub streets that in the past would not have it. So we've tried to deal with that in a couple ways, make sure there's ample, ample on-street parking um, on Paseo del Sol with the recommendations from the MPO to use parking as a, a barrier for both bikes and cars and um, bikes and people walking on the sidewalks. Um, so all in all, yes, you won't see any shared driveways in, in the future phases of Tierra Contenta. And if things go well, um, I wouldn't anticipate any more in the, the last couple tracks in, in phase two either. Okay, great. Um, and I got curious with all this sidewalk talk and I actually turned off my camera, went outside and measured the sidewalk. And I was surprised to find that it was actually four feet and it's good size. So I actually think five feet would be would be plenty and six might actually be overkill. And I could imagine the residents in the future being like, why'd they make such large sidewalks? Because <laughs> uh, I was surprised that the one outside my house is four feet. But like Councilor Rivera said, I, I think an extra foot, the five feet, I think would be plenty and would address some of those lived experiences of, you know, kids on bikes or or, or passing, but I, I think a compromise would be good because I six, now that I've measured my sidewalk, six I think would be uh, a little overkill. I don't know, that's just, like I said, I got real curious, turned off my camera, ran outside with my tape measure and I, I was shocked that it was, it, it was only four feet because it's decent size at four feet. I think five would be uh, plenty. So uh, that's all I have. And thank you, uh, Daniel, for all, all your work on this and really, reaching out to the residents and listening to us. Cause I, I know I had shared some of these concerns early on, but I thought maybe it was just my experience having like Councilor Rivera lived here for the last 20 years. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you did that and you heard some of the same things from the other residents. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Merriworth, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just a little bit confused back to sidewalks, sorry. Um, so I think I heard earlier in the evening that the planning commission passed this recommending six foot sidewalks. I think what Dan just said to us is that if we want to change that, we need a super majority. Is that what, what I heard? So like, if we want to say on that one stretch, we want it to be six feet and everywhere else, we want it to be five. We have to have a super majority or can somebody like just. I see a hand. Feed um, us here. I see our city attorney's office is ready to weigh in. Patricia, you want to give some guidance? Yeah, um, you would not need a supermajority. You would need to change the conditions to make an amendment to the conditions, which is where the sidewalk is, if you did not want them all to be six feet. So we would amend the conditions as they were recommended to us. Correct. Dan, is that um, how you were suggesting it be done? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh yeah, I was mistaken on that. Uh, we just need to make sure that we keep all of the package together when you make that condition. So when we modify all those components, we don't have to bring them back. We could just modify them and they can move forward without having to come back to any special area. Okay, and if we wanted, so we could make that, I forget the name of the street, one street could be five feet and the rest are gonna be, or we're talking about making one street six feet and the rest of them five or what? where are we now? And it, based on what Councilor Beta just said about maybe five feet is plenty. If I may, Councilor Romero Worth, Mayor and Councilors, what we um, would like to suggest is that the sidewalks on Paseo del Sol, which is our, our Sol. main drag, would yeah. be six foot sidewalks and the balance of the roadways in the, um, in the community um, would be the traditional five foot sidewalks in accordance with code. Gotcha, all right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilman Villarreal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, what you said is Paseo del Sol Loop Road. That's another one, right? The Loop Separate. Road. Um, I, if I did, I miss my my suggestion, and obviously this is you know up for up for discussion. My suggestion was six foot sidewalks on Paseo del Sol, five and foot Loop sidewalks. Road. That that was I, if I said that I, I misspoke, but I'm happy to you know we can have that conversation. Just speaking from the point of view of the person in charge of doing this, the 
the compromise that I understood was Paseo del Sol and not the loop road. Um, we could also pull up a plan and show some of the extra pedestrian amenities. I think one of the things that we didn't get to in discussing it is there is another pedestrian spine uh, walkway through the middle of the loop road um, that actually allows people to access the six foot hypothetical six foot sidewalks on Paseo del Sol without even walking on a street. So there's actually, there's a ton of pedestrian amenities in this project. Um, there's massive amounts of um, trail networks. Um, Can you yeah. go to the map that shows the street? Um, Absolutely. The yes. Where is, there we go. And just to add clarity here, when we talked about a quarter million dollars, that's just the cost for adding six foot, adding a foot on, on Paseo del Sol, not any of these other sub collector streets. Um, so the um, kind of the pedestrian spine um, that Daniel was referring to is right here. So um, here's Paseo del Sol, our loop road, and then our you know, development tracks um, scattered about. And we really wanted to make sure, you know, we, we really, we, we're not turning, we don't want tracks or developments to be turning their back on the streets and we don't want them turning their backs on one another. And so this is about relationships and relationships among these smaller tracks um, and as they relate to the public realm. So that's why we have incorporated a trail corridor that kind of bisects this sort of central development island, if you will. And then you and then obviously throughout the open space, we have a you know robust trail network connecting into the sidewalk network and using our park areas as sort of those funnels, if you will, connecting um, people into the open spaces. Okay, so the Paseo del Sol extension that would have six foot sidewalks, that's from the, the roundabout that you just went, sorry, go back. Mm -hmm. okay. Where's that point that your, your hand, your cursor's yes, on? This is the roundabout at Herrera Drive. Okay. That would take you over to the Super Walmart shopping area. And then um, an, an extension all the way to Jaguar. Okay. And then that loop road that we were talking about is how how long is that? How long is that loop road? How long, yeah, how long would it be? I, I do not know. Hmm. Um, I, I, give me, give us a couple of minutes. We could, um, we could extrapolate the linear footage on that. Um, hold on one second. So I'm, my colleague is going to get that information for you, Counselor. Okay, and so I'm the loop road- it's about, it's about the same size as Paseo del Sol. It's about the same linear footage? My guess. Yeah. And we will, we will get that information. And um, the loop road is designed as um, a two-way street, sidewalks on both sides, five-foot planter strip between the, the roadway and the sidewalk, and, um, and on-street parking. Okay. On street parking on loop road. Correct. Got it. Okay. Just curious about the linear, what did you call it? Linear. The linear footage. Yes. Footage. Yeah. We're looking it up. I just don't have it at my fingertips. And again, the five foot sidewalks are bigger than the sidewalks that are in phase of one and two. I believe you, Daniel. I'm waiting for Chris to measure his sidewalk before we start. <laughs> Everybody's running out with tape measures at this very moment. Councilor Woman, did you want to ask any other questions while they do the calculation? On no, the I mean, I'm inclined to keep the six foot sidewalk for Paseo del Sol, like we talked about, I wanted to know about Loop Road, how, lo how long it was. And then right, right. the local roads, I think makes sense to keep what code is um, currently. Gotcha. So I was just waiting. 
Yeah, yep. let me, um, I think I might be able to grab that information, whoops, through a um, another method. So I'm gonna stop my share for a moment if that's all right. And then um, I think I might have access to that information through another avenue. Great, Thank Wait, you. I think it's coming. <laughs> Thank you. And Paseo, what was the linear distance? Paseo Sol is about, um, it's it's about a mile. It's a mile? Like three quarters of a mile, but up to a mile. It's it's pretty it's a stretch. Daniel, do you know what the running length of the extension would be off the top I here? I don't offhand, unfortunately. Oh. I've got um, I got another avenue here. I'm give me two seconds and um, Okay, so yes, yeah, so Paseo del Sol is just over a mile and um, the loop road is about 3,900 linear feet. So a mile is, is 5,230 uh, 5, linear feet. So the loop road is, um, it's, it's not far off. It's about 1,400 feet smaller in linear footage than Paseo del Sol. Okay, and Chris, what's your sidewalk length? Just kidding. All right, I'll yield the floor. Councilor Rivera, you're you're muted. If you did take the measurement, you got to tell us. I don't have a sidewalk on my side of the street. Oh. It's on the opposite side. I don't think my neighbors would appreciate that at midnight. Thank you. Any other questions, Councilwoman? No. Uh, we're still in the part of our uh, process where members of the governing body get to ask questions of staff and or. Uh, the applicant. Are there other questions for staff or the applicant at this time? If they're not, I'm going to close the public hearing part and we'll move to a motion uh, and a second and then discussion of the motion in front of the governing body. Councillor Lindell, you have the floor. Uh, I'll make a motion, Mayor. Um, we have a resolution here, is, um, and we have a case number. Which one do I properly need to use? Uh, Patricia, do you can you advise Councillor Lindell on how to how, whether she's going with the uh, how best to uh, address the motion she wants to make? Uh, Councillor, um, Mr. Mayor. Uh, by the case number would be okay. I'm going to move to approve case number 2021 3818 um, as approved by the Planning Commission with a change of condition that only uh, Paseo del Sol sidewalk will be six foot, all other sidewalks will. Um, meet minimally meet code. Second. Okay. Uh, I want to run that past our city attorney's representative. Is that motion uh, and, and also Dan, because he wanted to make sure we had consistency up and down findings of fact and other uh, parts of our work, as long as we're operating within the, uh, we don't have to come back with a special hearing. Are we okay with Councilor Lindell's motion as you understood it? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilors, yes, you would still need to make another motion to adopt the resolution and then to uh, adopt the findings of facts with the new condition, but yes. Perfect, thank you for that clarification. So we have a motion and we have a second uh, from Councilor Lindell. Is there a discussion of the motion uh, by members of the governing body? If not, uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Uh, yes. Councilor Rivera? Yes. Councilor Merworth? Yes. Councilor Vigil Coppler? Yes. 
Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Baker? Yes. Councilor Cassid? Yes. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Motion has been, oh, Mayor Weber. Thank you, yes. <laughs> It's good. It's late. Sorry. Mayor Weber, would you like to vote? I vote yes. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Motion has been approved. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Lindell? So uh, the, the other motion that I need to uh, make is uh, I move to approve the resolution. Um, and Patricia, what did you tell me? I need to make a, a carve out on that for changing the... Um... Um, Council, uh, Mr. Mayor, you would need to um, have the amended condition that you just said for the sidewalks. And then you would also need to do the same with the findings of facts. Okay, so I'll make a motion to uh, adopt the resolution with a condition of six foot sidewalks on Paseo del Sol, all other sidewalks minimally meeting code, and also uh, having that reflected in the um, finding of facts. Second. A uh, quick, quick legal check. Do we need two separate motions or can we combine those two? Um, Mr. Mayor, I believe you can combine them. That should be fine. Okay. Okay, so Council Lindell has uh, uh, moved to adopt the resolution, uh, changing that one condition to reflect six foot sidewalks uh, at Paseo del Sol, uh, five foot uh, in other areas and adding that to the findings of fact and conclusions of law. And there was a motion, there was a second, is there a discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilor Rivera. Yeah, Dan, can you just confirm that a five foot sidewalk is the minimal accepted by code? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilor Rivera, uh, if you can give me just a couple seconds to pull that up. I I could share the screen with the code section if that's helpful. If you've got it at your fingertips, you could do that. I do. I do happen to have it at my fingertips. Madam Chair, um, uh, Mayor, uh, Mr. Commissioner, R Council Romero Rivera. Sorry, <laughs> it's late. Uh, five feet will work. Um, most of them are minimum are five feet. There is one at seven feet, but. Uh, that's uh, more of a collector mixed use road. Um, so um, yeah, five foot sidewalk will work for this particular project. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments before we vote? Uh, I'm gonna just take one minute to add my thoughts to what has been brought to us tonight um, because I know it's been a long time in the works. Uh, I know more than four years ago, I sat down with, Steve Flance and Kim Shanahan and a young ma younger man named Daniel Werwath and talked about Tierra Contenta phase three and what its importance was to the city's housing future and how important it was to have a plan that re really would, as Alexandra Ladd said from the beginning, uh, make this development a the best option for people to choose to live in. Not an option, but the preferred option. And I think the work that has been done, Daniel, your leadership has been outstanding uh, in terms of bringing people together uh, and recognizing that uh, what we had before was not gonna make it a preferred option. Might've worked, but wouldn't have been the outstanding vision that's presented tonight to reflect uh, new ways of offering options for people to build things uh, to choose a span of housing choices that make their lives better, to reflect uh, a different way of imagining a neighborhood, not just housing, but a neighborhood uh, and a community. And what you've brought us tonight is a, 
um, step improvement of anything that has been done before. Uh, and you really ought to be uh, telling your whole team uh, and all the folks who worked on this. Uh, I know Jack Hyatt's been instrumental. I know you've expanded the conversation to people who perhaps maybe felt they weren't welcome at the table in the past. You've opened up conversations with, uh, with the city on the funding options uh, and, and really brought this thing forward uh, from where it was to a really outstanding proposal. And um, I want to thank you. I want to thank your whole team. Uh, I think as we're voting on this, you're going to sense the enthusiasm and the uh, sense of uh, great, um, a great sense of, of growth that you've brought forward. Um, I'm just watching what you, what you're, what you're telling us about tonight and looking at it and thinking what you've done is quite exceptional. And so you should feel good about that. Um, any other comments before we go to a vote? Uh, in that case, uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes, Councilor Marlworth. Yes. Councilor B. Hill Coppler. Yes. Councilwoman Burial. Yes. Councilor Beta. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Garcia. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Councilor Rivera. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion has been approved. Very good. Any other, Madam Clerk, any other business for us tonight? Uh, no, sir, just to adjourn. All right, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, it is thank now- Very much. It's almost, it's 11.51. I think we've completed the business. We had to defer some till our next meeting. Thanks everybody for sticking in there and hanging in, uh, answering all the questions. Uh, and uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.